A very good morning to you, dear doctors. I am Dr. Namrita Raj, resident doctor, Department of Pulmonology, as to CMI Hospital, Bangalore. It excites me so much to know that such an accomplished, competent, and skillful set of established doctors are seated here in front of me, and I get to witness as well as learn along with you today. I extend my heartiest welcome on behalf of the entire team from Department of Interventional Pulmonology as the CMI Hospital to ace the e EBUS conference and workshop. Our team has created a small video to welcome you all delightfully and to give you a sneak peek into our department as well as our work. So let's begin today watching it. I request our team to please play the video. kindly invite Dr. Sunil, the lead consultant, interventional pulmonologist as the CMI hospital to come on to the dais and welcome our esteemed audience. Uh, good morning to all and a warm welcome to all the delegates and the faculties, national and overseas actually. And uh, 
I think it's a tough thing to organize a program actually breaking that usual COVID actually. Anywhere actually, any discussion without COVID, I don't think so. Any sort of a conference will be ending without a word on a COVID actually. Thank God, I think it's given some break actually where we are coming towards a normalcy. And this is one sort of an effort actually what we're making from an Aster IP skill group actually, where we tend to organize an endobronchial ultrasound workshop actually for two days. And uh, basically I would like to uh, thank the wonderful amount of effort what has been put in terms of getting a best of the best in terms of eBuzz that is in technology and in terms of daily application in this particular two days of learning what we're going through. And welcome to Garden City of India. In top places, I think you would like to go around actually, so that we have a nice shopping areas also and a historical monuments, which is generally a main attraction for uh, Bangalore. Now, no more, uh, I think, uh, Garden City is more of a Silicon Valley of India. It's also called as actually because of the IT crowd, the, the climatic things which draws the people all across the India to come into Bangalore. Now, coming to introduction to the thing, actually, it's a brainstorming actually. The next two days, it will be redundant in terms of knowing that EBUS, the basics. As such, a pulmonology is a vast field, actually, a subspecialty which has a multiple options, actually. If you are inclined, you can judge into intermission pulmonology, sleep medicine, critical care, transplant, new kid on the block, actually. All these things have been the major cornerstones in which once you join pulmonology, initially 30 years back when it comes to Indian Revolution, probably we were called as a TB doctors. Nothing beyond it. I think probably with our understanding going up, actually, and a smartness in picking up things. And questioning, learning, unlearning. That's the way how the science has moved on, actually. Where I think the, it's not an exception where pulmonology also got smarter, actually, getting involved in general medicine. Where I think at the same time, pulmonology, each and every meticulous critical aspect, all this means incorporate actually to make a, a better accomplished a physician a come into multiple areas, actually. Now, I think we have a straightforward thought process, actually. People got more curious, actually. Can we think about something which is beyond our airways? There's a talk what we're going to have in the next two days, actually. Coming to basics, we have two types of scopes. One is a linear scope and a radial. I'm just going to just give a gist of the things what I'm going to run through in the next two days, actually. Basically, we have a linear bus and radial bus. Mind you, when it comes to airway, it's a complex structure. A central trachea divides 23 times before ending into an alveoli structure. 23 generations, how to get accurately. I think thanks to the GPRS system, actually, where we think if you don't have any sort of a understanding about the locality, which will guide you to a right through and a Google map can just to reach the destination. Where I think we are, I think, we are clueless beyond six or seven generations. How to go about? I think we have overseas experts, actually, will guide us, actually, in terms of how to navigate this complicated structures of 23 generation, how to make it life easy, where to draw a line, where we have a CT guided as compared to a bronchoscopic modality in a two days workshop, what we're planning to. Accessories. Now, when it comes to accessory, you need to be mindful about what are the accessories which run through your forceps, your biopsy, needles, and at the same time, the new kid on the block, the cryo thing, which has come up in the last couple of months, actually, where it has literally leveled level our understanding of EBUS tissue sampling acquisition in the whole process. Now, training in EBUS, I think it's, I think, uh, still in a, not into a full-fledged amount of our training, what we have as compared to a Western European, actually. But a couple of friends of our own group, actually, has been trying to get this thing standardized, actually, like Dr. Harikishan and Tinku Joseph. They have been instrumental in terms of setting up a state-of-the-art EBUS training programs, actually, where they have a curriculum which extends up to six months to one year to get a dedicated training to get you a good quality of people coming out of the interventions. And setting up of EBUS. Now, first you learn, there's a lot of hard work put into learning the process. Then next comes how to set up a thing so that you can deliver a good quantity of whatever the understanding, inculcating multidisciplinary discussion. You may be a good uh, intermission pulmonist, but at the same time, you need to be certified by a pathologist who certifies your work, actually in terms of getting an answer. So this needs a good amount of understanding how you inculcate all these factors to become a good uh, intervention pulmonist. I think a population of 1.3, I think when we started our EBUS, I think probably would everybody know that we got our EBUS first in 2008. From the inception, we have at least nearly 14 years down the line, we are standing with 350 plus EBUS. No doubt we have progressed enormously that need a good amount of understanding of the subject, the limitation, indication, that's what we're going to run through in the next two days. Now, it's, it gives me an immense amount of pleasure to introduce our faculties, 
starting from Ab Alaris, actually, who comes from a, a background of uh, intermission polymerology with, uh, from US. We have a Dr. Kylie Agrath, who is a very accomplished uh, uh, polymerologist and intervention polymerologist, actually, who comes from US. And we have Dr. Jeffrey, and, and we are humbled to have you, sir, actually, for this particular conference. And at the same, we have Dr. Angelina Tekuno, which comes through a virtual platform, actually, and uh, Aravindan. I just want to congratulate and welcome you for this particular conference, actually, sir. He's from uh, Malaysia. At the same time, we have Shazang, who's an accomplished uh, intermission polymerology coming from Malaysia. We have Zuli, who will be connected with us with the uh, Zoom link, actually, where we have Dr. Zuli coming from China. Now it's the time to introduce my national faculties, actually, starting with Dr. Harikishan, comes from Hyderabad, Dr. Ravi Mehta, coming from Apollo Director and uh, from Bangalore. We have Dr. Malay Sharma coming up all the way from the north of uh, India. Basically, is a gastroenterologist. The amount of understanding what we have in terms of picking up the vascular anatomy, I think one of the best in the field, actually, who can be very much uh, helpful in terms of learning the building blocks of uh, ultrasound basics. At the same time, we have a Tinku Joseph coming from uh, Kerala, I mean, uh, from Kochi. We have Dr. Narthanan coming from Madurai, Dr. Deepak coming from Coimbatore. Dr. Binil coming from Kerala, Dr. Kedar Hebari. I don't want any sort of a discussion. Probably he is a better known for his uh, work and the talks, what he delivers, actually, the dynamic person, actually, who come from Bangalore. We have Dr. Shivling Swami Hiramat, an equally um, accomplished person, actually, from Bangalore. We have Dr. Varun coming from um, in China, Tamil Nadu, and uh, Tyageshan also coming from uh, Tamil Nadu. And we have our own uh, in house uh, pathologist, Dr. Arun, is a lead. Uh, uh, anesthetist and a critical specialist at uh, Astra CMA. We have Dr. Vidya, a pathologist, who will go to help us tomorrow with the live cases. We have Dr. Uh, Khair also for this particular stuff. And we have also Dr. Pradeep also being part of this particular program as a faculty for this particular thing. Coming to uh, delegates, I think predominantly it's focusing on to uh, South India, where Karnataka heads the list, where uh, we have delegates more than 30 to 35 people registered from Karnataka. Next word by uh, Kerala and uh, neighboring state uh, Andhra and Tamil Nadu and followed by Maharashtra and Orissa. Now, in the interest of time, I think probably I wanted to get this sort of a data rolled out in terms of to know what are the delegates, what do they expect from this program actually, what are the standards, what we're setting. Now that this conference gets into a basics of eBus at the same time, high end where we should not be tried at this at the early, early part of your career. Now, when it comes to structure program, I think this is ERS is the one thing which gives a, a comprehensive understanding in terms of how the EBUS training program has to be structured actually, where the teaching act activities goes through this particular Miller's clinical uh, compliance uh, things which comes up actually. Now, the basic intention of this particular uh, conference is to build up this three ladder, three uh, things which is there in this particular triangle actually. Everybody knows EBUS, that's the way, reason why we are into this particular conference knows how to a certain extent and shows with all the simulator whatever we've been dead, I mean, uh, working on uh, to get you a good feel about what is the real life scenarios what we generate is we are making an effort to do these three things actually which is needs a good amount of understanding of the ebus so that in future does where we will be more confident in tackling this particular thing so that we get a good outcome from the whole stuff now ers workshop I think probably when it comes to ERS, I think have a structured stuff actually, but unfortunately this financially is not a lucrative options to start with somebody who's beginning the EBUS or early part of the career where it can go up to seven to eight lakhs is a comprehensive program where I think probably initially it's hard to get these things actually. So we are trying to make an attempt to at least get this, all these tenets in one go actually so that we have a better understanding. So next two days, what are the things what we have for an AC in EBUS? Day one, we have a dead axis starting from nine to four. We have a Q&A session following by each and every lecture, actually. And we have a gala dinner, which has been I mean, arranged at uh, Attire, which is uh, two kilometers from here. Second day, we have a starting from eight o'clock, actually, where we start with our uh, discussion with the live experts, live experts, and at the same time, our live cases also will be demonstrated. And also, we are dividing the group into four groups, where we have a work sessions, where our experts will try to guide you when it comes to any practical uh, challenges, what you come through. This is a roadmap, actually, where this is the CMI, where we are into right now. We'll be heading towards more of a north actually for a gala dinner today evening. Housekeeping rules: keep your mobiles in silent mode. I think hopefully it's not disturb the whole of the conference. At the same time, two things we're going to be redundant in terms of getting a linear bus and a radial bus. Hopefully, people have a great time 
and uh, we have been put a best effort into to get the best of the best in the field actually hopefully people take a good advantage of all these things thank you thank you dr sunil for such a warm welcome and for also organizing the conference as well as the workshop let us gear up for the day as we know we will be having a 20 minute talk on various exciting topics today immediately followed by a 10 minute q and a session we would also have two moderators who would be moderating two sessions each first i would like to invite the moderators for the first two sessions of the day dr huliraj head of department pulmonary medicine kims hospital and dr asif professor pulmonary medicine ambedkar medical college bangalore to be seated i would also like to invite the first speaker of the day dr shivatsa lokeshwaran consultant interventional pulmonologist as the cmi hospital as well as a member of the organizing committee of ace the ebus conference and workshop to present his talk on the topic defining lymph node characteristics to the help in sampling or pulling out the best pie thank you so i want you to So that we can see all the things. Right. Started a long, career long back in Bangalore journey, thirty years. We started very very few pulmonologists, about four or five who are there. Now we have more than two fifty pulmonologists there working in Bangalore. Out of which at least fifty uh, people are doing uh, real interventions. Out of which thirteen, fourteen centers having debus. And we have come up really well. Our group is very strong. Now I think our young boys, uh, they have started their career in front of us. They have achieved the international level. I is very happy to say, we congratulate them. So Keshwaran is my student, and our boy Dr. Sunil. So they are very enthusiastic and see to this how the program goes. Because past two years we had a lot of problem with the COVID. Could not do academics because even though Bangalore group. It's very strong at the uh, uh, clinical programs, or scientific programs, conferences, CMEs, workshops. So last two years, because of COVID, we could not. I think this, the real program started now. It's very nice. I should congratulate the organizers uh, of the Aster and our young boys and team. They've taken a lot of effort to do the focus approach. That is very important. Everybody does everything. General programs, but here they want to do EBUS. That is a fantastic. So when I started 30 years back, when I started my career as a postgraduate, so uh, sampling of lymph node was difficult. As I do radiostenoscopy, um, for that you know you need to have lot of things and ICU morbidity, lot of mortality, suffering. Now it is so easy. One hour you finish, you have sampling, and they have made it. Uh, they, they, if, they are, if you have on-site uh, pathologists, they have rules. I think we have everything on the table within an hour, one hour. So that is fantastic. We used to take two, three days, and lot of convincing, lot of expenditure. So now things have changed remarkably. In that direction, I am very happy to say I am part of the team. Uh, in fact, I was the first pulmonologist who started the care thing in this institute. And now that we, of course, we moved on. We are doing something else. Thank you. I think I third words. Uh, yeah, you all the best with the group and focus on that. Let's start. Yeah. So, a very good morning to one and all. I am uh, Dr. Shrivatsa. So, I'm happy that we have an August audience uh, very early on in the day to start this program. We are excited as a team uh, to be the uh, you know uh, show you the path towards how to learn EBUS right from the basics all the way till the advanced level. So today, what we are going to showcase as you go through various topics is primarily 
how you up your knowledge on each and every aspect of ebus including the technical aspects uh, so like i said most of our speakers are going to concentrate on real life cases rather than just facts so that it gets nailed into you what you take into the practical uh, you know application of ebus rather than so you read any textbook you learn about ebus but what you're going to get delivered today is experience and i hope you learn from those experiences right so the first topic i'll start right away is about defining lymph node characteristics do they help in sampling or pulling out the best pie right so proof is in the pudding no doubt about that and a big slice of it so most of the time you would want your pathologist to give you the answer right so this is what the gold standard has been in every pathological problem or clinical medicine so far so but when you go to a radiologist he believes by his eyes and he swears by it right you've seen many of the radiologists make a diagnosis based on the ct scan so some of the ct scans you read you will have lymphadenopathy and then the radiology is already written it down there it might be tuberculosis so how sure are we that we are dealing with tuberculosis just by looking at the ct scan well we have the surgeons like dr puliraj was mentioning very early on the only way was to jump in do a media stenoscopy and pull the whole lymph node out for a diagnosis and of course the surgeon trusts his pathologist dear pathologist closely then came the pulmonologist and we were stuck between these far two ends we wanted to be a surgeon but we were pulled towards the radiologist as well so we're kind of confused what to do with the tools between these two aspects and then so the ebus is one such tool that helps you with radiology at the same time makes you a surgeon and are you able to deliver with both these worlds at the different extreme right so before we move on to understanding the ultrasound features of a lymph node very clearly you guys are aware through your anatomy classes that the lymph node when you cut through the lymph node you'll see that it has an outer cortex and an inner medulla and the medulla is divided by septae you have the classic hilum where the efferent vessels flow in and the efferent vessels flow out okay so you have your lymphatics as well as your vasculature that flows in and then flows out now the same image to my right is represented as a pathological slide so very clearly you can see in the medulla there are lymphoid follicles with a germinal center that is arranged so obviously you cannot look at all these structures on an ultrasound the ultrasound will show you the hilum will show you the cortex and the medullary structure depending on what kind of pathology it is so this is a how the ebus image would look on an endobronchial ultrasound assuming that there are some guys here who never seen the ebus before and only you done break basic bronchoscopy so what you see here uh, on the gray scale uh, you see a very wide structure in between right so that's the hilum through which the blood vessels come in and also a part of it is the septa inside dividing the lymph node and on the outer aspect is what you see is the vasculature okay so the black anechoic areas are the vasculature so that's just for start so that you guys learn more about imaging as i run through the further slides so let's play this through cases right i am a believer that if i show you one case that case is going to stick with you even when you go home right so that's how i do my learning so the first case vignette is about a 33 year old male patient 
who has no known comorbidities, who's a smoker since 10 years and smoking roughly about four to five cigarettes per day. He basically presented with breathlessness worsening since two months and significant orthopnea. On general physical examination, he had a raised null pulsatile JVP, chest normal vesicular breath sounds, and his cardiovascular examination showed that there were muffled sounds. So I think it's anybody's guess where we are heading more towards a cardiac case, isn't it? So in view of predominant cardiac findings, a low voltage ECG, uh, he presented at the ER. The cardiology consultation was sought first. 2D echo showed a very large pedicardial effusion with tamponade and so hence immediately shifted to the CCU for emergent pericardiosynthesis. The fluid study showed 90% lymphocytes and no atypical cells. But sometimes you know that the cardiologist forgets to send the ADA. Yeah, so this is a very common practical aspect, right? So cardiology colleagues proceeded with a PET scan because this is a middle-aged guy who has a very large pericardial effusion that is, uh, you know, uh, compressing his heart. And uh, the PET scan showed that there is bilateral minimal pleural effusion with hypermetabolic nodes with an SUV of 10.3, which is equivocal. So the radiologist reports it as saying lymphoma versus infective. Now, consultation was sought for a lymph node biopsy. So we posted the patient for EBUS as well as a core biopsy. So now this is the EBUS image here, okay? So let's have it as a two-way session so that I can ask questions. If somebody wants to answer from the audience, they can always answer. So looking at this node, is there something that you can tell about the node from the audience? Can you tell me what this node looks like? So whenever we look at things, we are always looking at the characteristics of things like size, shape, color, right? This is how you define any object. So that's the same basics we define any ultrasound image or a lymph node with. So when you look at this image, you see that it's a puffed up lymph node, right? It's not a very uh, ovoid lymph node like I showed you in the previous pathology slide. So it's a very round lymph node, right? And you see the margins of the lymph node are very clearly defined. You can see that. And you also see that the lymph node seems to be very homogeneous. That is, there doesn't seem to be much of necrosis or other things within the lymph nodes. You agree, audience? Yeah. So can we use ultrasound even before we stick our needle inside to decipher whether this is a benign etiology or a malignant etiology. That's what is in question. So the first thing I'm going to discuss, I want you guys to note down all this because most of this is going to be repeated in your workshops tomorrow. And some of these will even be questions, okay? So the size as well as the shape. So it is believed that an ovoid node puffs up and becomes round as it becomes malignant because there is ingrowth of malignant cells into the lymph node. So when it's ovoid and there's ingrowth of malignant cells, it puffs up and becomes round. Very simple concept. So round, they say, is in favor of malignancy and ovoid is in favor of benign. So upfront, how many of you are really going to look at a lymph node and say, oh, it's a round lymph node, so it's malignant. It's never that way, isn't it? So one factor alone cannot decide the characteristic of a lymph node, whether it's benign or malignant. So we need to put a lot of other factors in to make sure that the sensitivity and the specificity with which you pick up a benign versus a malign node, malignant node is good. So this is one of the features. So what is in the size of a lymph node, right? So, so this is the first study ever to report that such a difference in lymph node sizes affect the frequency of malignancy in CT negative lymph nodes, okay? 
So furthermore, the final diagnosis was benign in all lymph nodes with short axis diameter less than 5 mm on the EBUS. So as per the study, if you have a 5 mm lymph node on your CT scan, would you mind even to stick a needle? So what the study says is, don't even try sticking a needle. You're most likely dealing with a benign in a large, large percentage. So anything with short axis less than five, try to ignore it. So then when do you really stick a needle into the lymph node? The result is similar to that of the previous retrospective studies. So here they suggested that most studies till now found that malignant nodes are at least 10 mm or larger on the short axis. So 10 mm is when you suspect, right? So earlier days we had the very conventional thought process of 15 mm, you know, nodes. So if you see a 15 mm node, you're more keen to put in a needle. And that's how the radiologists also report a significant mediastinal lymphadenopathy. But for all practical purposes on EBUS, it is to, important to concentrate on a 10 mm node. Like even if you have a PET scan, I will deal with that in the later slides. Even if you have a PET scan with equivocal SUV and the PET scan is, the lymph node in the PET scan is not shining and it is 10 mm and you have already have a rose diagnosis say of malignancy or you strongly feel it is malignancy. If it is a 10 mm node, you better stick your needle in. That's what they're meaning to say. So EBUS surveillance becomes an essentiality. You don't go chase the lymph nodes which are showing up big on the CT scan. Rather, you survey all the lymph nodes which are 10 mm and big. Okay. So now how sharp is the margin also defines whether this is a benign or malignant etiology. So sharp margins are seen usually in malignant lymph nodes. Why? Because due to nodal infiltration by the tumor cells, which replace the normal tissue, it causes an increased acoustic impedance. Okay, so you can see a bright margin between the dark lymph node and the outer cortex. In case of irregular margins and confirmed malignancy, there is a possibility that there is an extracapsular breach. So the cells have, you know, breached through the cortex and gone out. And in cases of benign etiology, the inflammation causes a lot of swelling, bogginess around the lymph node. And that's called periadenitis. So what you have is a very irregular kind of lymph node or an irregular margin, like you see in the second image there, right? So we have dealt with size, we have dealt with shape, we have dealt with margins. Now we move on to the vascular structure or the efferent as well as the efferent feeding vessels and the hilum. Now the hilum is very, very important because I'm dealing with a point here which has increased specificity. So I want you to concentrate here. So in the initial stage, the tumorous lymph node is small and it is only fed by centrally located vascular structures called the central hilar structure. As the size of the lymph node keeps growing, of course, you need more vessels to feed it, right? A growing baby. So what happens because of the angiogenic factor that is released, a lot of these lymph nodes try to seek blood vessels from the periphery. And this rapid angiogenesis towards the periphery will suffice for the growing lymph nodes. So eventually what happens, the central hilar structure in between gets killed. So the central hilar structure kind of disappears over the evolution of the growth of the lymph node. So absence of the central hilar structure has shown to have a sensitivity of 91%. Okay. And this is an important sign that helps us diagnose a malignant lymph node from a benign lymph node. Of course, you should understand that this might not be there in every lymph node and every lymph node which has a central hilar structure doesn't mean that it is, uh, you know, uh, not malignant. Ecogenicity of the lymph nodes. So when you have a heterogeneous lymph node, uh, you see that it is more in favor of malignancy. You have a homogeneous node, 
it will usually favor a benign etiology. So now that I've gone through the basic, the chief, uh, you know, determinants of benign versus malignant, let's move on to certain other subtle signs that you might be picking up during your ultrasound of the lymph node. So one is the necrosis sign, what you see on the far right there, and then subsequently matting, and then calcification. So matting is apparently a sign of malignancy. Now, if we ask any person doing EBUS in India about matting, we see it quite often because of tuberculosis. So most of our TB lymphadenitis would show matting in most instances when you do an endobronchial ultrasound. So this is all Western literature, right? So, and we do not have sufficient literature yet in this space, at least, to prove that, you know, how often matting has been found in Indian lymph nodes with this malignant versus benign. So basically what in malignancy it indicates is there is a spread through the extra capsule. And both necrosis and matting in India are predominant in TB as well. So from contrary to what the Western literature tells us, that necrosis and matting will be more in favor of malignancy, we see that it is more often in benign etiology as well. And calcification in this country, again, you, we have a lot of old healed granulomas. If you looked at your uh, TB nodes that have healed or your sarcoid that present late, you definitely would see calcifications in the lymph nodes. So calcification, again, is not very specific to this problem. So can just EBUS ultrasound image predict sarcoidosis? A very interesting question. So you have a TB versus sarcoid dilemma that is ever ongoing in the EBUS world. And can you really make out whether this node which you're dealing with is sarcoid or whether it is tuberculosis? So the results of this study indicate that the sonographic features of EBUS, such as the presence of a distinct margin, a granular appearance, right? Can you see that? The granular, like sandpaper appearance mm -hmm. of the lymph node might suggest that it is sarcoid as contradictory to TB where you might have necrosis, okay? And an irregular margin. So this is a snapshot of benign versus malignant features, which I've just discussed over the last uh, couple of minutes. So let's just revise. So you know that the short axis more than 10 mm, shape round, margins distinct, loss of central hyla structure, heterogeneous ecogenicity, as well as necrosis sign, matting, and calcification. Again, you know, questionable in our setup and the vascular patterns, which I shall deal with in the subsequent slides. Now, of course, it is quite smart that when you have various features with different sensitivities, specificities, you would like to put it together to form a score. So what they did is they did put all these things together, the main important features to make it a Canada lymph node score. So what do we do over here? We look at the margins, we look at the central hyalur structure, we look at whether there is necrosis and the diameter. <clears throat> and very clearly, we score them, right? So if it's benign features, you score zero. And if it's malignant features, you give one <clears throat> point each for each of these features. And when your total score is zero to one, there's a low chance of malignancy. And if your total score is two to four, you have a high chance of malignancy. A pretty good score, you can use this and see it is a validated score. And in most instances, it will be right. So a cutoff of almost three mm, a uh, three, sorry, was may inform uh, decision making regarding biopsy, repeat biopsy, or media stenoscopy. So you should know that that's what I always tell my patients. You know, sometimes we do a needling of a lymph node. And suppose your pathologist says that your answer is there is nothing here. There is no granuloma, the no malignancy. This is something that we see often sometimes, isn't it? Even though you're sure that you've hit the pathology. 
at that instance how do you know that this patient has to be subjected to a repeat evs or how are you going to plan some other method of getting a biopsy you know or a media stenoscopy of course and convincing your patient so you have an orange if the orange is spoilt inside how do you know from outside which part of your orange is spoilt it's very difficult to say isn't it so this is a similar situation here so can we use an image scoring to determine these kind of aspects in your decision making when you play around with your evs so the result of this case here in this particular thing is that uh, the fna from 4l and 7 you will get to know about all these stations in the later talks for people who are not yet aware of evs is a granulomatous lymphadenitis non necrotizing and this was one of the cases where we also did a uh, intranodal cryobiopsy of course hari is going to talk about it soon uh with a 1.1 mm probe and it showed a granuloma as you can see here and the ab smear was negative so all the features which i discussed initially if you look at it uh of the slide sorry let me just go back to that so homogeneous not irregular distinct border right hilum still present you can very clearly see so there so most of it already pushed this guy into a benign etiology so it's very obvious that this lymph node was benign right from start so now do the vessels in the lymph node have a story to tell us so you have a 61 year old male who is a tailor who is married no known comorbidity is an active smoker comes in with streaky hemoptysis since 7 days significant loss of weight and appetite there's no peripheral lymphadenopathy so a good clinician will always ask did you check here before you went inside isn't it so ct chest followed by pet confirms a right upper lobe mass mediastinal lymph nodes and subcarinal as well as a 4r node suv max of about 1.6 to 3.7 but 2 cm or more in size we plan an ebus we usually do our ebus under short ga because we are more comfortable with it so this is an ebus image here and you see there is a heterogeneous irregular border with no chs so it obviously from what i've already taught you you know that this lymph node is moving towards a malignant etiology isn't it now what does the doppler say can you see there a lot of wavy blood vessels within the lymph node now i'm not sure how many of you doing ebus here always do a doppler screen before you stick in the needle how many of you just raise hands for uh, okay so yeah so most of you do as a routine screening doppler isn't it so now what we have is a doppler grading of the lymph node so we basically divide it as grade 0 grade 1 grade 2 grade 3 and then a ba inflow sign so grade zero like you see on the right side no blood flow at all grade one a few main blood vessels can you see a trickle of blood flowing into the lymph node probably probably very close to the hyla so watch in the initial stages close to the hyla and the as the malignancy becomes you know the lymph node is more malignant you'll see those peripheral blood vessels come in and grade two you have few punctiform or rod shaped flow of signals and grade 3 is very rich flow tortuous blood vessels in the midst of the lymph nodes and then you have a ba inflow sign which is basically a blue signal so in doppler you have to know there's two signals remember bart blue away red towards towards who not you towards the probe okay so when you have a bronchial artery flow you know that it is a little away and so you will have that blue sign that comes up and this blue sign is very very classic of malignancy that's what they say and it is very specific to that also now from the lymph node i showed you if you recap it will most probably fall into grade 3 right so in this case which we are dealing we are dealing with possibly a grade 3 lymph node so now it has been seen that based on the grading 
type 2 and 3 most predominantly seen in malignancy. And you can see the blue bar increases at 0 and 1, indicating it is more towards benign. And with the BA inflow sign, you have a positive sign. There is a high possibility of metastatic or malignant lymph node, as well as a blue, which is less possible. So the final diagnosis in this case was an adenocarcinoma. Okay. So now nodes are like rubbers, right? But can you feel them with your EBUS from outside, right? Just like the surgeon wants to feel the nodes. You know, there's some surgeons who will operate on the nodes and then they have pull out that lymph node. It looks very boggy. I think it is possibly tuberculosis. Or they'll say, I put out those lymph nodes. It's so hard. I guess that it is malignancy, even before the pathologist is doing a frozen section, right? So we have a 58-year-old female who's married, type 2 diabetes mellitus on OHA, who presents with cough for about two months, predominantly dry, and joint pain on and off, usually the small joint since one month, itchy and red eyes, and rest of the physical examination seems to be normal. So we run through the routine workup because she has some CTD stigma. So the serum ACE comes out to be high. MAN2 test shows no induration. And CT shows multiple enlarged lymph nodes. So I think most of you already know where we are headed, right? But don't be confident yet because in so many of these cases, after our FNAC, it has turned out to be just something different, okay? So let's discuss about all those kind of aspects later on. The largest lymph node was around three centimeters into 2.5 at the station seven. And so we plan in EVAS. Now, this is how you do elastography. What you see here is something called elastography. So you see that there are actually three different colors that you will ideally see on an elastography image. So what does elastography mean? So it was de first described in the United States at, uh, in 1991, and it meant objectively reflected the elastic elasticity of the tissue. That is when a deformation force is applied on the lymph node through an EBUS probe. And this elastic information is then fed back into the probe and converted into red, green, and blue signals. So hard means blue, medium means green, and soft means red. But before it even came to us, right, it was already being extensively used by the radiologist in the breast, thyroid, and prostate. So a lot of these technologies are either repurposed from gastroenterology or other forms of radiology medicine that we are trying to incorporate. It's great. Actually, we are learning from our colleagues. Now, can we qualitatively score this elastograph? So what you see here is score one, score two, score three, score four, and score five. So as I go deeper down the score, you see the blue increases and the green decreases, right? So we are basically going in from a soft node to a hard node. That's what it means. And if you want to, for the fun of it, if you want to score the lymph node, you can actually use this scoring to qualitatively score. Now, what you see on the far right, right? So how many of you over here will agree that this is a benign node? It's an inflammatory node. You can see that most of it is green. Whereas what you see here in the center is diffusely blue. It's a hard node. So you have no doubt that this can be a malignancy. Harder nodes, malignancy. Softer nodes, benign. And then you have the third image, which is a mix of both. Now that's where you're lost. So medicine is never exact science, isn't it? So it'll always land you up in somewhere in between in some instances. So is that going to help us? So in those instances, these guys moved on to the next step. So you're qualitatively assessing the EBUS node. You're confused whether this guy is still malignant or benign. Then we do a quantitative analysis, right? So quantitatively, we first assess the lymph node, convert it into blue and green, pull out the blue area, and calculate the area of the blue over the green. And then we see whether the EBA still stands in favor of benign or malignant. 
So as you can see here, the EBUS accuracy, sensitivity, and specificity very drastically improves if you have elastography added to the regular features of EBUS I've already discussed. So not only do you practice reading your nodes before you stick the needle inside, you also practice Doppler, and thirdly, the ultrasound elastography, okay? So the result of this case, we had a hard node, was thankfully for this patient, non-necrotizing granuloma. Now, now you put your picture together. So always don't just depend on imaging alone. So sometimes in sarcoidosis, as the disease progresses, you have a very chronic node, which has been there for many months or years sometimes. Because sometimes the patient has very subtle inflammation ongoing in the airways of lymph nodes for many, many, many months, right? And then they come to you towards the end. And by that time, that inflammation has progressed to some hard node, right? So it's not uncommon to find hard nodes in sarcoidosis. So the EBUS, I'm putting the opposite way here because I, I don't have my radiologist colleagues who would have debated this because, or even my medical oncologist colleague here would have said, I would do a PET scan first rather than the EBUS, right? So how does the EBUS complement the PET scan? While imaging, see, important modalities like CT and PET are usually used in the preoperative staging. And they have significant false negative results. So if a PET guy tells you that the lymph node is not shining, please don't take his advice up front and say that, okay, I think that this is an N2 disease or this is N1 disease and directly send the patient for a surgery. So most guidelines now, I think uh, in the further talks, we're going to deal with guidelines on how to stage malignancy as well. You'll see that EBUS is an essential tool. Why are you guys here today? I believe that all of you guys here today are going to be holding the scope in the near future because EBUS is an essential tool what every pulmonologist must have for the future, right? So I'm very pretty sure that most institutes here will start procuring EBUS very soon. And uh, so given the significant rate of unsuspected lymph node metastasis, it was seen that any, any lymph node that was radiologically normal tumor size greater than three centimeters, and there was an end load involvement on PET scan, was seen that when you, these non-significant nodes when you sampled would turn out to be positive in a large number of cases where the PET missed the lymph node. So EBUS complements, EBUS doesn't supplement PET, EBUS complements and is the next step after a PET scan. So any, a uh, nuclear medicine person who says PET is enough? No, you should debate it out telling, I need to do an EBUS on this patient before I even post him for surgery if it's a resectable tumor. So. Now, of course, uh, this is the so-called latest kid on the block and how to fit this new concept of artificial intelligence. You see that there's a lot of uh, talk about how artificial intelligence is going to conquer medicine. As humans, we are always biased, isn't it? So when one radiologist in most of my previous ILD talks, if you guys had heard, I would always say that the team, you put more heads together, things get better. Unlike the conventional saying, too many cooks spoil the broth, right? But everybody has an opinion about what they're saying. It's so subjective. Radiology is so subjective. If you remember my first slide, I said, one hand, we are getting pulled by the radiology, radiology, radiologist's mind. On the other hand, we want to prove whether this is benign or malignant. And so we are moving, heading in the surgical direction, right? So we want to be both. The pulmonologist is stuck between both these boats. He wants to have his leg in both these boats. So is there a tool that facilitates, improvises, and delivers better? So how to put AI in use in EBUS. So artificial intelligence, there's already a lot of studies coming up 
and hopefully most of these ebus scopes in the future will have the system in place so what they will say is put your scope to the node the lymph nodes characteristics are taken in and it is called a derivative cohort they validate the cohort and then they give you a diagnosis so your scope will look at the lymph node gets fed into a system and the system will tell you whether this is lymph node is benign or malignant so fantastic so i think this is going to change the future and you don't have to even remember all those characteristics which i taught you in the first slides so the conclusion of that study was that neural seg is the name of that ai software is able to accurately rule out nodal metastasis and can possibly be used as an adjunct to ebus when nodal biopsy is not possible or inconclusive right so the pathologist will tell you the pet scan is negative you put in your needle because you still felt the node is significant right and you have negative node but when the surgeon opens up and he gives that node for a post excision biopsy suppose the surgeon finds out that the node is positive we are already in a mess right so before the surgeon finds out it's positive can we stick in this uh, new thing to help us facilitate understand whether this node is actually benign or malignant and i think ai has that ability because there are many minds there the system kinds of builds on its memory over its experiences and gives you better results each time so i think the future work is to evaluate an algorithm in clinical trials that will be required to use this for the uh, defining a benign from a malignant node so with that i would like to end my talk and whenever that image is an image of a butterfly i shot so many things just like in nature you know unless you are aware what you are looking at right and it will just pass through your eyes so if you do not know what you are looking at and you do not understand what you are dealing with it is very easy for things to just flow through you right so i think it is important to understand all these aspects before we jump into more complex topics that are coming on on ebus and i'm happy here to take questions if the moderators or any of the audience here have a few questions for me so we'll finish the questions and after that what we'll do is uh, any questions yeah hi yeah dr lakshmi yeah hi yes hmm or on uh, metastatic carcinoma yes. so any specific features for lymphoma yeah. because we do see quite a few patients with uh, lymphoma yeah we yeah. don't have other sampleable lymph nodes and we have to get a good chunk through the true true lymphoma. true so we... sure so yeah so so you see uh, with uh, evidence of the lymph node characteristics if you see most studies that have been done they purely differentiate as benign versus malignant and in malignancy most of the time it will be an adeno or a squamous or a small cell whatever it is like dr lakshmi is rightly pointing out a lot of people haven't studied lymphoma specifically but i did come up across a couple of papers during my skimming of data that elastography can to some extent tell us uh, whether it is more towards a lymphoma versus you know uh, other types of benign etiologies like sarcoid or tuberculosis so i think that's the only point that might be favoring whereas no other non invasive method uh, can show you whether it's a lymphoma versus other things like i think uh, some of the uh, speakers are going to talk to you about how really do you differentiate through an ebus it's a lymphoma versus another pathology as well okay and we'll have dr angela also talking to you about pathology and how she deals with various pathologies so maybe that will give you some insight on how lymphoma can be differentiated from other types of uh, benign etiology thank you any other questions 
So thank you for that. Uh, so we will move on to the next. Yeah. Thank you, Srivatsa. That was an excellent talk. You have uh, put it, uh, simplified it in a very good way. I think uh, the way you have spoken, even an MBBS student would definitely understand it very well. That was excellent talk. Thank you, Dr. Srivatsa. Next, I would like to invite Dr. Sunil over to the dais to talk on his topic, the scope of evils beyond lungs and lymph nodes, the uncharted territories and the learnings from such cases. Over to you, sir. Uh, once again, good morning to all. And uh, generally, I think I'd be always lucky to follow with Vatsa actually, because Vatsa is someone who comes with a basic understanding, very strong enough to make me do something which go, takes us beyond the basics actually. Now the talk which I'm going to deliver at this point of time actually, we're going to disturb the understandings actually in terms of we are going out of the box stuff actually, not the lymph nodes, what are the critical areas where we should not be doing as a beginners. So this talk will give the extremes of thing actually where Vatsa talk about the basics. Now I'm going to push all these boundaries in terms of how to not to get into this area in the initial one or two years of your starting your e-bus. Now, definitely, I think everybody would think about if there's nothing called lymph nodes or there, what are the other structures which you can sample apart from the lung nodules. For that, I'm going to deliver this particular stop. There's no any financial disclosure. This is a greetings from Ashton. We're working. Now, given a ultrasound features, the CT scan features, what are the things which can give us a sort of a pretext possibility to case somebody as a benign or a malignant etiology. Now, if you go uh, starting with the e-bus from a books to bedside is a need of the hour, actually. That's the whole reason why we keep this sort of a talks, actually. So that how can we extrapolate that whatever the understanding is there in the books to a day-to-day cases so that makes our life easy in terms of getting answers to this particular thing. Starting with history. History is a thing where I think it carries a humongous amount of importance in tackling any patient with a mediastinal lymph nodes or any sort of a mass or swellings work we encounter in a day to day. History has to be very thoroughly starting from the what are the past history, what are the comorbids, planning starts from there. History has to be very clearly dealt with in terms of how we're going to help us to get arrive at a diagnosis. The indication has to be very strong. I think next couple of talks, I think we'll be going through what are the indications, what are the contraindications, what are the things, what we expect when you start doing an EBUS. Chest CT and planning. That's an area I think probably everybody should be savvy with because that's the keystones for your planning of your EBUS. The lymph node anatomy, the borders has to be clearly understood because we are not in a position to get into basics of that because when we want to do a program of this EBUS nature, it can take up a whole week, if at all, if you want to deal with each and every micromanagement of how this lymph node stations, how they get segregated based on what landmarks and also. But we should have at least a uh, sort of a pretext of what are the things what we are looking at when it comes to lymph nodes on a CT base. And at the same time, pretext possibility. I think after doing so many EBUS, actually, the everything boils down to that initial discussion with other any sort of a tuberculosis, sarcoidosis, or any sort of a malignancy at corpus or lymphomas where a sarcoidism carries a major chunk of more than 30% of our, whatever the lymph nodes, what we have done, it comes with the sarcoidosis group. For that, the history also justifies why do we going to be having a pretext of sarcoidosis. At the same time, we are EBUS features. And 20 to 25% is tuberculosis, and 30% is our malignancy of what we have done in the last couple of years of our own data dissection. And the adjuvants, adjuvant tools like your needles, the staining process, all this thing has to be incorporated to get a good uh, outcome at the end of this particular procedure, what we do. And a post-procedure assimilation. This is where the clinical thing where it comes up actually, where we have a good theoretical backup. Can we interpret that into a patient to get a, a diagnosis at the end of the day? And a clinical follow-up. I'll just give one sort of an example. Initially, we thought we it's a granuloma for a patient for sticking up a needle for the first time when it comes to EBUS. Then subsequently, if you tend to follow, maybe five to 10% of people do develop this sort of a lymphomatous tendencies also that has to be kept in mind so that the clinical follow-up is a key to the completeness of what the procedure, what you're planning for the patient to get a good outcome. And I'm going to speak out something out of the box stuff actually, which is not for the beginners. Better not to meddle into the areas. What are the things I'll go to run through subsequent slide. This is a, a classification. Actually, we know that starting from one to 14, as a sincere student of medicine, we always tend to never question our professors. 
when you start counting from a loop nodes actually 1 to 14 suddenly 3 is missing in the loop 5 and 6 not been very well uh, which uh, extensively used by the beginners actually and not much of a literature which backing up this 5 and 6 lymph nodes so the whole thing is in terms of know your anatomy what is what constitute the left and right of your uh, uh, side has to be clearly demarked actually the session 1 2 where the upper paratracheal lower paratracheal station 10 session 7 this is i think probably tomorrow what we have the work session where all this thing will be at least discussed with you uh, work session extensively so as a basic stuff you need to mug it up there's no second thought on this actually to get some sort of a basic ct interpretation this comes up and in terms of planning your procedure and uh, uh, i just one housekeeping rule i think we are going to share the slides actually so don't have to click the uh, take the picture of the slides what we're going to and when it comes to different types of needles, I think there's a very uh, thing actually where we have a number of uh, needles comes up, whether they're going to make some really going to make a difference. I think we have a talk which can go to enumerate this need, acquired needle which comes up. And we use also this mini forceps to get the good sampling from the lymph node station. All this thing, we have a workstations dedicated to in terms of knowing the accessories, what best can be done to get your best yield. To sum it up my talk, we have the scopes of endoscopic ultrasound. We have a, no doubt the GI preceded us actually when it comes to EBUS technology. EBUS, what we have is esophageal lesion, any sort of a biopsy, esophageal cancer, pancreatic biliary application, rectal cancers, and also endoscopic therapeutic angle also coming up in the US. And we always, as sincere students, we tend to follow people actually and be smart enough to pick up from different specialty. Cardiology are very hard actually. As compared to gas transit, they are very ahead of it. It's only that mind application of that uh, sort of uh, thing, what they have it into our uh, armament, which makes us more strong in terms of delivering the care. When it comes to endobronchial ultrasound, actually, both linear and the uh, ready levers, mediastinal lymph nodes and lung, uh, lung nodules and mass, which will not be discussed because I'm going to go beyond the lymph nodes and beyond the nodule structures, what you see, like the bronchogenic cyst, pulmonary embolism, left adrenal meds, thyroid disease, transvascular approach. These are the things which I'm going to dwell with you. And also a therapeutic angle to this where people have started using a thrombolysis for somebody with a PA with a focused approach to get this sort of a thrombolysis going on actually. A few papers which comes up in this. Nothing better than doing going through a cases will help us actually to know all this stuff. So actually we have a Mr. Z, 44 year old, comes with uh, Sudan actually, comes with cough with minimum expectation and also exertional breathlessness for past three months also with the wheezing. No doubt, invariably wheezing comes up as a, any consult with any of uh, physicians or your pulmonologist, the inhalus comes up in the picture and also it doesn't have any comorbid condition. When you come to CT scan, there's a media stainless cuts actually. You can see that, I think you can apply the, what is the basic tenets of what Dr. Vasa has discussed about whether this fits into a lymph node or something else. Now that has to be dissected so that you can plan your procedure so that you can anticipate what the outcomes would be. Here we have, I think probably in the, you can see that uh, lower uh, two images borders actually, smooth borders, what we see in this particular media center. At the same time, we see that segment, we can see that uh, there's a globular, homogeneous stuff actually. In a subject, actually you can see that uh, the same sort of a lesion which was there, with this sort of a lesion, it is a malignancy or something else. Any text, any text on this description of your uh, CT scan image? Fine, I think uh, we subjected him for a uh, I mean, endomarkal ultrasound actually, where we were able to document this sort of a cyst which is sitting there in the right low lobe superior segment actually, where you can see that the demarcation between a hypoechoic and a hypoechoic uh, lesion actually. And we were able to sample this particular cyst actually. There are a few housekeeping rules. Ideally, when you are anticipating cyst, pre-antibodies is a must so that the chance of mediastinitis and the complications can be curtailed so that we need to go with the preparation. EBUS is, can be a diagnostic or limited therapeutic option for recurrence so invariably dwell upon surgical as a definitive modality of treatment for this sort of a bronchogenic cyst. This is a wonderful histopathology which came up in this particular picture of a case where justifying that is a bronchogenic cyst. Now we move on cases actually where we have a 54 year old housewife coming from Tumkur 
commit the dike of incidents of breathlessness and the shortness of breath going on from past three months. And there's also history, there's no history of a chest pain, hemoptysis, wheeze or a weight loss. And also there's no any past significant medical history. And as usual, received multiple course of oral antibiotics and multiple cough suppressants, started from a GP actually. But in spite of all these things, patients do have symptoms which persisting and also left head neck swelling. So this invariably got into a medical oncology consult actually. So our medical oncology colleagues were very strong that it could be some sort of malignancy. What else can we do in terms of getting a tissue acquisition from this particular patient? As I think actually initial workup, chest X-ray showed a mediastinal widening with a tracheal displacement to the left head and a narrowing of a mid tracheal looming to a certain extent. And the CT scan also shows concurring with that there might be a large intrathoracic right paratracheal, upper tracheal lesion actually. And also subsequently had this mediastinal lymph nodes also paratracheal and subtracheal pointing towards whether are we dealing with some sort of a malignancy or any sort of a benign etiology is the one thing which has to be dealt with. Underwent a endobronchial ultrasound sampling from a right low low paratracheal and a subcranial lymph node came down to be a reactive lymph node. Then what else can be done? I think it's difficult to anybody to know all this sort of image what I just depicted in the e, uh, e bus uh, thing actually. It is a upper paratracheal zone, it's a thyroid tissue, what I'm going to sample from this particular picture, what I'm going to depict. This EBUS from upper uh, paratracheal mass, which shows out of a consistent with a thyroid tissue, whether it's a malignant or benign is a one more thing. Then it turned out to be a multinodal benign etiology, then subjected for a whole body scan with iodine. And also a technician uptake was not that great actually. To second negative to say that refer from an oncology with a high pretext of malignancy, coming into the level of procedure to make sure that it's not a malignancy, it's a benign etiology. That comes the way how I think it has to be dealt with. Now, this is, the uh, is this the first case? No, there are a couple of cases with the enumerating the role of endobronchial ultrasound sampling of a thyroid tissue for a malignancy or a non-malignancy. There's a, too much of literature which has been there actually to enumerate few of them. These are the references actually, which uh, I think uh, will be helpful for us to go ahead actually. When we are into a midst of deltas, I think when it comes to deltas, everybody gets scared at the amount of rapidity in which it spread, the mortality it went through. And this one sketch, what we picked up in the mortality, a high zone of a delta wave is what we had in our numbers actually, where we have a 57 year old coming from Bellario, nearly 250 to 300 kilometers from place where we work actually, come with existing breathlessness, cough with expectation and fatigability, and he was also a smoker and alcoholic. And also with multiple comorbids like diabetic, hypertension and coronary disease, and he has a plastic for a LED. Subsequently, the patient was also positive with all this history and also was treated. And recently, when there was a disproportionate hypoxia, we went subjecting for a CT pulmonary angiogram, we showed bilateral segmental pulmonary embolism with the mediastinal lymph nodes. With the COVID being a prothrombotic state, can we suffice to say that, okay, this will suffice to say that is a COVID-related prothrombotic condition, the pulmonary embolism can be because of a COVID. Now, ECHO also showed a dated RARV as uh, with that of any of our pulmonary embolism, also with the right heart pressures going up with PSP more than 75 coming into a moderate severe category of pulmonary hypertension. This is an X-ray image and also uh, examination showing not much of a abnormality and X-ray showing the right uh, hilar prominence, which is depicted in this particular X-ray. The CT scan image, uh, lung windows and the media stainless window. And if you can appreciate this particular uh, This particular zone actually, you can see that uh, right uh, in the mid of the slide, actually, we can that uh, uh, mediastinal cut. We're showing a pulmonary embolism, actually, one small is showing a pulmonary embolism, some sort of a, uh, thing which is there in the CT image. Now, subsequently, the patient has first priority is it an emergency situation that you need to act immediately, or can we wait, or can we plan it in uh, thing? Because pulmonary embolism goes with the uh, uh, river oxygen actually for 10 mg for 21 days and uh, patient has thoroughly been uh, counseled regarding the need for further workup also and also one preparedness to go whether should we biopsy or not are we missing something that Hyler promised what was there on next ray should we go for next level of any sort of a, a tissue sampling was discussed in length and at a certain time the whole body PET scan also was planned for this particular uh, patient this was a PET scan image which shows that a significant um, SEO more than 11.5 so are we dealing with somebody with a COVID thrombotic condition? Is it associated with the malignancy is also one more challenge which was there, which has to be dealt with. Can we push all the boundaries already on a river oxygen? 
we are making into more uh, bleeding tendency that needs a lot of preparedness switch on from a oral agent to a heparin so that we need to decrease the risk of uh, bleeding tendency what the patient do encounter with the rivaroxaban minimum 3 case actually when you do a high risk phase always better to uh, conjunct with your uh, petrol is to get your rose so that how far you can stretch when you have this sort of a multiple comorbid conditions which can trouble us if you spend too much of time on a ga too much of sampling fancies answers in terms of getting the meat of the tissue session 7 five passes were done which came down to be reactive now subsequently what else can be done this is a pet scan i mean uh, ultrasound image you can see that pulmonary you can see the, we are going to mark that actually this is a pulmonary This is a report beyond it. Then these are the things what the uh, EBUS what we had done actually, and at the same time we was a, a forbidden food which was lying beyond the pulmonary artery, making us to enhance vascular mode also because four hour it came down to be reactive, but we need to get into answers actually where we are not able to get the answer on rapid onset. Then we went in with this sort of a stuff of a heroic stuff actually where we are able to. Pass the needle through the pulmonary artery to stick into the lymph node, meet up the lymph node. But there are housekeeping rules in terms of transvascular. I'm going to subject to it. Subsequent slides. I'm going to enumerate this. This is a needle actually which has gone through the pulmonary artery into the uh, lymph node station. What is being documented there actually, and welcoming at the end of the day, I think the histopathy, the compilment of all the things, turned out to be a poorly differentiated arrhythmia cause. be cautious with what the things what we have pushed in this particular case we have a 73 year old agriculture is coming from ananthpur which is 300 kilometers away from the place what we are working actually comes with fever cough worsening of voice loss of weight from past two months and also asthmatic on multiple inhalers and also a sorority treatment sorry for the poor quality of a ct scan we have to take this things on a last minute actually you can see the ct scan obviously when it comes to a basic understanding of uh, mapping of medial and lymph nodes Most of the media stem is quite unremarkable. The forbidden tube, which is sitting over there, is this one. The station six lymph node for a aortic lymph node. What has been there to get you much more better view? Actually, you get this sort of upper uh, airway cuts. Actually, you can see that the trans sort of sub aortic lymph node. This is the only lymph node which is there existing in a person who is seventy-three year old. Family is very hell bent on taking that. benign condition if malignancy i have i may not go ahead with the treatment but i want an answer is it a malignancy or a benign then we took up this sort of a extreme step can we go over the trans aortic puncture actually to get this lymph node sampling and this is a sort of a ebus image what was there actually you can see that aorta and the forbidden fruit beyond aorta tempting us to go to this sort of a sampling this is a sort of a doppler image i think we are not able to run the video actually Where I can just get this transverse access, and subsequently we were in a position to sample this particular lymph node. Turned out, I will be worried about this sort of a transverse access bleeding and other hypoxia which generates sepsis for somebody, and also severe pulmonary hypertension. These are three things which can decompose the patient. Has to be very thoughtful about in terms of how to take these things. transvascular this is the first case no there are multiple cases our own group i think we have published in a, a journal actually where transvascular with aortic also been done in the subsequent thing that basic housekeeping when it comes to transvascular approach should be a last resort and the experience matters a lot how complete in terms of detecting anatomy and the safety ensure that each and every other better taken a general anesthesia where you have apnea during the procedure of jabbing at the same time on site evaluation is one of the thing key aspects better to at least have it so that you don't overboard with multiple punctures land up in uh, untoward things which always be expected to have a bleeding at the same time post procedure checklist has to be clearly dealt with how we going to immediately post procedure for one to two hours one day of admission generally i tend to do it with all these patients at the same time for six months followed up with any sort of a complication which we anticipate like mediastinitis or any hematoma which builds up and at the same time one query which always rise up 
whether the transvascular instigate the micrometastasis, literature is not that so clear in terms of getting these answers in a comprehensive way. Till that time that comes up, I think we can just go with the transvascular as a last option. Thanks for your close attention. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer. Thank you so much for such a information-packed talk, sir. Um, we would like to have the Q&A sessions now. I'm thrilled to witness a brainstorming discussion during all our Q&A sessions today. I encourage all of you to um, please go ahead and ask your questions and I'll pass on the mic. In the meantime, I would also like to bring to your notice that provided the authors allow, we will share the presentation slides with all of you. Um, please uh, don't take pictures because it's obscuring the vision of the people sitting behind you. Any questions? Thank you, Dr. Sunil. It was a good presentation. Really, you and your team are going uh, beyond boundaries, okay, doing all these difficult cases. I just had one question. Of all the cases, EBUS, what is done, what is the percentage of negative uh, reports? Very new, don't really get a diagnosis. As a beginner, I think we need to understand this basic yes. point actually. You are running through a procedure which incorporates general anesthesia, complications with that of uh, instruments, all those things. Clearly understood that choosing a patient is the right way actually to how to get the positive results. As Vassar rightly mentioned, a short axis of less than one. Yeah, once you have a strong high suspicion, go for this particular small nodes. Invariably, congestive cardiac failure, what we encounter with multiple lymph nodes. Be well versed with your pretext possibility. If you choose your patient rightly, that will determine your outcome in terms of getting a right diagnosis at the end of the day. You tend to push your boundaries in terms of getting all the lymph nodes, which is more than one centimeter, with the pretext possibility of a benign etiology with that of a failures and all this in contributing, definitely your reactive lymph node status goes up actually. As an initial beginner, getting a reactive lymph node is an initial thumbs up. You're in a lymph node, assured. But as the numbers goes up 10s, 20s, 30s, you need to push your boundaries actually. There's something whether you're picking up a, a patient for a subject for a, a e bus where we only tend to get a reactive lymph node. We need to get, at the end of the day, we need to discuss the patient, what is the outcome of a procedure, what we have done. It's only reactive, will not suffice. We need to go beyond that. So choose your patient rightly, pretext, so that your e bus gets an answer. Reactive, yeah, there are times where we come with the reactive, when your intuition is too strong, there comes the breaking up path by giving accessories, urgent accessories, like forceps, what we use, the cryonodal biopsies. All this thing comes up to get the chunk. Our oncologist needs more tissue for more markers. They are into multiple panels, actually. They need adequate core materials. All these things are in need of the R. So you need to have a rose also, which can tell you where is the boundary your pretext possibility, culmination of all this thing gives you good results. Any other questions? Yeah, in the interest of time, I think we'll wind up. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Sunil. And thank you, Dr. Holi Raj and Dr. Asif for moderating the sessions. I would like to kindly invite Dr. B.R. Ramesh, Senior Consultant, Pulmonary Medicine, Jane Hospital, to moderate the next two sessions. Thank you, sir. I'm really excited to invite Dr. Jeffrey over to the dais to deliver his talk on the topic, the scopes and the future, understanding knobology and how to make the best use of EBUS you've got. Uh. So we are uh, indeed excited to have Jeffrey here. So Jeffrey is a good friend and uh, not only is he an excellent interventional pulmonologist, from what I know, he's a very passionate teacher. And that's why I've got him here. So you'll really enjoy the way Jeffrey teaches you because I've seen him at close quarters how he teaches his pulmonologist. No doubt there's going to be some exciting teaching happening over the next two days and all our faculties which are here are very keen to teach you guys and run you through what uh, uh, is all about. So Jeffrey is a senior consultant and he's a present clinical director of uh, respiratory and critical care medicine at National University Hospital, Singapore. 
He is also the assistant professor affiliated to Yung Lu Lin School of Medicine at National University Singapore. So over to you, Jeffrey. I would like to uh, invite the moderators of the previous session, Dr. Kuli Raja and Dr. Asif, to collect their mementos uh, from Dr. Shivatsa. Uh, good morning. Uh, everybody can hear me? Sound check. Uh, my name is uh, Jeffrey. Thank you for having me here today. Uh, the organizers assigned uh, the topic and title of the talk as the scopes, the future, and understanding knobs and uh, how to make the best use of uh, the EBAS uh, you got. Uh, I'm from uh, National University Hospital, Singapore. Uh, this is one of the buildings uh, that, that uh, of the hospital that we built, uh, that we work in. Uh, I start off uh, by introducing uh, the EBA scope. The standard scope uh, that I work with is a UC uh, BF uh, 260. Uh, it's got an outer diameter of about 6.9 uh, millimeters and the working channel is uh, 2.2 millimeters. Uh, the scope that I work with is an Olympus scope. I understand that uh, in some parts of India, you, you, you work with uh, in, uh, Pentax. Pentax scope. Uh, the, the, the scope has a bronchoscopic view and it's oblique. It's about 30 or 35 degrees. Uh, this has implications on how you intubate uh, the patient uh, as compared to a flexible bronchoscope where the view is direct. Uh, the ultrasound probe on this scope uh, is 7.5 megahertz and uh, it's in the direction of the needle puncture. This uh, this, this uh, newer scope that is available is a uh, slimmer. So below is a picture of um, uh, I've taken from my own uh, endoscopy center where uh, the, the size of a slimmer new scope is smaller than that of a standard scope. And uh, that allows uh, potential advantages of being able to assess uh, distal airways. And uh, similarly, uh, publish photos. Plus, uh, if you go on the Olympus website, they'll try to illustrate to you how uh, uh, the difference in size of a standard versus a new slim scope. Uh, with regards to knobs, this is a keyboard that is quite uh, similar to what we have in our center. Uh, it belongs to a, uh, what they call a EU ME1 uh, processor, Olympus. Uh, these knobs are probably best learned uh, on the job training or hands-on uh, sessions. But uh, just to go through some briefly uh, in the order of uh, the way you do your procedures. Uh, if you go to the bottom left-hand corner of, of the screen, right, uh, there, there is this uh, button with the red uh, arrow. 
So typically before I start my procedure, when the, the scopes are all hooked up and plugged in, uh, I press on the button to make sure that the ultrasound is working. Uh, because I don't want to be caught in a situation where I intubated a patient, I press the button and the ultrasound does not come on because there's some connection uh, error. Uh, thereafter, once uh, I'm able to obtain uh, image, the second most common button I pressed on is something called a PIP button, which is uh, indicated by the pink, uh, slightly pink uh, arrow. So that button allows you to have a bronchoscopic view beside your ultrasound uh, view. All right. uh, thereafter, you acquire the image uh, of, the, of the lymph node or the target on a B mode. Uh, and before you puncture, you like to check whether there are blood vessels. So you then press on the color button, which is indicated by the uh, yellow uh, arrow. All right. Sometimes uh, we would like to label our images or measure the sizes of the lymph node and take a nice uh, picture for records. So uh, the freeze button comes in very useful. You freeze your image, you go onto this uh, oblique uh, panel of buttons, you click on the target uh, crosshair, and then you set, use the set button to measure uh, the, the size of the lymph node. Uh, use the roller ball cursor to shift the, the cursor. Uh, and uh, this touch screen, it allows you to adjust the depth of the ultrasound. I rarely ever need to adjust the depth of the ultrasound when I'm doing a endobronchial ultrasound through the, through the airway. Uh, and then subsequently, you can adjust the contrast or the gain. Again, uh, I seldom ever uh, make adjustments on these. On these uh, uh, buttons. Uh, the two main principles that uh, I adhere to when I practice EBAS, TBNA, is that in lung cancer, uh, I always start sampling from the highest stage or most distant site. And I absolutely avoid uh, upstaging the, the, the cancer. Okay. So the second uh, principle is that uh, in lung cancer, we strive for complete uh, mediastinal staging. If we are able to do diagnosis, staging, molecular testing in one setting, we'll do it. And uh, we try to get uh, these three objectives done in as few procedures as possible. Uh, I have some uh, cases to illustrate uh, these points. Uh, practice of these points will allow you to get the best of your EBAS code. I, I had a 65-year-old uh, male patient whom I treated for uh, right uh, TB pleuritis. Pleural effusion was uh, lymphocytic exudative. Adenosine deaminase was slightly elevated over 50. Uh, subsequently, after treatment, he developed weakness and muscle ache. Uh, I initially thought it was due to TB drugs. Referred him to rheumatology uh, anyway. And after investigations of my rheumatology and neurology colleagues, uh, they discovered that he has got a mono, mononeuritis multiplex. They prove it, they've proven the diagnosis on a, on a nerve biopsy. I followed him up because uh, he had a left uh, lower lobe mass that was enlarging on a surveillance CT. I played the uh, scans out. So this is, this is the mess that was uh, growing. Uh, if, if you could have noticed, uh, he has small volume uh, mediastinal lymph nodes. I sent him for a CT-guided uh, biopsy, and he was diagnosed with a lung adenocarcinoma via CT-guided biopsy. I discussed him at, uh, uh, the, the, I referred him to the oncology. Um, in, in Singapore, the oncologists treat the cancer uh, after they have been diagnosed by, by uh, pulmonologists. In some countries, uh, uh, pulmonologists are allowed to prescribe chemotherapy and treat the lung. 
the, the oncologist insisted on uh, getting, sent him for a PET and uh, insisted that uh, he get uh, EBAS. Uh, Uh, so, high lesion that like that on the pet. Uh, all right. uh, and I went from hyla to venous uh, and then I went on the contralateral uh, on the ipsilateral left side. And uh, again, went from uh, uh, subterranean to to uh, the mediastinal lymph nodes. Uh, in 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 this uh, picture, you can see that this is the bronchoscopic view, and uh, the shift has been uh, deployed. It's important that before you need a puncture, that the shift absolutely has to be uh, deployed. And one of the methods is to make sure that the shift appears on on the bronchoscopic view. So in, in, in this uh, cytology uh, report, right? Uh, it's that uh, no, none of his lymph nodes were, were positive. Uh, I did one pass for each uh, lymph node. It on site uh, cytology present. So every needle pass had adequate samples. So he was sent for surgery, uh, resected the tumor, and uh, the lymph nodes were sampled uh, and, and uh, taken out by the surgeon. And, uh, pathology uh, is consistent with uh, negative lymph nodes as uh, the EBAS uh, procedure. The second case uh, I have is a 79-year-old uh, male. He presented with cough and loss of weight. He had a chest x-ray that showed a, a left-sided uh, lower lobe Opacity. He was sent for a scan and this is his uh, mass like consolidation scene on the scan. I will also draw your attention to uh, this, this uh, nodule or mass here. It's below the diaphragm. It's an enlarged uh, left adrenal gland. Uh, so he has a uh, small volume uh, pre tracheal lymph nodes. And uh, this is uh, his uh, enlarged left adrenal gland, which has a barbell shape. Uh, and uh, it can be visualized on uh, coronal sections as well. So if I draw your attention to uh, the area below the diaphragm, Uh, 
uh, so for him, right, uh, he's got distant, suspected distant uh, metastasis. So uh, I went for the most distant site. Uh, I happened uh, to be able to do an endo, endoscopic ultrasound, EUS, uh, via bronchoscope. In short, we call it EUSB. So I went, uh, put the bronchoscope into his uh, esophagus, uh, and I tried to look for the left adrenal gland. And I was able to visualize it quite clearly, and it uh, was consistent in appearance with the CT scan. So I, I will show you the video. And I went on to uh, do a DBNA for it. Uh, sorry, not a TBNA, a uh, fine needle biopsy, ultrasound endoscopic uh, guided, right? So uh, uh, in, in, in a EUSB, you would notice that in the bron bronchoscopic image, you cannot see the shift. It's, it's difficult because the esophagus is collapsed. Uh, some experts advocate inflating the balloon uh, so that you can deploy the shift. Uh, the way I do it is uh, sometimes I shift the scope out either distally or, or proximally to a space where I can visualize the shift and then I get the shift out, deploy it before uh, engaging uh, the image again. Uh, this runs the risk of totally losing uh, the target because then sometimes when you go back, you cannot find the target anymore. Uh, yeah. So the, the other very useful method is uh, to try to look for the shift on the ultrasound view. So, uh, okay. So, so if you, if you look uh, on the top, it should be, right hand corner of the of the of the image right uh, you can you can actually uh, see the shift and it's useful to be able to visualize the shift then you are able to visualize the angle at which uh, the needle is going to penetrate the, the target and it helps because sometimes you need to avoid blood vessels and and, and some structures that you may not want to puncture So then we did a few uh, uh, agitations uh, on the on the adrenal gland, and uh, we did three passes. And uh, on the on the rapid on site, uh, they told us that we had adequate uh, tissue. Uh, so he he was uh, diagnosed with uh, non small cell uh, lung cancer. Uh, there was sufficient uh, uh, tissue to go for molecular studies. Uh, at this point of time, uh, I introduced uh, the concept of doing using uh, general anesthesia uh, for EBAS uh, TVNA. So uh, in American American centers, all EBAS TVNA are done routinely under uh, general anesthesia. I understand that the, the practice is variable here in India. Some uh, centers use uh, uh, a general anesthesia and some centers uh, use predominantly conscious sedation. Uh, back in Singapore, where I come from, we stick to conscious sedation for most of our cases, and we rarely ever uh, resort to using uh, general anesthesia. Well, this uh, study, right, um, essentially samples any lymph node that is 5 mm and above size uh, and PET negative, and their yield is very low, less than 1%. So if you have the practice of biopsying uh, lymph nodes, 5 mm and above and a PET negative, uh, you will get a low yield. But it, it is necessary to do it for individual patients who have uh, lung cancer. Uh, so, uh, but uh, uh, the, the argument was that if you had your patients under GA, you will have optimal conditions, full patient cooperation, no cough. Uh, the time you need to sample lymph nodes and complete metastinal staging uh, as much as you want. So general anesthesia is definitely a way to get the most out of your, of your scope. And uh, if after you have done your procedures and attain a certain level of competency, you probably need to do some quality improvement or audits. And uh, these people, uh, for them, the sample uh, in antiquity was only 2.8%. Uh, it means that of all their procedures, only 2.8% of uh, the, the, the biopsies did not show any lymphocytes. Uh, back in Singapore, we are a bit close to 4 or 5 percent. Uh, I'd like to put the, the point across that if you do a combined EBUS and USB, uh, you can assess uh, pyroesophageal lymph node targets. 
and uh, there's additional benefits of comfort for the patient convenience and cost. Uh, it, it, it is done in India, right? This uh, published uh, high volume center does uh, EBUS, EUSB, and FNA under moderate sedation. Uh, I come to my third case. 59 year old female, she's a non smoker. She's uh, asthma and on regular follow up. Somewhere in 2001, uh, the chest x ray uh, reported that uh, she had uh, right paratracheal uh, lucency and uh, left retrocardial opacity. The arrows. They went on to do a CT uh, scan for her. They found, uh, again, uh, uh, they think uh, either a mass or a consolidation, left lower lobe encasing uh, the left lower lobe bronchus. Uh, this is the esophagus. Right? I, I, I show you the corona views. Huh? So again, you can see a uh, left lower lobe mass. So she, she was uh, actually at another hospital and uh, they discussed it with the interventional radiologist who felt that it's a bit too risky to uh, do a CT guided biopsy because of proximity to the heart. Uh, she got a gastro examination as well, but uh, they, they said that they could not uh, visualize. Uh, and uh, the pulmonologist felt that uh, if, if we try EBUS TBNA, we are likely to get a low yield. Uh, so she was uh, referred to, to our hospital. Okay, so uh, this is uh, EBUS that we have. A little bit old, you can see all the pigment marks on the image. Uh, you can see the epiglottis, okay? It's important. Next to the epiglottis, the noise. And uh, what we do is we point the scope at the vocal cords. We make a right turn or a left turn, uh, clear uh, over the noise, And then we straighten the scope and insert it into the esophagus. You see, this is the arytenoid. And what we do is we turn the scope to the side and then we put it into the esophagus. Okay, uh, then we switch into the ultrasound view. Typically, uh, the first thing I do when I go into uh, the esophagus is try to look for the liver uh, because I've uh, have the scope facing the front or anteriorly, and, and I put in the scope. And uh, the liver is uh, easily identifiable on, on ultrasound. Uh, if you want to do training for this, uh, you, you will have to go through a systematic process to identify the landmarks. Uh, probably cannot do it like, like me, just look, at the, just look for the liver and convince myself that I'm in the esophagus. So after I've uh, found the, the liver, I mean, I take some efforts to document and take some pictures. Uh, I, I've gone on to find uh, the, the mass lesion. Essentially, we put in the scope and uh, we, we, based on CT, uh, the, the, the mass is on the left side. So we turn the scope to the left and we were able to find and visualize uh, the mass. Uh, if you look at this, you, you can see the shift. You see, I've pushed out the shift. I can't, I can't see the shift on the bronchoscopic picture, but, but I push out the shift so that I can see it on the ultrasound. Uh, and it gives me a good idea that when my needle comes out, it will go in this direction, right? It helps me to aim. This is a 22 gauge uh, needle. It's a, it's a fancy needle. So once I'm in, I, I uh, do do a few agitations. Usually I do about 10 or 15. Uh, with this needle, uh, we do a little bit less.
you, you can see that uh, the, the esophageal wall is uh, quite elastic and bouncy. So sometimes when you push the needle, it doesn't go through. It, it bounces back. So this lady, right, she's uh, diagnosed with uh, adenocarcinoma. Uh, somewhere along the way, she complained of a uh, backache. Uh, they did a PET and found a mat in her sacrum. Uh, there was enough tissue to do uh, molecular testing, and the oncologist uh, started her on osimertinib. You see, um, the part of the title also uh, uh, includes something uh, about the future. Uh, it's mentioned that uh, Bangalore is the IT city of, uh, of uh, India, something like a Silicon Valley. So uh, there's a lot of artificial intelligence and robotics and flexible robotics. Uh, that, that will probably affect uh, the way we do our scopes. Uh, but uh, I've decided to just stick with the literature. So if you look, uh, I think it was mentioned uh, either by, by I think by uh, Dr. Sunil, that uh, there's a mini uh, biopsy for SEPs. If you are able to make a puncture with a large bone needle uh, in, in, through the transbronchial, then uh, you can obtain your needle uh, biopsy specimens. Thereafter, you can put in uh, mini forceps or intranodal forceps and, and uh, remove, remove um, uh, tissue. Uh, in, in this meta-analysis, when you compare EBAS tbna uh, combined with intranodal forceps versus EBAS tbna alone, they find that there's greater yield. Uh, this this uh, this this uh, equipment is actually available, but I don't know how much you use it here in India. I I don't have it in uh, Singapore, uh, but they do uh, let us uh, try on it, so it, it's available for us to try. Uh, the other thing that that comes out that comes out is a transbronchial mediastinal cryobiopsy. I don't do this, but uh, I think a lot of my Malaysian colleagues uh, have experience in this. I'm sure they will share it with you uh, later on. Uh, this study is uh, published in uh, uh, ERJ. Um, Professor Felix heard from Germany and uh, collaboration with the Chinese. Uh, essentially, they showed that for lung cancer, uh, cryobiopsy, transbronchial mediastinal cryobiopsy uh, does not show an increase in diagnostic yield. But for uncommon tumors and benign conditions, it has a greater yield. Uh, with that, that's uh, my, my, my last slide. Uh, in November this year, there will be an APSR will be held in Seoul. This is where I spend time and uh, gain the skills in interventional pulmonology. So I think uh, uh, there is a great opportunity to, to learn and uh, innovate together uh, with the Koreans. Okay. Thank you for your attention. And uh, if you have any uh, questions, uh, please raise it. And it, yeah, if you, you prefer, you can email me. Yeah. Hello. Thank you, Jeffrey, for uh, hey, giving hi. an insight into the, the various skills in getting the sampling done for uh, staging mm -hmm. lung cancers, uh, both EBUS and the US. Uh, so the questions go. Any questions from the audience? I just have one question, like when you combine this EBUS and e e USB, so whether you prefer US first or EBUS first? Ah, so, so the evidence is that it doesn't make a difference in uh, diagnostic yield, whether you start with the US, uh, with, the, with the airway or the esophageal first. Uh, so for some cases where, uh, for example, uh, we, we already know it's metastatic cancer and we just need to uh, get a diagnosis or get molecular and, and uh, the, 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 the lesion is accessible by US. Uh, sometimes I just go straight for USB because uh, I find that uh, it, it takes less time. It's more comfortable for the patient. Uh, and and uh, it's, it's, for me, it's easier to do than the airway because I don't really have to deal with so much coughing and movement. For, for sometimes for staging, right? Uh, so, so for example, it's a left-sided lymph node and you, you need to stage from the right side, then you have no choice. You have to go into the airway first. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? So for beginners, probably uh, it will be uh, much more uh, uh, 
skills are needed. So probably the regular training, which probably you'll have tomorrow, hands-on training, you'll understand the, the technicalities of uh, doing at least the EBUS first. And then as you said, like more experience, then you can start doing the EBS. Thank you, Jeffrey, for a wonderful presentation. Yeah. We will now be playing a video of Dr. Angela Takano, Senior Consultant, Pathology, Singapore General Hospital, Singapore, delivering her talk on the topic, the EBUS Pathology Bundle, made easy for the eye of a pulmonologist. Good day, everybody. And first of all, thank you very much to the organizing committee, especially Drs. Lokesh Varan and Kumar for inviting me to participate in this EBUS conference. I will talk about the utility of rows in EBUS tDNA. These are the objectives of the presentation and I have no disclosures. The purpose of rows is to evaluate sample adequacy. We do this by determining whether or not the needle obtained material from the lymph node. Also to determine if this material is diagnostic of malignant or benign disease. Determine if the material would be sufficient for additional immunohistochemical or molecular studies and issue a preliminary diagnosis that may be used by the bronchoscopist to determine how to proceed further. In summary, we determine whether the material is adequate or not. And we ask the questions, did the needle get into the lymph node? If it's lesion or tissue, yes or no. Is it granuloma, malignancy, or other? If it's malignant, what's the differential diagnosis? Can we tell whether it's an adenoma, squamous cell carcinoma, small cell carcinoma, or we can only tell it's a non-small cell carcinoma. to do additional molecular studies, and we need to have sufficient material for this purpose. This is a summarized workflow of rows. So generally, we use a needle gauge 21 or 22. The operator will decide on which gauge according to the vascularity of the area. The number of passes is a minimum of three aspirations per lymph node, but recently an additional aspiration is recommended to have enough material for molecular analysis. The pulmonologist produces the smear, as we can see here, that is stained, especially with diff quick stain that is very fast to prepare. And we have immediately slides to uh, study and determine whether there is diagnostic material and if the specimen is adequate or not. Additional passes may be submitted in special fixatives or in saline to produce a cell block that can be later cut into a histologic slide. They can be used for immunohistochemical studies or molecular analysis. The sample fresh or in a fixative can also be processed for molecular and cytogenetic testing. Additional samples can be submitted for microbiological analysis of different kinds. The pulmonologist has to prepare the area where rows will be performed. It is a table set next to the bronchoscopy uh, table where he will uh, prepare the smear and also put sample into different fixatives. In this case, the pulmonologist is placing sample in cytolite that is going to be used to prepare thin prep slides. Also, the sample that was on the paper goes in formaldehyde, and this slide will be smeared and stained with the diff quick that contains a fixative, an eosinophilic, a basophilic stain, and water to wash it out. To have a proper 
smear, it's better to smear it with a second slide perpendicular to the first one in which the sample will, will adhere to the glass by surface tension and slowly but uniformly, the slide will be smeared towards the other end, producing this oval or elliptical shaped smear. These are examples of properly produced smears in which the diagnostic material is in this area and here centered in the slide. And these two are examples of slides in, in which the diagnostic material, material clotted before it could be smeared. In some instances, you can do what is called telecytology, a uh, cytotechnologist or a pathology resident or any performer can make the slide, can stain it and put it um, under the microscope and send the images uh, to a remote location uh, where the experienced pathologist or cytotechnologist could be able to give uh, an adequacy statement and diagnosis in some cases. There are other instances in which automated systems can scan the slide that has been stained by somebody else and uh, the images are sent, are, are sent remotely to uh, the specialist. Regarding adequacy in rows, we have different methods to determine adequacy. Uh, Jeffers et al. in 2015 published the Minnesota criteria. I like Choi et al. published in 2016 because it takes into um, uh, account the uh, parameters that the bronchologies or bronchoscopies can um, measure himself, such as the size of the of the core obtained and the number number of passes that he had to perform. So a minimum of three passes for, per lymph node are required. So this is the algorithm that Choi et al. Uh, prepared. So the criterion one is a core equal or more than two centimeters that makes an adequate specimen. Criterion two, presence of malignant cells. Uh, if they are malignant cells is adequate. Criterion three, presence of uh, uh, microscopic and trachotic particles, if they're present, is an adequate specimen. And criterion four, lymphocytes more than 40 per 10 high power fields, and that's also an adequate specimen. And um, so each criterion adds that to the accuracy of adequacy of specimens. So if we have criterion four, it's up to 97%. If we have criterion one, is Six, almost 65%, and you see they're cumulative, but also criterion four is the most important one to have uh, in order to determine accuracy of adequacy of specimen. So let's show some examples of rose cases in which case adequacy was assessed by these criteria. This is the case of a 69 year old man with enlarged mediastinal lymph nodes. And here, for illustration purposes, I use this picture from a publication, and it demonstrates that the, that the curly Q uh, clot core is more than two centimeters. So we have an adequate specimen from this criterion. The next step is to uh, examine the stain slide. And here we have the smear of station 4R lymph node. We see that there are, there are cellular clusters. Here we have antracotic material and lymphocytes. And here we have clusters of cells that we need to determine their morphology. So if we go higher on the larger clusters of cells, we see that they're trabecular formations, that they have uh, uh, nuclear uh, pleomorphism, variation in size and shape, and also enlarged hyperchromatic nuclei, prominent nucleoli, and abundant cytoplasm that is typical of adenocarcinoma. So we have the criterion two, we have malignant cells. Criterion three, we have microscopic antracotic pigments were seen, I didn't show in these pictures. And criterion four, we have more than 40 lymphocytes per 10 high power fields. We had four criteria of adequacy that correspond to 97% accuracy of adequacy. 
the Rose diagnosis was adenocarcinoma. The correlation with histology is as follows. On the core, we saw a solid adenocarcinoma. Here we have some luminal spaces, but it was TTF1 negative and positive for CK7. So there was still a possibility that this could be metastasis from another site, except that the radiologic examination of the lung parenchyma showed an image that is consistent with a primary adenocarcinoma of the lung. So in this case, this was considered metastatic adenocarcinoma compatible with a lung primary. Another case shows this uh, patient with cough and an opacity on a right apical area by chest X-ray. He had a history of TB that was treated and an enlarged station seven lymph node. So the main question is, is this malignant? Is this TB? Is this reactive? For the first criterion, the length of the core was unknown. Here are the smears and we have some clusters of cells. So we need to evaluate them on higher power. And here we see lymphocytes in cohesive clusters with abundant anthracotic material. There are no malignant cells. So we don't have malignant cells. We have my microscopic anthracotic pigments abundantly. We have more than 40 lymphocytes per 10 high power fields. So we have criteria three and four that corresponds to 97% accuracy of adequacy. So this material is adequate and the ROSE diagnosis was chronic inflammation. The correlation with the material prepared later is as follows. This is a station seven lymph node thin prep material that shows exactly the same findings, anthracotic pigments, lymphocytes, some macrophages, no malignant cells, no granulomatous inflammation. And the biopsy of the lung parenchyma show these pieces uh, partially of ovulated parenchyma, partially uh, uh, some vascular structures, but in the ovulated parenchyma, we have abundant chronic inflammation, no granulomatous disease, and no evidence of malignancy. So it was just chronic inflammation that correlated with the finding in the lymph node, which probably represents reactive lymphoid hyperplasia. Another case is uh, this one of a man with history of NPC. He came for surveillance. He had enlarged station seven and 10 hilar lymph nodes, and he underwent uh, biopsy and rose. We see that there are numerous lymphocytes in the background, and there are also clusters of cells that need to be examined on high power. And on high power, we see that they are cohesive clusters, formed by enlarged hyperchromatic nuclei. Some have prominent nucleoli. The cytoplasm is not visible. There are some lymphocytes close to these tumor cells as well. And so we cannot determine whether this is an adenocarcinoma or squamous cell carcinoma, but the morphology is that of a non-small cell carcinoma. So uh, we uh, uh, regarding the size of the core, it was less than two centimeters. So that criterion was inadequate, but we have tumor cells. So from this criterion is adequate. We have microscopic anthracotic cells. Yes, that I, I didn't show now on this particular case. And we had lymphocytes more than 40 per 10 high power fields, probably also yes. So in this particular case, we see that we have enough malignant cells. There are lots of malignant cells. So this sample will be adequate regardless of whether or not there are enough lymphocytes or anthracotic material. So the diagnosis was um, non-small cell carcinoma pending IHC on FFP slides. And this is the uh, histology tissue of station seven and 10 L lymph node. And we see here anthracotic material, some fibrosis and the tumor cells. We have enough material to do immunohistochemical studies for CK5, 6 and P40, positive indicating squamous differentiation and Iberish positive indicating a, a metastatic nasopharyngeal carcinoma from previously non-primary. Of course, there are primary lymphoepithelial carcinomas of the lung, but for that uh, diagnosis, we will have to have a mass in the lung. And this was just mainly uh, uh, enlarged mediastinal lymph nodes without a primary lung mass uh, that would indicate a primary tumor.
This example is a lady with asthma. He was hospitalized for septicemia, but was found to have an incidental right hilar mass, which was added on PET. So she underwent station 10 R lymph node uh, biopsy. And as we can see here already, the cellularity is very low. We hardly see few lymphocytes in the background, very, very few. And there are very few cells that on high magnification appear markedly atypical. I think we can say they're most likely malignant, but they're very few. The nuclei are enlarged, the cytoplasm is dense and abundant, and a little bit uh, uh, pulled to the sides as we can see here. So for the criterion, again, we had less than two centimeters. So this criterion was not fulfilled, but we have malignant cells. So, or at least we have to say they're highly suspicious of malignancy. They're markedly atypical. And the problem is they're very limited in amount. So even though there are malignant cells, because of the limited amount, it is most likely that the material that we obtain for histologic studies is also going to be limited in a way. And maybe there's not gonna be enough for molecular analysis. Lymphocytes, no, there were not so many lymphocytes. So the ROSE diagnosis was few atypical cells present, suspicious for squamous cell carcinoma. It's adequate in the sense that the needle sampled the lesion, but it may not be enough for molecular analysis. The correlation with histology is the station 10 R lymph node core tissue, which show a cluster of malignant cells with non-small cell morphology here, and enough to do immunohistochemical studies, and the immunohistochemical studies showed squamous differentiation. So in this case, we have a case of squamous cell carcinoma, but this patient is a non-smoker. However, she was exposed to secondary smoke. In these cases, especially women, we need to rule out primaries from the cervix that sometimes metastasize to the mediastinal lymph nodes without any pelvic uh, metastasis. So there, there have been many studies on the utility of ROSE, but the problem is all these studies have different endpoints. Some are for diagnostic yield, some are to see the correlation with pathologic diagnosis, some are for efficacy testing, so uh, uh, determining if more passes are needed or not, some are to determine the number of passes needed for molecular, some, some are to determine the impact on diagnostic yield, some on multigene molecular analysis, so they're all different studies. Some are positive, some are negative, some don't show difference between rows and not rows. However, there's been this uh, meta-analysis uh, by Schmidt and co-workers, but this meta-analysis is of rows on all organ systems. So what I did is I cut this graph, uh, eliminating the other organ system because it's a very long graph, and I just left the lung studies, the mediastinum, and also the lymph node, because I need you to show the bottom where you see whether the findings favor no rows versus rows. And as you see here, all this uh, curve is uh, shifted to the right side, which indicates that um, there is a difference between adequacy with rows and without rows. That's what RD means, the difference between adequacy with rows and without rows. And uh, in summary, this study indicates that rows increases adequacy rates in all organs and system studies. So we have pros and cons of doing rows. Uh, for example, uh, the pros are less need for additional sampling of needle cores, reducing complications if we already have diagnostic material that is enough, improvement of adequacy rate, improvement of diagnostic yield, improvement of sensitivity, but most important is for triage to determine whether additional material would be needed for diagnosis of ancillary uh, studies which can be molecular uh, for cancer or even microbiological. Cons is the need for experienced cytotechnologies or pathologies on site. It extends the time of the procedure. It can be equivocal and terminate the procedure prematurely. The pathologist is not compensated properly for the time spent and it needs optimal clinical pathological correlation.
I have the good news for the pulmonologist. This paper in 2021 showed that a trained pulmonologist can do roles. They studied 127 consecutive cases. This study comes from Wuhan, China, and they found increase in all the parameters, inadequacy of specimens, sensitivity, specificity, uh, sensitivity for diagnosis of specific uh, uh, tumors, and even uh, for tuberculosis. So their conclusions were that a trained pulmonologist can perform roles. And thank you very much for your attention and I'll be open to any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Angela. Dr. Angela will be joining us via Zoom link and um, please feel free to post your questions. Good day, everybody. And first of all, thank you very much to the yes, organizing committee, us, especially doctors Lokesh Varan and Kumar for inviting me to participate in this Hello, EBS hi. conference. Uh, I will talk uh, about I'm the utility of ROSE in EBS tDNA. Uh, These are the objectives you, of the uh, presentation uh, over the years, uh, and I have no as, disclosures. As, uh, the purpose of ROSE the, the is to evaluate sample adequacy. We do this by determining whether or not the needle obtained material from the lymph node. Also, to determine if this material is diagnostic of malignant or benign disease. Determine if the material would be sufficient for additional immunohistochemical or molecular studies and issue a preliminary diagnosis that may be used by the bronchoscopist to determine how to proceed further. In summary, we determine whether the material is adequate or not. And we ask the questions, did the needle get into the lymph node? If it's lesional tissue, yes or no? Is it granuloma, malignancy, or other? Dr. Angela, could you hear Dr. Jeffrey's question? Hi. Very good morning to all for attending this IP skill club from ASTO Intervention Pulmonology team. And I would like to thank uh, the organizers, Dr. Sunil and Dr. Watsa for inviting me on this uh, meeting on Dr. EBS. Dr. Angela, could you please and unmute your mic? And also the other faculty mic. members who are physically present, Dr. Ko and Dr. Arvind. Were you able so, to hear Dr. Um, Jeffrey's question to you? Unfortunately, I, I am I'm not able to Sorry, I'm I'm listening to another audio. It's so being local. It, it's okay. I can repeat. So this is my feeling uh, early in the morning from Singapore. When I thought on my hospital uh, told I me like to I have to be an examiner. Uh, over the years, and I have to. We have uh, advances in uh, needles and accessories used to uh, perform. Oh, Dr. Angela, can you hear me? I, I was listening to another audio. So sorry, what's your question? All right, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, now I can hear you, yes. Thank you, I'm, uh, I'm uh, Jeffrey. I'm from Singapore National University Hospital. Oh, hi, hi, Jeffrey. Yeah. Oh, hi, hi. Uh, I wanted to ask, over the years, uh, there's advances in accessories such as needles uh, used to obtain uh, specimens by the, by the matter of uh, Transbronchial needle aspirate or TBNA, EVAS TBNA. Um, so, for example, uh, they have larger gauge needles, they have core biopsy needles specially designed to obtain core uh, uh, specimens. So, on the pathology side, over the years, uh, have you uh, noticed any change in the quality of specimens over on the, on the, on the pathology end? Or are the specimens uh, still similar in quality? Uh, actually, I have to say the specimens are similar, you know, yeah, it just, um, uh, maybe it's, uh, it's a factor of the, of the performer, right? When the pulmonologist is first learning and also the cytotechnologist or cytopathologist to read the specimen is first learning, there may be kind of a, um, uh, a harder process they're like asking for more specimens or getting initially more hemorrhagic samples for example 
but as the um, pulmonologies and the trained cytotechnologies and pathologies learn, um, I think this gets better. So I don't think it's so much a factor of the different kind of needles, but the technique and the training and um, yeah, and the experience. Yeah, uh, that when when I speak to my uh, pathologists in the hospital, that's what uh, they they tell me. Uh, they they say that uh, when there are too many procedures in the hospital, they find that the quality of specimens can 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 vary uh, by a lot. Yeah, uh, I think it takes time, right? So uh, yeah, so it takes time for all the 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 younger pulmonologists, for example, to get to a level uh, of training where. Uh, yeah, the samples are not so hemorrhagic, for example. Yeah, I think it's it, it, every uh, institution can probably uh, refer a similar experience. Yeah. Right. Uh, okay, uh, I have a second question. Uh, how long uh, do you think it takes to train a pulmonologist up to do a, a rapid on-site uh uh, yes. Yeah, so, so there's these, these uh, papers and questions uh, uh, and depending on the settings, like if, for example, if in, in your particular setting, because the meeting is in India, I will refer to India. I know it's a very big country. You may not have uh, trained cytotechnologies and pathologies everywhere to help you. So in those particular cases, it would be very helpful. The issue is... Um, I, it's my particular opinion that the interpretation of the diff quick is a little bit harder than the interpretation of the Papa Nicolaou stain because the um, diff quick stain uh, has a lot of, um, of uh, artifacts. Uh, it has to be air dried and um, uh, it, the groups can appear very uh, clumped and even um, a little bit more uh, superimposed than what you see in the Papa Nicolau stain. And um, those features are difficult to interpret. So uh, only the experienced cytotechnologists and even cytopathologists can interpret a uh, diff quick very well. While the Papa Nicolau is a little bit easier because it's uh, fixed in alcohol. So it will remove some of the artifact uh, in part, not everything, because if the smear is not made properly, uh, there'll be a lot of blood maybe and not properly uh, made uh, like ovoid or elliptical smear that would make difficult to read for anybody. But, but Papa Nicolau in general will make the nuclei very transparent. So you can see how the chromatin is clumpy and the nucleoli really sticks out. You may see features such as delicate vacuolated cytoplasm, all these things that are not so easy to see on the diff quick. And a quick Papa Nicolau stain can be done. So if any pulmonologist for uh, reasons of not having enough uh, cytotechnologists or pathologists to help you would need to learn this, I would say it would be easier to learn it from the Papa Nicolau morphology. Yeah, for, for all the subtypes, for example, adenocarcinomas look very nice on Papa Nicolau. You can even see clearly the three-dimensional clusters. Then small cell carcinoma, you can see the fine uh, chromatin and the salt and pepper appearance, the smearing, all that is very neat. Uh, squamous cell carcinoma as well. If, if it's keratinizing, it will be easy to see. So that would be my recommendation. Uh, it would take... It would take a while. I would say no less than three to six months, maybe. The other question is, how free are you performing the, in, the endoscopic biopsy to get your hands on the microscope? Because I think that will completely disrupt your, your sterile environment. So I'm not so sure how you would organize this. You probably have to have maybe uh, um, a resident or somebody else helping. I'm not so sure how this will work because you have to get your hands on the microscope, right? You have to have everything sterile. It's not possible to have the knobs sterile. Maybe you have to cover them up with something. I don't know. I'm not so sure it works that fluently if you are doing the biopsy yourself and then having to look at the microscope at the same time. What do you guys think as the ones, you know, doing the procedure? Uh, so, so I, I, I think this sterile uh, issue. If you are afraid, you could change gloves. Uh, 
uh, halfway through the procedure. The other thing is that uh, the airway has a uh, uh, limitations with sterility. So uh, it, it is not uncommon uh, for pulmonologists to collect their own specimens with a little bit of help from the residents or the medical officers. Uh, and and uh, I, I, I think it can be quite uh, uh, disrupting. Too many things to do if I have to look in the microscope, but uh, I'm not sure. Maybe some doctors would actually prefer uh, to do that. Yeah. Thank you for your uh, answers. Uh, Angelina, uh, moderator here, Dr. Ramesh, thank you very much for the wonderful presentation and definitely it was useful for all the people uh, gathered here. I just wanted one quick question from you, I mean, opinion from you for those who are beginners, like where there is no rose available. Um, so how to, I mean, obtain a good smear? Uh, I mean, you showed some of the slides which to, but sometimes uh, we are unable to get a good smear or we are not trained to get a good smear. So in that context, like, uh, should we take the help from the pathologist or a technician to get a smear? Yeah, I think first of all, you could learn how to make a smear and, um, what, what we've done uh, at SGH is we've done some workshops practicing with, um, with material put in a glove. So you can get some like chicken livers and um, chicken livers are quite good actually and put them inside a, a rubber glove and then tie it up and made it like a, you know, like a specimen. This is your specimen. And then practice the... Uh, the biopsy on this material, and then you would get uh, an aspiration that is a little bit similar to what you get from, especially from the pathological lymph nodes, right? It's a bit creamy and soft. And then we teach uh, the students, so whoever wants to learn, to uh, express it on the slide and the correct practice. So the one thing that is very important is not to put too much of the specimen on one slide, right? Like a, a small droplet that is very consistent. It's not like tiny little squirts, squirts but it's like, like a well-formed droplet. That is enough. So you put that in the center of the slide and the other slide is perpendicular to that in this way, right? And as soon as the uh, super superior, the one the smearing slide touches the uh, the slide with the specimen, it would adhere, right? And then you just softly without crushing, slide it to the opposite side and you will get a perfect smear. I know the problem is, of course, when you're getting your, I mean, you have to be in the, in the, in the real, real uh, situation. When you're trying to get the material out of the needle, sometimes it squirts out, right? So if it squirts out, in many directions, then you tend to lose a little bit the, the specimen in that way. So you have to have a way to collect it that, um, that you tend to limit this type of artifact. If this has happened anyways, uh, okay, if it's squirted very thinly already, you don't need to crush it too much. You, if there's still something wet on the slide, you can try to, again, make a smear without crushing anything, just to slide the material slowly on the slide. So the smearing technique is very important. So I know many pulmonologists have different ways of doing this. For example, uh, in the paper of Professor Nakajima, he collects the specimen uh, on a small, a petri dish, and then from there he picks up a uh, little bit. So it all depends what kind of aspiration you get. If you get a very well formed curly Q um, clot that contains a diagnostic uh, material within, you can see which parts of this curly Q have the diagnostic material because you can really tell what is the blood clot, but there'll be some different color little bits there, as I show in the presentation in that paper. That paper actually was about a, a, a contraption to help you see where the particles are. Um, I, I mean, you could use something like that, but you don't really need that. Uh, that, that apparatus had a light underneath and uh, this, this strong LED light is, uh, is shown uh, from the base into a petri dish. So when you look into the petri dish, you can really see with some magnification also, you can see the particles and where is the diagnostic material. So the important thing is if you could pick out 
from these curly Q clots, the pieces that are the diagnostic material and just take a little bit and smear it on one slide, then uh, it's better than, uh, than trying to put a big chunk that contains a lot of blood. But I, I understand because the procedure has to be done very fast. And then when you get the material out, it's starting to clot already. So yeah, one thing is to, to tell you this and one thing is to do it in practice, right? So uh, I understand the constraints because I've, I've been in the, in the bronchoscopy suite. I know what happens. I know what happens when you squirt it out. So uh, yeah, it's a little bit tricky, but you do your best. So hopefully not all your samples will be just squirted out and it squirts everywhere. Hopefully a uh, majority of the samples will have your curly Q clot material. And uh, apart from that, you can have some that are just, that look almost like fluid only that comes out. But in, in, in most of your aspirations, you will have this material that you can pick up uh, specific areas of and made smears and take the other pieces for for uh, uh, formalin fixed specimen or to send in, in saline or in any other fixative, for example, um, some people will like it in um, RPMI maybe for uh, to keep the cells alive or uh, uh, saline can be used to make a cell block or formalin as well. So uh, for microbiology, of course, you have to send it in um, in a sterile condition if they want to do any molecular studies of uh, of bugs, for example, multi drug resistant TB or something else that is required by the by the microbiological lab. But in general, uh, the smearing technique is very important and it can be learned. So uh, once you once you get the the gist of it, uh, how to pick up the diagnostic parts and uh, what to do when you squirt out and it's all spread apart. Instead of losing that slide, it still can be used. So if it's very thin, you just let it dry and it's stained with, uh, with diff quick. Generally, that kind of material doesn't have many diagnostic cells in, in general. It happens like that. So the material that is diagnostic is the one that appears creamy, a little bit thick, a little bit whitish maybe, or a little bit like pus. Uh, yeah, that's the material that will be diagnostic. And, and in my experience, just rinsing needles without much material within is not so helpful. You won't have too much coming out of those rinses unless you are sure that stuff is left in the needle for some reason, that it was maybe clotted and you managed to get it out. But just rinsing slides after they have been squirted out, uh, the, the material from the aspirate has been squirted out first. Uh, I, I don't see many diagnostic cells coming from there. Thank you, Angelina, for the exhaustive uh, presentation and the response. On behalf of the organizers, I would like to thank you for being with us and giving an insight into the, the uh, preparing a good smear and rose. Um, the, uh, efficacy of rose. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thanks. Thank you. Up next, um, I would like to, we would like to hold the lamp lighting ceremony to mark the inauguration of ACE the EBIS conference and workshop. Um, also, I would like to thank Dr. B.R. Ramesh for moderating the session so gracefully. Um, I would also like to invite Dr. Sunil Kumar, Dr. Srivatsa, Mr. Hemant, and Mr. Ramesh onto the dais to grace the occasion. Thank you. Before that, we would like to hand over a memento to Dr. B. R. Ramesh for moderating the session. Requesting Dr. Uh, Sunil Kumar, Dr. Srivatsa, Mr. Hemant, and Mr. Ramesh to please light the lamp.
It gives me immense pleasure to let you all know Dr. Arun, uh, Head of Critical Care and Anesthesia has gladly joined this. Thank you, sir. Uh, a moment of uh, thing actually with thanksgiving actually i'm just asking dr watsa to hand over the bouquet to mr ramesh who is the ceo of our as a cmi next i just ask dr watsa to hand over the bouquet to dr arun who is a lead anesthesia and a critical care specialist at as a cmi and even hemant also is a chief operating officer at uh, as a cmi i'll request uh, dr ramesh to have a few words about this for the symposium what we are planning thank you sir very good morning to one and all i think um, it is really good to see such a large crowd in the sense you know a post covid we have never had such a large crowd assembled in one place so i still don't know whether i should put on the mask or remove the mask i think only the pulmonologists can say <laughs> anyway i have dared to do it now uh, the saga continues and um, i should um, i should uh, thank uh, especially uh, uh, dr sunil and uh, dr shrivatsa for having arranged such a wonderful program and and i never thought it is of this uh, uh, you know uh, scale i mean it is it is really wonderful and uh, i should um, also uh, welcome all the international faculties over here to aster and um, and also our our indian faculty or rather you have faculties across traveling from other states and are uh, and from bangalore so i welcome them all it is it's it's really a, um, a great honor to be here uh, to inaugurate this program today and um, when we envisaged uh, uh, aster cmi in creating center of excellence pulmonology is one of the the center what we always thought of and then um, of course to create a center of excellence for pulmonology i'm sure which we have and to have technology in place which should be the cutting edge and the infrastructure this ebus uh, workshop will definitely help um, uh, all those who have assembled here today and i'm sure it's it will be a great fr fruitful day in these two days today and tomorrow a lot of discussion i'm sure will be happening and and i'm sure most of them would go back with with enriched knowledge out of this workshop so um um great i i just wanted to um wish you all um great learning once again and especially uh, dr sunil and dr shivatsa great i'm sure this will be an instant success wish you all the very best thank you just request to dr arun to have a few words on this education actually is a person behind all the stuff what we do in uh, ot when it comes to rigid bronchoscopy and the ebus and all stuff what to say sir sunil is continuing what he does in ot throws up googly at every instance possible uh, i Uh, i welcome all of you to the ebus conference and uh, really dr sunil and dr shivatsa over the last 5 years we've been slowly getting there in terms of uh, putting things in place 
doing cases which uh, would have been uh, refused by a lot of other uh, hospitals that it actually expands our horizon as well because we get to see much more than what we would have done in the past and we excellent team here with the rest of his technicians and all of them who are on board in terms of trying to do best for their patients uh, once again welcome to bangalore uh, people who are from out of state or out of city will get to a taste of bangalore and its traffic uh, but hopefully you should have two good days of uh, excellent learning and uh, take home uh, from all the experts both national and international who are present here today thank you thank you very much sir for that uh, high note on the encouraging uh, stuff actually for us to that's been a motivation for, factor for us also and i thanks all the dignitaries on the stage actually for uh, helping us in terms of innovating this particular session now i think we'll just move on to our academic sessions thank you sir thank you. Thank you. Next, I would like to invite Dr. Uma Maheshwari, Professor and Head of Department, St. John's Medical. Okay. Dr. Lakshmi. Um, and Dr. Lakshmi Nasimhan, Senior Consultant, Manipal Hospital, Mysore, to moderate the next two sessions, please. Welcome, sir. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Harikishan to onto the dais to deliver his talk on unraveling magic of cryophobe and how this tool can. Uh, later in the evening, he has some. Uh... Uh, you know, uh, he's preoccupied with some things at his workplace, but nevertheless, he took all the pain to record his talk today so that we don't miss out on important aspects of EBUS. So Dr. Hari does not require any introduction. He is one of the leading interventional pulmonologists in this country today, and most of you know him by person. So what we bring here is a very innovative way of handling lymph nodes and lymph node sampling. So no doubt this is going to be an excellent talk. So let's go on to this recorded talk for now. Hi. Very good morning to all for attending this IP skill club from Astro Intervention Pulmonology team. And I would like to thank uh, the organizers, Dr. Sunil and Dr. Watsa for inviting me on this uh, meeting on EWAS and also the other faculty members who are physically present, Dr. Ko and Dr. Arvind. So, um, Unfortunately, I am not able to be there physically. Probably. I was the only one who is not coming there being local. So this is my feeling early in the morning. And I thought when my hospital told me like I have to be an examiner and I have to see what you guys are doing there virtually. Because I think now it's, it's the end of virtual meetings and uh, now physical meetings have started. So I'll try to communicate in uh, in a way where uh, probably I hope you understand at least something what I'm trying to convey to you in this manner through this virtual webinar. Uh, and I apologize once again to Dr. Watson for not being there. 
and then let's uh, talk about the topic. I was asked to talk on uh, endobronchial ultrasound in convex probe as well as linear probe in the mediastinum and also in the peripheral uh, lesion. So, but uh, I thought there is a lot of overlap uh, if I speak on the peripheral pulmonary lesions and the radial probe on the EPUS and the cryo probe. So I decided I will focus more on the mediastinal lymph node cryobiopsies. So um, are we all happy with the current EBUS tBNA? We all know that EBUS tBNA is the first choice for um, diagnosing mediastinal lymph node and also staging the mediastinum. A lot of uh, disease conditions can produce intrathoracic lymph node ranging from sarcoidosis to non-small cell lung cancers. And in this era of uh, um, lung cancer treatment, we know the, uh, there is a lot of importance on molecular markers, uh, which drive mutations and uh, immune targets are very important uh, uh, to personalize treatment options for patients who are suffering from lung cancer. And um, um, if we look at the current EBUS, like there are many modifications that are happening. If we think that this is uh, a, a procedure that we are very happy, uh, we don't uh, see these kind of changes because there are a lot of changes happening in, um, in if you talk on the, the design of the needles or um, also there are, we, we have seen a lot of changes in, in trap um, models like the distal tip has been changed a lot of times to uh, times and also uh, different size of needles are coming uh, ranging from 19 to 21 to 22 to 25. So all these things are basically looking at uh, trying to get more samples for the pathologists so that uh, they can process these for molecular analysis. Um, and we have some established facts on EVAS that uh, either you use a suction or not a suction doesn't really matter. And whether the gauze of the needle, uh, does it make a diagnostic difference? Definitely not, except that those samples are going to be more ready. And uh, we know that small gauze needles are more flexible than the larger gauze needles. Uh, you do a rose or not do a rose doesn't really matter, but it can reduce the time uh, of punctures and the number of punctures. So these are some facts that we uh, already know. And we look at uh, uh, the need for more tissue samples in this era of uh, next generation sequencing. Molecular classification remains an essential part of routine lung cancer care now, uh, with a growing number of targeted, uh, targetable molecular alterations. Because when we were um, studying or when we were trained on EBUS, we just have um, uh, EGFR, ALK-ROS mutations. But if you look at the panel now, like there are more than 50 uh, driver mutations, which you, you can process with the, these EBUS samples. And uh, if you look at the, uh, the number of patients that are diagnosed with non-small cell lung cancer, 30% of these patients has tumor cellularity less than 40% on the NGS. And in approximately 23% of these patients, the tissue is not adequate for molecular analysis. So due to, um, there may be different reasons why um, the tissue is not adequate. Uh, some scopes have a flexion problem where after you pass a needle, the flexibility of the scope will come down and you will not be able to reach the target properly uh, how you want it to. And also in some cases where there may be uh, necrotic debris and uh, even with repeated number of passes, you may not have a proper adequate uh, tissue sample for processing these for NGS or any other panels, resulting in low quality sequencing. So, uh, and also you look at the number of uh, molecular abnormalities and uh, the changes that are happening in uh, processing of these samples. So the number of uh, markers are growing day by day, uh, but, but the technology to obtain the tissue uh, uh, is, is taking a very, like we all talked on tissue the importance of tissue for the last five to six years, but not much has been uh, done except some changes in the needle shapes and the sizes of the needles. So this is the basic uh, basis for my lecture, uh, why we need uh, more tissue, 
and what, what can we do to get more tissue? And there are certain demands that need. We are all not very happy with uh, uh, the current EVS, uh, say it, the scope or the needles. Why? Because most of the times we do get a good diagnosis, especially when it comes to non-small cell lung cancer. But there are, every intervention pulmonologist has uh, a case, maybe not frequently, sometimes like uh, you bang right in the needle, in the node, but still, um, the pathologist says the material is not sufficient or sometimes you may not get diagnosis. And also, if you look at the um, false negative rates of uh, EBUS, there are some conditions where you get false negative, especially lymphomas. And, um, and, and due to the uh, design of the scope, sometimes you may not be able to reach uh, very angulated lymph nodes, especially the oral lymph nodes. So you have to choose to go to a smaller... Um, EBUS needles in those cases. Uh, I, uh, I, I'm, I know that the size may not vary uh, the diagnostic yield, but the amount of tissue definitely will vary uh, when you're using uh, a small needle and the vision uh, also gets a little distorted when you're using a small needle because it sometimes becomes difficult to identify the needle path or the needle inside the lymph node. And uh, uh, sometimes the, if you try to use a very large needle, large bore needles, the tissue samples can get contaminated with plate, again compromising the adequacy for genetic profiling. So these are all the problems that we routinely face during our EBUS TV in a practice um, when we talk on mediastinal sampling. And we get uh, some other techniques that's been like, these are the current changes like from the um, fevers till date, if you look at these are the new modifications that are being done uh, to, and the, and the whole point will take you towards getting more and more tissue or getting a core tissue. So if you look at the size, shape, you can see on your left, you have now um, the aqua needle coming in, which is being told as the biopsy needle and also there is a new sharp uh, model of uh, needle coming up and um, when you talk on the technique of EBS like a slow pull technique instead of a suction also showed in some papers that it can yield more uh, tissue and uh, fanning technique also showed that you can target um, different areas of uh, the lymph node uh, when you have a drop like metastasis and then acquire more tissue with this and the last one very uh, close to my topic is on internodal forces biopsies so there is enough um, papers to suggest that when you combine conventional ebus tbna with these internodal forces biopsies definitely the diagnostic yield is higher uh, in the combination compared to either ebus tbna alone or ebus mini forces biopsy alone so this has been uh, studied in various uh, countries um, and groups, and they have shown definite um, increase in the diagnostic yield with this, with this. And if you talk on cryobiopsy till date, we use most, mostly for endobronchial biopsies, transbronchial biopsies, cryorecanalization, devitalization, and removal of some foreign bodies. So let's talk on a new topic where we try to uh, take the advantage of the new miniature cryoprobe, that's the 1.1 mm cryoprobe, and then try to get into the mediastinum to the transbronchus. So that is where my uh, lecture is all about. And, uh, and we also compared like uh, the, when we put an EBUS needle, uh, you can see the flexion uh, uh, restriction. So the, the, your, the, your ability to flex the scope and extend becomes much less when you put the needle inside. But when you use the same 1.1 mm cryoprobe, it doesn't alter the uh, flexibility of the EBUS TBN scope. This is one additional advantage where you can, uh, it's like just, just the 25 Gaussian needle where the flexion abnormality doesn't happen compared to the other 22 or 20, uh, 19 Gaussian needles. So this is one very important point. And uh, let's look at the technique, like uh, how uh, we did it and how uh, the 
different different doctors are practicing this. So we used a 1.1 mm flexible cryopro. So we uh, initially did punctures uh, for, with all types of needles ranging from 19 to uh, 21. Uh, we did not try using um, a 25 gauze needle because the puncture site is too small after a 25 puncture, 25 gauze puncture. So initially, uh, we tried to do a conventional EBUS TBNA, and then the key step in this is like identifying the point of puncture with the previous EBUS TBNA needle. So if you are able to uh, suction properly and uh, clean the area where you have done a puncture because sometimes the nose can have a little ooze at the site of puncture. So the, you have to clean the area surface and then try to gently find the area where you have done your puncture with your rebus needle and then try to gently push the 1.1 mm cryoprobe through the ebus core into that puncture site and visualize that on the ultrasono images and then try to uh, uh, see that you have a direct vision when you uh, puncture the lymph node and under the EBUS guidance the cryopro position will be confirmed and then we used an activation time of three to four seconds uh, that's the maximum because this is a, a new procedure and we will remove the whole scope end block along with the cryopro with the foot switch activated and then these tissue samples we process the same way how we process uh, our conventional transbronchial lung biopsy specimens. So this is, uh, in this video, I can uh, show you the procedural steps in this. So step one is performing a conventional EBUS TBNA using uh, any needle that is available with you ranging from 19 to 22. Uh, and then here you can see we are using a 19 gauze needle and then uh, use the slow pull technique uh, to do the conventional EBUS TBNA. So once you're done with your conventional EBUS TBNA, slowly uh, introduce the cryoprobe through the same uh, instrument channel on the EBUS core. Note that the, um, the advantage means like um, the, if you compare the previous 1.9 mm disposable cryoprobes to these, probes is that these probes are a little stiff. So you take the advantage of that stiffness on the wall and then try to locate the initial puncture site. You can see I'm trying to locate on the bronco image down there on the left and then slowly push your uh, cryoprobe so that you maintain the vision throughout the puncture like you can see and then use a Doppler uh, to see uh, whether you have uh, any major vessels nearby and then activate the cryopro for three to four seconds and remove and block how you do uh, for your transbronchial cryobiopsies. Uh, and then transfer these specimens for more uh, analysis to the pathologist. So uh, this is a very simple technique and you can see at the tip of the ebuscope, you can see the uh, material that is frozen and then you can process those samples depending on what kind of uh, disease you are suspecting. So this is how uh, we did. And uh, we initially tried to do four consecutive patients who were referred to us. We tried to choose a uh, little larger lymph nodes since because we never knew what's going to happen in these patients. And mind, these patients uh, have a little 1.5 to 2, uh, 2 centimeter lymph nodes on there. And first patient was a 59-year-old female who was a uh, never smoker, but she had some mediastinal lymphadenopathy, uh, but asymptomatic and was uh, planned for a surgery on, uh, on her pre-anesthesia checkup. They found that she has got a mediastinal lymph nodes and then referred to us for uh, um, EBUS sampling. And uh, you can see this second patient has got a left hilar uh, mass. And... Uh, Hyaluridinopathy, and the third patient has again subcarinal lymph nodes, and the fourth patient has got a right um, right hilar adenopathy uh, with some conglomerated lymph nodes. So uh, these are our four patients, and all these four patients underwent endobronchial EBUS 
initially normal conventional evs tbna and we did all the procedures under uh, general anesthesia using a supraglottic device laryngeal mask all these evs tbna samples that were uh, collected with the conventional were processed for rows and then cell box were prepared from the material obtained so these are the characters for our patients which we did in the initial uh, stage and uh, uh, you can note here that all these patients rose analysis on conventional evs tbna was also uh, positive but why uh, you may ask me why you went on to do um, this procedure is uh, we were looking at feasibility of uh, doing uh, because the first uh, case when i was doing the initial rose was negative for the first or one or two passes but later uh, after a few passes the rose also was positive for conventional tbna also so uh, we just looked at uh, feasibility of doing such procedure without any incision or uh, without using any electrosurgical device uh, in the bronchus and then uh, the range of diagnosis we got from granulomatous inflammation with sarcoidosis to tb and also uh, we have a metastatic adenocarcinoma in one of these patients and complications wise uh, we did not uh, see any complications and the number of samples we obtained with this was nearly uh, two samples we did not try to take more samples because we thought that would be more sufficient and um, uh, one patient had a minor boost like it's much less than what we observe in our conventional ebs tbna and then that we were able to control with normal uh, two to three cc of cold saline there and um, no major uh, anesthetic uh, related complications or post procedure pneumothorax or um, pneumomediation was observed after these uh, cases and we followed up them with an x-ray for all these patients after the procedure and we uh, published this initial case series uh, in respirology and uh, and one good thing with this procedure is like uh, we also looked at whether we will be able to do molecular analysis on these uh, patients and all the samples the pathologist was happy and he was able to process uh, for markers in these patients so with this uh, it, it it looks like uh, the first case in this series what we try to prove is technically this procedure is feasible and um, safety wise also we did not face much problems initially and the samples were added to perform uh, ihc or molecular analysis then uh, the largest case uh, a randomized control trial was published in erj journal from um, zhang gu um, um, they they had a few changes uh, from what we uh, described like um, they used a freezing time of nearly 7 seconds for lymph nodes and they sampled most of the lymph nodes most of the lymph node stations in these patients uh, ranging from 1 cm to around 8 cm uh, lymph node masses and you can see the different spectrum of uh, location of these nodes uh, what they punctured since uh, and it was nearly 197 patients where they got a diagnosis um, in around 93% of these patients and in 152 patients both tbn and cryobiopsy had um, given them diagnosis and in 26 additional cases where conventional ebs tbn failed cryobiopsy was able to establish the diagnosis and you can see the spectrum of this is here again uh, sarcoidosis lymphoma was also in the list which is which is where uh, we are looking at that uh, these are the spectrum of diseases like uh, uh, sarcoidosis with fibrotic lymph nodes or uh, lymphoma where the conventional ebs tbna diagnostic yield is a little less compared to non small cell lung cancers and um, and surprisingly there are three patients in this group uh, that uh, they got diagnosis with the conventional tbna it was tbna but could not get diagnosis with the cryobiopsy uh, so we need to look into what, what what might be the reason for this and if you look at the overall yield for the, uh, conventional ebs tbn it was 79 7, nearly 80% and for cryo it was 91.8% uh, but um, one important thing they noticed is that for common lung cancers like for which we usually do ebs tbn most of our cases comprise of these common lung cancers there was not much difference either you try to choose 
doing a conventional ebus tvna or a cryo ebus tvna uh, there was not much difference but uh, in uncommon tumors like sarcoma and all uh, the diagnostic variation was quite uh, large and cryo fares over conventional ebus tvna in such uncommon tumors and also in benign tumors the yield for cryo was 80% was where um, the conventional ebus tvna had only 53% so and uh, this this procedure also they have they have um, one or two patients who had pneumothorax with subcutaneous aid but mediastinal emphysema but uh, uh, not uh, requiring any intervention or uh, anything and they have demonstrated an excellent safety uh, pro uh, profile the only difference uh, is that they uh, used an electrosurgical knife to um, make a breach uh, in the bronchus or just create a small orifice and then go through that. that uh, may, sometimes maybe when you're not able to, to puncture it, uh, it makes the procedure more easy. But uh, this procedure can also be done without uh, using an electrosurgical uh, incision on the bronchial wall for most of the cases, I mean. And um, this procedure is very uh, quickly adapted by many um, uh, centers in the Europe and uh, this group from Italy also published their case series uh, recently. And uh, the problems uh, we should understand with EBUS TV syndrome, because, uh, um, because uh, we made this video, uh, we, we got a lot of um, questions from people who try to do it and uh, they have uh, different uh, questions like, because um, what type of scope to use? Like, uh, is it only possible through one company scope? No, but uh, no, the the Greece uh, series, like if you look at the, the not published yet, but more than hundred patients they used Fujifilm scope, and uh, we used Olympus here. Uh, there is a group from Spain that is working on around sixty patients at the time. They are using Pentex. So with all the three available EBUS scopes, it is um, possible to do a cryo lymph node biopsy. Uh, and uh, coming to the freezing times again, it uh, uh, varies uh, because there is no standardization of what is the freezing time. This is what we have to look into. Uh, we used around three seconds, other centers use five seconds, and some do. Like, I, I think uh, an average of three to four seconds of freezing is much sufficient to get um, a good diagnostic yield, as also uh, sample, process these samples for molecular analysis. And uh, most common uh, question many people had is like, they were able to see the probe in the lymph node on the sonography, but when they pull the scope out, uh, the sample is not coming. So this is one uh, problem. Here you have to look into two things. One is like, uh, when uh, usually at the point of entry, like, I mean, uh, when you're doing um, at, the, at the point where you push your, uh, uh, Cryoprobe. This this small miniature cryoprobe is very um, fragile. That means it bends a little if you try to push on the mucosa to puncture the mucosa and go inside the lymph node. So at that point, what happens is like if there if there is a bend, the freezing doesn't happen at the tip, and then the cooling is uh, reverted back. So this is one common problem, and this happens especially when you start using these probes for uh, three to four patients. And also what happens is like, if you start using these probes, uh, ideally these are single use probes. If you use for more number of patients, the freezing uh, time also has to be increased from three to five to or seven seconds. Because as the time passes, the gas starts leaking from these probes because they're very, very uh, fragile. And um, so if you start your procedure uh, after opening a new probe, if what your three seconds of freezing the tissue sample you get, that you will get at five to seven seconds after 10 procedures. That is what happens. So it's ideally recommended to use uh, one time so that you get good um, sample. And uh, some also have problems puncturing the, identifying the area of puncture and entering the lymph node. Uh, uh, our technique is like we do a little rough EVAS TBNA, like once you see the needle uh, between the, bronchial wall and the lymph node, I try to use my uh, flexion uh, in, in, in up and down direction to create a small rent-like thing. But uh, 
uh, if you ask Professor Heraclitus from Greece, what he does is like, uh, he, once he identifies the point of puncture with the conventional EBUS DNA, he goes back with the 1.1 probe and doesn't go uh, push the probe inside at the first instance. So he'll try to freeze that area of the puncture with the probe for three to four seconds so that that area gets softened and then he will be able to push. This is a very uh, good technique I, I also feel. And uh, the mini probe gets kinked very easily. So you should not apply much force to enter the uh, bronchial wall. So to conclude my lecture on EBUS, uh, there are many techniques to acquire uh, adequate tissue. And uh, that, that is where we are all uh, working on by uh, doing all these modifications. And uh, it, it, it uh, doesn't mean that you do this kind of procedure for all the patients. Maybe uh, in future, like if you have a needle with a sharp tip or where the tip only freezes, because the problem with 1.1 probes is that uh, the shaft also will start to freeze. Like if your depth of uh, EBUS probe, uh, the cryo probe is not very inside, uh, once the shaft starts cooling, when you pull out, that shaft gets attached to the mucosa at the point of entry. Again, that becomes a very hard pull. So again, chances of um, bleeding or some complication in this area. So that is one thing we should uh, always uh, notice. And uh, we, uh, in our center, uh, kept it as a, uh, as a procedure for those who get initial negative EBUS, but many star centers started doing it as the first choice of procedure and uh, they were successful. So we need uh, more uh, time uh, to see how this procedure will fare in uh, future. Till date, uh, like um, the safety pro uh, profile is good and also feasibility is already established that we can do this procedure safely in patients, especially those patients whom uh, we may have an initial negative EBUS TBNA, like lymphoma or other diseases, whatever reason may be. So uh, with that, I end my lecture and you can see here different groups uh, very quickly adapting to this procedure. And uh, most centers in Europe, like uh, I, I have I've been working with a few centers, they've completed nearly more than 50 to 100 cases. That's how rapidly this procedure is being adapted. And um, and also you can see different types of scopes here, like uh, you can also use the Pentex scope, Volumposcope or the Fujifilm scope. And you can see the beauty of the samples that you can get with this uh, new technology. So uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer on this email since I'm not physically present. And once again, I thank organizers, Dr. Sunil and Watsa for giving me uh, this platform to talk on uh, EBUS Cryo. And I hope I see you tomorrow for a live cases um, in the operating room. Thank you. Have a good day. Holding a QA. However, he'll be available during the gala dinner tonight and he'll be more than Hi. happy to answer your question. Uh, next, I would like to invite Dr. Kedar Hibare, Consultant, Interventional Pulmonology, Narayana Health, Bangalore, India, to the dais to talk on the topic, finding your way through tumors and staging, an evidence-based approach to using EBUS. Over to you, Dr. Kedar. Kedar has arrived with a bang. Thanks. <laughs> That was unintentional, though. It's okay. And... Um... Of so, physical uh, meetings have started. And so I'll try to communicate in, uh, in a way where uh, probably I hope you understand I come, at least uh, something what, what I'm trying to cardiac, uh, convey to you in this manner what you on the right is my through this virtual uh, webinar. That's the Mazum Dasha Center. Uh, and uh, just I apologize once again to Dr. Vatsa for not being there.
So what you see. And then let's uh, talk, uh, talk about the right? topic. I was so asked right to talk on uh, endobronchial so ultrasound in and we are on the probe as well as linear so probe in the medial genome the same and also in the peripheral uh, lesion. So, so but, uh, I thought there is a lot of overlap uh, if I speak on the peripheral pulmonary lesions and the uh, radial probe on the ebus and the prior probe. So I decided I will Bollywood movies. Come on. All of you, right? So as I grew up, I was seeing these movies and these are all basically the one word movies with whether it's Sajan or Guide. And these days you get the flavor, you know, it's like the movies run from left to right. Uh, you know, the, the long names that you see, it all started with probably Hum Aapke Hai Kaun and uh, the list is pretty endless. And when Vatsa gave me this topic, I was actually reminded of these movies. So it took me some time to basically understand uh, what he's, what he wants from me. And I was really flabbergasted to understand what he's really expecting in this talk from me. So my reaction when he gave me this topic was something like this. So I was pretty angry. I didn't understand what he was expecting from me. But this is basically what I'm going to talk on. So that entire long topic that Dr. Vatsa gave me, usually they give short topics to friends, but I don't know why. I mean, Vatsa is a good friend, but he still chose to give me such a long talk. So, so what I'm talking today is basically on staging EBUS, and I'm going to be talking on the why and how I do it. So the agenda for today is very, very simple. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you and give you some basic concepts because that's basically the agenda that was given to me that I'm supposed to cover basics. Uh, after giving you the basics, I'll give you a little more basics. And once we are done with that, we'll give you more concepts. So basically, we'll give you more basics and concepts for you to digest. And that's the whole idea of my talk. So let's get to the first part where I give you the real hardcore basics. A part of it actually was covered by Watsa himself. And this is the eighth TNM classification. I won't go into the T and the M parts, but what is important and what my talk is going to focus is on the N part. So in the eighth TNM, when compared to the seventh TNM, you will see that there were no changes or no classifiers that were modified for the node status. So it remains the same. So what you see in red on the left, is basically what was changed from the seventh to the eighth TNM classification. And you can see in the nodal status or the nodal classifiers that there were no changes. Mediastinal involvement basically determines surgical resectability. So my whole talk is going to be revolving around this particular area. And for your understanding, when we are talking and say that a node is malignant, we're basically meaning a short axis diameter of more than one centimeter on a transverse CT scan. So these are very, very important numbers for you to remember. And I want you to recall that Dr. Vatsa was talking about how it is important to always sample a node which is more than 10 millimeter, which is what is the whole idea. So if we oversimplify our lung cancer management algorithm, this is probably how it looks. So basically a patient with lung cancer comes to you, you basically are thinking whether you're going to put him into a curative mode or you're going to put him into a palliative mode. That's basically what it is. And if that's what is going to be going to make the difference in your patient's life, the midpoint of that is somewhere around stage 3B. So if a patient is above stage 3B+, plus, he goes into a palliative state. If he's below stage 3B, lesser than that, you may attempt a curative depending upon how the things go, right? And for everything of this, the lymph node is something that is central to your management. So what is the lymph node status is what basically determines whether patient goes towards more curative or more, more palliative. It can also involve the fact that you may restage it. That is, you may want to downstage by giving him chemotherapy and then restage him. But essentially, this is basically what you end up doing. Now, since most of you are here new to EBUS, I just thought, let me put the lymph nodal status map. And why this is important is because of the next slide. Now, what you need to understand is this is the new IASLC map and every single thing about lung cancer today gets discussed about from this map. However, from a historical perspective, it is important for you also to know that there are two other classifications. One is the mountain wrestler system and of course the Naruke classification. Now, this is the IASLC map and we're talking about 14 stations or rather the 12 stations when we're talking about EBUS. 
But what is important to understand is what does N1 refer to, N2 refer to, and N3 refer to. And this picture is something that you need to imprint in your minds. In very, very simple terms, just observe where is the tumor. The double digit numbers or the double digit uh, lymph nodes on the same side of the tumor are N1 stations. So if you look at the picture on, the on, on your left, uh, the tumor is actually on the left side of the lung and the N1 stations are the stations which are double digits, that is number 10 and number 11 and on the same side of the tumor, okay? So this is something I'm going to spend a little bit time on because this is something you need to imprint in your mind. N1 station is always on the side of the tumor. N2 station is always station 7, okay? Whether it is the tumor is on the left or on the right, but N2 basically includes the single digit stations on the same side as the tumor. So in the left side of the diagram, you can see that 4L, 5, 6, and 2L all happen to be N2 in that case when the tumor is on the left side. Very clear. And N3 stations are those which are contralateral, completely on the opposite side. Okay. So to repeat it again, because this is such an important concept, N1 is the double digit stations closest to the tumor. N2 is on the, again on the same side, but they are single digit stations and includes station seven every single time. Anybody says station seven, N2 lymph node, period. Station, uh, the N3 lymph nodes are the opposite side stations. So I've given you the first part of my talk, which is basic concepts. Now we'll add a little more concepts to it. I'm, many, I'm pretty sure those of you who have been in the interventional circles interested in interventional pulmonology have seen this book by Professor Colt, which is on bronchoscopy and central airway disorders. It's a wonderful book and I'd recommend everybody read it. But this whole book is based on something called as the four box concept, a group A, group B, group C and group D. And what we are going to do in lung cancer now is going to discuss everything in lung cancer into four groups so that it makes your life very easy and for you to remember. So this is the third NSCLC ACCP guideline, which was published quite a few years ago. And what interestingly this particular guideline did is they made something called categories of lung cancer for in, and, and this was a radiographic classification. And they had four basic uh, radiographic categories, group A, group B, group C, and group D. Now, please remember group A is on the top left-hand corner, group B is on the left side bottom, Group C is right side top and group D is right side bottom. Very clear. Now, please compare group A on your extreme left to the diagram on the right side. So what is group A? Radiologically, it's nothing but mediastinal infiltration by the tumor. Okay, this is again something that you guys have to remember. It's mediastinal infiltration by the tumor. If you go to group B, the radiological classification, it's enlarged discrete N2 and 3 lymph nodes. Group three is central tumor with an enlarged N1 lymph node that is on the same side. And the last category, which is group B, is nothing but peripheral small tumors. So my talk is basically on staging EBUS, when to do it. And therefore, these are the four categories I'm going to highlight. Okay, so let's go to each one of these groups one by one. Top left-hand corner, group A. So this is basically group A. And I and to repeat myself, it includes basically metastatic disease. So if you have a patient with a metastatic disease or where there is already a breach of the major vessels, you don't have to really stage the patient. He's already stage four, right? So basically the goal in this case is usually palliation. In the TNM staging, they're usually above 3B. So staging EBUS is unnecessary. So group A patients, you do not have to stage them. Are we very clear about this? Yeah. Okay, that's great. So choose the most easily accessible site for biopsy. If the patient is having hemoptysis, just go in and take a biopsy because that indicates that there is an airway infiltration. But if you find that there is no infiltration, you may have to do an EBUS, but the point here is you do not need a staging EBUS. That's basically what it is. Very clear about group A? Yeah. Good. Now let's go to my previous diagram where it was group B. It was on the left corner, bottom side. So what is basically group B? We're talking about enlarged discrete N2 and N3 lymph nodes. Okay. So N2 means same side, single digit. N3 means opposite side. Okay. So what can you do in this case? You'll have to go, you can attempt a curative treatment. 
likely, I'm not saying it's always a must, but likely you're talking about stage 3B or lesser. Sometimes you can give chemo, initial chemotherapy and downstage the tumor. But in this case, the staging is mandatory. So the tumor is on one side. You want to know if it is spread on the other side. So here is where staging EBUS becomes very necessary. And that's important even later after you've given chemotherapy because you may want to downstage or restage the tumors. Okay, so we've finished with group A and group B. Let's go to group C and D. Now, it's important to understand when you're talking about group C and D that we're talking about radiologically normal mediastinum. So your lymph nodes are not enlarged, right? So this is a situation which is radiologically normal mediastinum and the definition of group C tumors would basically include central tumor and tumor with an enlarged N1 node. N1 node is on the same side. N2 nodes are normal. N3 nodes are looking normal on your CT scan. So should you stage really? Yes, you should because the goal here is curative. They again fall into the category of tumors which fall lesser than stage 3B. Here, staging EBUS becomes very mandatory. Okay? Clear about it? Understood any doubts, anyone so far? Because this is very critical to the understanding of when to do staging e-buses. Let's go to group four or the group D. In group D, again, you have a radiologically normal mediastinum. These are peripheral small tumors. I'm repeating, these are peripheral small tumors. The size is likely to be less than three centimeters. And location is also very important, whether it is in the outer one third of the mediastinum I mean, outer one third of the lung, the middle one third of the lung, or the inner one third of the lung. But important to understand that 4% of these patients can still have an unsuspected mediastinal disease. In the group C, this was about 20 to 25%. So one in every four case you will miss if you don't do staging. Here it's far lesser, but, it, but so, so your question is likely to be, so if it is 4%, is it okay to give up on staging? It's not. The point is, if you prove that the patient has got a tumor, he goes in for a curative surgical resection and your surgeon all, is almost always supposed to do a complete mediastinal resection. So your lymph nodes get sampled at surgery, not at EBUS. Are we clear on this? So peripheral tumors, lesser than three centimeters, no need to do a staging EBUS, okay? So staging EBUS is unnecessary, but we'll come to it again. So how does this algorithm now look? Okay, so we said group A, right? What are we going to do? It's already probably vascular invasion. No need to do a staging EBUS. Group B and group C, of course, yes, a staging EBUS is necessary. Uh, coming to group D, we said staging EBUS is unnecessary, but complete mediastinal lymph node dissection anyway happens at surgery. So we do get an idea of what we have to do next, right? But nothing in life is really obsolete. Everything is only relative and the only thing that is absolute uh, is that. So having given you the basic concepts on lymph nodes and how you classify your CTs, I'll add more concepts now. Okay. And what are those concepts is what are the problems with this particular classification, right? So let's get to the problems. Now, when we are talking about this four uh, group A, B, C, and D, there are two problems. One problem is something called central tumor. I didn't touch upon what is a central tumor at all in my discussion. I just said if it's a central tumor and we don't really have a definition of central tumor. We're also talking about peripheral pulmonary lesions and malignancy inside that. And if your lesion is less than five millimeters, the rate of malignancy is about 1%. Between five and 10 millimeters, it's six to 28%. And more than 20, that's more than two centimeters. It's about 64 to 82% of malignancy, right? So what is a central tumor? Does anybody know what a central tumor is? And it, interestingly, there was a group which actually looked at it and they defined what a central tumor was. And they wanted to know how many of the interventional pulmonologist and the thoracic surgeon understand or as per their training, understand what a central tumor is. And this was a very interesting survey by Roberto Casal published in uh, AJRCCM, I think around the 2015 or so. And this had very interesting questions. I'm going to take you through some of those. The first question is what definition do you use for central tumors? And they had four options, okay? Uh, two of those options actually said tumors located within the inner one third of the hemithorax. And one of the other option was tumors within the inner two third of the hemithorax. So the AABIP fellows answered, the American Association of Bronchology and Interventional Pulmonology fellows answered in a, in, in a different way compared to the thoracic surgeons. That's because 
the ACCP guidelines defines central tumors as tumors which are located within the inner one third of the lung, while the European Society of Thoracic Surgery and the NCCN guidelines, which is the National Cancer Guideline, actually spoke, speaks of tumors located within the inner two, two thirds of the hemithorax as central tumors. So there is no consensus on what is a central tumor. The second question is when you're talking about inner one third, outer one third, how do you draw these lines? And who draws it and what is the consensus so here you can see two two images you can actually see one is a transverse scan and the other one is an axial one and you can actually see three concentric circles so which is the one which you're supposed to use for saying inner one third middle one third and outer one third again not many people have a, a you know uniformity in answering this okay but actually the b lines are the ones which are supposed to be the uh, uh, ways in which you're going to uh, divide the hilum or divide the lung into inner, middle and outer one thirds. The third question in this survey was very interesting. Now, if you had a tumor which was on the border, where would you really put in the inner side, in the middle one or in the outer one? And again, there was no consensus, but the right answer was not applicable. We do not classify central tumors based on thirds of heavy thorax. So now, you understand that it's very easy to talk all of this, but radiologically, you want to say it's a central tumor. You really can't define it because there's no definition. And then complicating the problem further is what is a PPL, a peripheral pulmonary lesion. So we don't have a definition of a peripheral pulmonary lesion. So the easiest way to define is what is, can a lesion which is not central be called peripheral? And then there are lots of peripheral pulmonary lesion papers which define as bronchoscopically visible and bronchoscopically invisible. I won't go into the survey results, but needless to say that neither the thoracic surgeons nor all the interventional pulmonologists were on the same page in understanding what a central tumor is and what a peripheral tumor is. However, over the last few months, new papers have come into this arena and we are now understanding or our understanding has grown to accept the inner one third to be the central tumors. There's more confusion because there's again something called solitary pulmonary nodule. And there's a lot of problems in defining what a solitary pul pulmonary nodule is and how is it different from a peripheral pulmonary lesion. So needless to say, we can end this discussion by saying that all solitary pulmonary nodules are not peripheral pulmonary lesions. And neither all pul peripheral pulmonary lesions have to be solitary pulmonary nodules. Both central and peripheral pulmonary lesions need clear definitions and that's what we are looking for. And this has implications in lung cancer staging. Okay. So again, going back to the four box approach, whole body PET CT is not done. Okay. And this is the radiological classification. Now, this is how the thing looks. Now, the last part is about the peripheral pulmonary lesion malignancy, and we've already discussed the rates and different sizes of this. So two interesting new papers recently came out. One was called as the cubic prediction model, and the other one was called as the HOMA model. And so now the current understanding is when you have a patient in group D, that is, you have a patient with a peripheral pulmonary lesion, you take them through either the cubic prediction model or the HOMA prediction model. You look at the likelihood of the lymph node being positive and then decide to sample it or not. And what does the cubic uh, prediction model have? It includes something called the largest media standard lymph node size, the presence of a clinical N1 disease, tumor centrality, and lesion standardized uptake values. While the HOMA prediction model has four different characteristics. It looks at age, location, a background carcinoma, higher PET CT nodal staging. So these are the four characteristics. The HOMA basically uh, accepts for predicting the malignancy in a lymph node. So now how does the four box approach finally look to us? Obviously group A, staging EBUS is unnecessary. Group B, yes, staging very much required. Group C, staging very much required. And what's important to remember is the ACCP definition of central is one third, inner one third of the lung. And the last one in the peripheral pulmonary lesions, you basically make the patients go through Quebec or HOMA model of malignancy prediction. And once you are done with that, then you decide on whether you want to sample the mediastinal lymph nodes or otherwise. So now that I've given you the basic concepts, I'll go to the next.
and of course their sensitivity and specificity is far less when compared to the invasive modalities the invasive modalities are again classified as minimally invasive and surgical with the surgical being video assisted media stenoscopy the minimally invasive ones would be our ebus tbna the eus fna done by gastroenterologists or what is now emerging to be the most consensus and the most uh, you know uh, single procedure single shot at one point in time is ebus with eus bfna and there's enough data for it so this is basically a diagram i'm sure many of you who have read ebus literature have come across this is basically the reach of the ebus scope and the eus scope i won't waste much time but this is how the scope looks and you know that the gastroscope is much larger it can fan the needle in different directions inside the lymph node and is able to sample a lymph node better than what the ebus is but depending upon target what is important to understand is definitely because of the size and the fanning and the ease the eus scope is definitely better than the e uh, ebus scope but when you look at all the permutations and combinations if you are somebody who knows ebus and are capable of doing eus bfna that is using our ebus scope inside the esophagus to sample uh, lymph nodes and adrenal gland as the case may be there's always a possibility that that is probably the best combination you can get and again i'm not going into the data because i think it's more than well established that a combination of ebus tbna and eus bfna is the best for our patients so how is staging ebus done so i i was talking about when it is supposed to be in what situations and how it is supposed to be done now the easiest way to understand is look at this uh, diagram and you have a tumor which is on the right side so that's marked t what you do is exactly go on the opposite side so you always sample from n3 n2 and then n1 and now there's a lot of literature which is also coming which is talking about single versus multi station n2 dcs i'm not touch too many too much about in that on that area because uh, this is a basic ebus class so i just thought that i'll limit myself to the understanding of core concepts but it is important to understand that now yasufuki yasufuku and colleagues in canada are now working on something called single versus multi station n2 dcs where what they're trying to do is see if two lymph nodes in n2 station are involved and if so they may push towards palliation but if it's a single station n2 disease they may still push towards surgery so we are still getting much uh, you know higher in terms of where we are headed now this is another diagram that most of you would have seen at conferences or ebus uh, uh, workshops so this is a landmark approach the reason i put this up is because most of them confuse uh, the landmarks to the uh, uh, staging ebus so what you see on the left side of your screen is how you are supposed to go about looking for the lymph nodes when doing ebus but the diagram on your right side is actually the one how you are supposed to sample so you first sample an n3 lymph node followed by an n2 lymph node followed by the n1 lymph node but in case you have a metastatic disease of m1b or a left adrenal gland that should be the first one that you will sample and this data is completely supported by guideline this is an es es uh, esge and the ers guideline which has spoken about how interventional pulmonologists today should not be trained just in ebus but eus b fna as well right so coming to putting it all together how does the algorithm of management of lung cancer looks so this is basically what it is you have a pet scan and a negative n0 lymph node so you subject the patient directly for surgery that's on your left left limb and while doing such a surgery you sample all mediastinal lymph nodes so that's the thoracic surgeon's job but what comes in our domain is when you have an integrated pet scan with a positive n1 or a central tumor more than 3 cm of course you make them go through ebus tbna and then if it's negative surgery if it's positive they go to multimodality treatment if you are positive for n2 n3 depending upon whether it's left or right there's an ap zone which may still require the surgeon to go in and take a sample but increasingly interventional pulmonologists are also getting into that area and then if it's positive you again move into multimodality treatment negative surgery so having given you concepts more concepts and even more concepts i think it's time to move to cases because that's really what shrivatsa wanted me to do i'm not taking you through lots of cases but i think it should be interactive so i'm going to ask you uh, to please interact and be attentive during this so this is basically a 70 year old male smoker with a history of gunshot wounds to the chest and gastroesophageal reflux the patient comes with chest pain and a 27 pound weight loss the ct scan is showing a right hilar mass with stations 11 r and 7 lymph node 
So station seven is N2. Station 11 R for the right-sided Hylar mass would be N1, right? So this is how the CT looked, but interestingly, there was a adrenal gland, which is marked in yellow on your screen, which is probably enlarged. So the left adrenal gland was 1.4 into 2.7. What would you do? What is the first thing that you will sample? Sorry, adrenal gland. So the adrenal was sampled and it came out to be a metastatic small cell carcinoma. And what technique would you use to sample the adrenal? EUS B FNA, not EUS, please don't, don't get confused. EUS is what the gastroenterologists do. What you do is use your scope in the esophagus. So that's called EUS B FNA, the EUS as a bronchoscope and getting a fine needle aspiration sample, right? Let's go to the second case now. Simple, again, 71 year old women, ongoing weight loss, chest mass formally reported negative. The CT has got a left upper lobe mass encasing the left PA. What stage are we talking of? Stage four. So all you require is just a diagnosis. You're not doing a staging. So a staging you must require here, not because it's already the left PA which is infiltrated. The patient has dyspnea on the rest and can't undergo any bus. So what would you do again? Yes, do a USB FNA instead of doing an EBUS. So this is how the CT scan looked. And again, there was an adrenal mass. This came out, only EUSB could be performed. So there was no need to do anything else. Metastatic adenocarcinoma of pulmonary origin, right? Uh, this is a very interesting case. And I'm highlighting that because the past last two cases were also all about adrenals. This is a 60 year old woman with a history of tobacco and illicit drug use who presented with complaints of chest pain and dizziness following a fall. The CT of the head was normal. The CT chest showed a right upper lobe mass with nodal enlargements of station 4R and 11R. The left adrenal gland was measuring 1.4 into 1.2. What's your approach? Anyone? An enlarged left adrenal gland in a patient with a right upper lobe mass. What would you want to sample first? Come on. Adrenal, lymph node, how many for adrenal? Come on, lift up, lift up. How many for adrenal? Yes, very wonderful. How many for lymph nodes? One person for lymph nodes. So this was an adrenocortical adenoma. 4R was also sampled in the same sitting and it came out to be a squamous cell CA. So why I highlighted this case is because there is an adrenal enlargement, but it came out to be an adrenal adenoma. And that is something that is an important driver for you. Just because the adrenals are enlarged, it doesn't always mean that it's malignant. The fourth most common site of metastasis for lung cancer is the adrenal gland. At initial evaluation, you will find adrenal masses in up to 4% of the cases. A benign adrenal adenoma are relatively common and it can happen in 10% of the cases. And that's really why you got an adrenal adenoma in this case. But as part of staging, you would first do the adrenals and then only move to uh, you know, sampling your lymph nodes. At autopsy, found that one third of lung cancer patients were having adrenal masses and it does have implications in lung cancer staging because if it's negative, this patient, I mean, just look, look at it, look at the last case in the face of it. An adrenal gland, which is enlarged in a patient with the right hilar mass. What is our first thought? Stage four, isn't it? Because it's a metastatic disease. If it turned out to be an adrenal adenoma, for all you know, he could be downstaged after giving chemotherapy and can go for a curative intent treatment right? So that's really why it is very important to remember the adrenal gland. And so to end my talk, this is really my only take-home slide. Please remember the four boxes approach, classify your uh, e-buses into these four groups, decide on how you want to go about staging them and stage them well, starting from the opposite side. So that's really about it. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for the patient hearing. This is my email address. If anybody wants the presentation, I'm quite happy to share it. Thank you, Dr. Keda. Uh, wonderful presentation. You went through very systematically. You covered the very basic concept first and then built up on it so that our audience, comprising of mainly postgraduates and newly passed out, they could understand well. One thing I'd just like to add, which most people are missing, just yesterday I received a patient referred for mediastinal sampling and no one had palpated his supraclavicular region. So 
because sometimes in the CT, the neck region is not covered or not reported. So never forget that because that's already an N3 station. So if you have a palpable supraclavicular lymph node, if, if it's uh, feasible for an excision biopsy, directly send it. I mean, it's not the domain of pulmonologist, but never ever miss supraclavicular lymph node examination and all cervical and axillary lymph node examination. So that is one thing what I'd like to add. Yeah, and as yeah. a caveat, before I finish my talk, uh, Srivats are still a good friend. So please don't misunderstand my first few slides. Thank you. Thank you again. Does the audience have any questions? Anyone? Thank you, Dr. Kera, for such an amazing and interactive session. Um, I would also like to thank um, Dr. Uh, for moderating the session. We would like to express our gratitude with a small memento. I would like to kindly invite Dr. Binil Salman, Interventional Pulmonology, MVR Cancer Center and Research Institute, Korikot, Kerala, and Dr. Narathan, just Nirvan Lung Care Hospital, Dindogil, to moderate the next two sessions. I humbly request Dr. Tinku Joseph to come onto the dais to deliver his talk on the topic, Lessons Learned from Experience how to best avoid complications in EBUS and radial EBUS case-based discussions. Thank you, Dr. A very good afternoon, uh, my dear friends. Uh, so I would uh, like to start off my talk with this particular slide. So before that, uh, I would like to ask a question to Srivatsa. What was the reason why you gave me this particular topic? <laughs> Probably, <laughs> yeah. I don't think uh, we should not have changed 
First of all, doing fevers, and thing two is one of them who has a very large number of fevers. He has done it in his practice. I felt that he is the best person to talk about it. Uh, so, Srivatsa uh, has given a uh, good introduction about me and he has raised the alert regarding the number of procedures and all those things. So, anyone from the audience, what, what is this picture? It's a price for this. Uh, correct answer. Srivatsa has already promised um, a good price for the correct answer. <laughs> so, it will be given uh, during the banquet session. Okay. Radio levers. Okay. What has happened over here? She has come outside. No. Dr. Bidil knows the correct answer because he was with me for this procedure. Anyone else? Because uh, Mr. is waiting outside and aesthetically, I have to finish my talk in 20 minutes. Uh, it's not sheep. So, this is a radial probe. What has happened over here? What has happened over here? Anyone who is doing radio? Serious probe. Okay, the radial probe itself is damaged. Okay, so this was my first procedure which I did as an internship for the in 2007. Okay, and the very first procedure itself, I damaged the radial probe. And so we did this procedure, and after the procedure. The sheath was there, the radial labor was within the sheath and after the procedure, the probe and the sheath was handed over to the technician. The technician also was not skilled enough, I was also not skilled enough and uh, the technician thought like just like how we remove a biopsy poster, she put it up. So the mini probe got damaged and I was also confused regarding what exactly has happened. Then I called the Olympus representative. Olympus representative said, Sir, he told me to send the photograph of this. I'm sorry, the complication is coming again and again. So the Olympus representative told uh, uh, to send the photograph and after seeing the photograph, he said uh, that he has not seen such a kind of a, a complication till now. So he said, uh, sir, probably you have damaged uh, uh, the mini probe. So I was an unfortunate guy to damage the mini probe, probably the first person in, the, in the India to do it. And then soon, you must be knowing that uh, if you do something good, nobody is ready to spread it. But if something bad happens, it spreads at a rapid pace. I'm sorry, I'm not able to change the slides. Yeah. So, negative information spread at a rapid pace. For the next three months, I was affected very badly. No patients, it affected my OPD, it affected my procedures. Nobody referred any procedure, uh, patients or procedures to me. And 
I thought my life as an interventional pulmonologist is almost done and dusted. So after four months, luckily one of my another colleague had faith in me and referred one patient for performing a transcranial lung biopsy, which became successful and gradually my career took off from there. So the reason I told you all these things is because a simple complication can at times destroy your career, but if you're courageous enough to overcome that situation, then your career will definitely take off. So success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue that counts. With this, I would like to start my presentation on complications of radial <coughs> rebus, radial rebus, as well as endobronchial uh, esophageal ultrasonography as well. So before I start, uh, greetings from my beautiful state, uh, both popularly known as Rabochur Country, Kerala, as well as our hospital, Amrit Institute of Medical Sciences, based in Kochi. Well, in the next 20 minutes, I will be touching in brief about the following aspects, mostly about the complications associated with the linear and radial fevers, and if by chance, if you mess with these complications, how to get out of it. In terms of uh, complications associated with the EBUS, very few uh, studies have been published. Everyone has published about the yield and uh, uh, the way they did and all those things. But in terms of complications, very, very few uh, reports have been published and mostly most of them are case reports. So this is one of the, the biggest uh, series of uh, EBUS data which was published uh, uh, from Japan in which they included close to 7,000 patients uh, and of EBUS. So among the 7,000 patients in which EBUS was done, the overall complication rate was close to nearly 1.23 percentage. So that means EBUS is a relatively safer procedure. The most notable complications were minor bleed, mediastinitis, pneumothorax, and pneumomediastinum. Among all this, the most notable complication was damaged your EBUS code. So, which consists of around 1.33 percentage. Moving on from the Japanese literature to the European literature, so they had a fairly larger sample size. They included close to 14,000 patients who underwent US plus uh, nearly 2,600 patients who underwent EBUS uh, procedures. And in this particular study also, the overall complication rate was close to 1 percentage. But seven patients uh, died after procedure due to certain serious adverse effects uh, and mostly of infectious origin in this particular uh, European study. Now, moving on from the Japanese literature to European to the Indian study. In Indian study, they included close to patients who underwent uh, EBUS uh, and in this particular study also the overall complication rate was much higher compared to the international uh, literature from one percentage it dropped it, it got, went up to 5.9 percentage but luckily they were fortunate they never mentioned anything about uh, the damage to the scores most of the complications were due to the bleeding and as well as infection but they, they never had any <laughs> Uh, reports of damage to the scope. Now, complications can happen at different steps when you do a linear EBUS or a radial EBUS. So, most of, of you might be knowing that this particular procedure can be performed under conscious sedation as well as under general anesthesia. Most of the centers across India perform this procedure under conscious sedation, often with a, a fentanyl or medicine and uh, so the complications generally happens when this procedure is performed under conscious or it can happen under general anesthesia also. So generally this happens when we sedate the patient beyond a limit. So what happens is that when the patient develops a respiratory depression, you are bound to land in trouble. So now let's see how to tackle this. So generally what we do in our center is that when we do this procedure under conscious sedation, we dedicate a staff nurse to monitor the level of sedation. 
So the staff nurse has got a Ramsey sedation scale. She will store accordingly. And if by chance, if the patient is over sedated or if the patient lands in respiratory depression, we should have the reversal agent for metasolum, flumacinal, and for fentanyl, nanoxone should be ready in your endoscopy suit. Because you never know at what point of time the complication can happen. So when you are doing this procedure under conscious sedation, the reversal agents should be there in place. And there should be preferably a dedicated staff nurse to monitor the level of sedation. Now, moving on from sedation to uh, the next step. So if you're doing this particular procedure, that is linear reverse under conscious sedation, and if you're intubating the patient with the help of uh, uh, the linear reverse itself, you must be knowing the linear reverse has got a forward bend. So when you cross the vocal cords, you should make sure that the scope should be held in neutral position. Otherwise, the tip of the linear probe, linear reverse, can at times poke the vocal cords as well as the subglottic space and cause some amount of trauma. So the linear rebus has to be held in neutral position when you cross the vocal cords. So that is very, very important. And if you are doing this particular procedure with the help of an LMA or an endotracheal tube, at times an LMA per se or else an endotracheal tube can also damage the upper airway structures. Now moving on from the complications associated with sedation and intubation to TPNA associated complications. So in terms of GPN associated complications, the most common one is breakage of the needle or at times the needle can go and poke some vital structures and cause associated complications like pneumomedias, cardiac tamponade, mediastitis and pneumothorax. And at times if there is a lesion adjacent to uh, pulmonary artery and if you want to sample that particular lesion, it puncture through the vessel and reach the lesion. During this step, you are bound to cause a couple of complications. First and foremost, if you are unfortunate, you can rupture the vessel, or else you get bound, you are bound to cause a hematoma also. All these are rare complications, but still it can happen. Hematoma and rupture of the vessel are the notable complications associated with a transpulmonary approach, as well as if you are approaching a malignant lesion, when you puncture the lesion and when you pull back the needle, you can at times cause tumor seeding through the vessel. So these are the complications when you're doing a transpulmonary approach. And again, the most notable complication among the broad list is damage to your fever score. Now I would like to show a couple of uh, cases. Uh, so if you carefully see, you can see a lesion over here, okay, which was sampled. And post procedure, patient developed fever, chills, and rigor, and uh, uh, generalized weakness, and all those things. And patient had a huge uh, cyst developed after procedure. So, this is, this is the case of media stasis after EBUS TBN. How to avoid this? If there is a cystic lesion, preferably avoid touching it. It's always a better practice not to put your needle into the cystic lesion because at times the cyst can rupture. Or else, from the cyst, the infection can attract into the medias and cause the mediastinitis. And if you, if you are in a situation that 100% you have to hit the uh, cystic lesion, then preferably give the prophylactic course of antibiotics after the procedure. Now, this is the case of mediastinal fistula after uh, performing EBUS. And in this particular uh, case report, which was published from Modern Age for the Medical Sciences, uh, the EVAS <coughs> needle was, uh, so if you carefully see, there was a, a, a paratracheal lymph, lymph node was there. And uh, the paratracheal lymph node was sampled using a TBNA needle. And after sampling, patient developed a nodular lesion. This is a nodular lesion, which came after performing the EVAS uh, Procedure. Again, now uh, this particular case is of uh, uh, adrenal lesion was present. The gastroenterologist uh, used the US scope and sampled that, tried to sample the adrenal lesion, and uh, he was again unfortunate uh, to cause esophageal perforation, uh, which had to be repaired surgically. So among the broad list of complications which I mentioned, the most common one is 
the damage to your mucus bone. Now let's see how it happens and how to prevent it. Most often, the damage to the mucus bone happens when you are puncturing a lesion or when you are uh, doing the TPNA procedure. So to prevent this, before inserting the needle, you have to check whether the locking system as well as the needle is functioning properly or not. Now, the damage to the scope can happen during the TBNA procedure as well as if the technician is not handling it carefully. So the storage of the scope as well as handling and dis disinfection process is very, very important because it is not always the bronchoscopist who is damaging the scope. The scope damage can happen at the technician level as well. So you should be very, very careful and teach your technicians regarding how to handle the scope in a better way. So in the beginning, I showed a, a damage to the, the linear probe. Now, anyone from the audience, what has happened over here? Okay. So bite marks of the scope. But at this time, I was lucky. The damage happened from another consultant side. <laughs> and uh, so the patient was uh, sedated for linear ebus procedure. So we thought the patient was adequately sedated and the uh, ebus scope was introduced. We started sampling. Suddenly, the patient woke up from the sleep and started biting the scope. The bite block was there. He was like a uh, well built person. The bite block slipped away and he picked the scope. We tried our level best, we inserted our fingers into the, into the oral cavity and we tried to remove it. And the technician also got an injury on the, uh, uh, the finger, but still we wanted to save our scope. But still the damage was very, very costly and which we had to pay close, close to eight lakhs to repair the scope. So the damage can happen at any point of time, among which the most costliest complication is the damage to the ebus scope, which you should be very, very careful. So if the damage happens, it can damage the optics as well. And uh, uh, now let's see how to prevent this. So if you are doing this procedure under conscious sedation, make sure that there is a bite block should be positioned. And the person who is holding the bite block should be, uh, we should communicate with that person that he or she should not concentrate on anything else. He should purely concentrate on holding that bite block. But I would suggest if a beginner wants to, like after this particular workshop, and if you want to start performing linear reverse, I would say preferably do this procedure under general anesthesia because all these complications won't happen if you're doing this procedure with an LMA or an endotracheal tube. But in a resource limited setting like in our country, where the cost is a major burden, we, most of us tend to perform this procedure under conscious sedation. So there comes the role of the bite block and a dedicated staff nurse to monitor the level of sedation. So while performing the DBNA, at times the needle can perforate through the sheet of the, uh, through the sheet, and it can also damage your hemoscope. So this is a uh, photograph of the DBNA needle perforating through the sheet, and it has damaged the biopsy channel. This is another photograph in which the DPN needle has perforated uh, the ultrasound cable. So in order to avoid this, make sure that the needle is functioning properly prior to performing TPN. At times your balloon, if, you are, if there are so many artifacts uh, when you're performing a PEPAS procedure, in order to reduce the amount of artifacts, we tend to use balloon. So if the balloon is getting overinflated, it can also get ruptured. So it is not a complication since I mentioned a, a broad set of uh, complications. I had to show this image also. In our center also, we have uh, performed uh, close to more than 1,000 uh, procedures, among which uh, uh, the yield was touched to 92 percentage. Uh, scope damage happened once due to bite, and a couple of times we had uh, damaged optics as well. Probably one of the reasons we, I was a training center. Uh, that might be one of the reasons by which uh, a lot of damage has happened. Now, regarding how to uh, avoid scope damage, most important is you should realize that performing, let it be linear reverse or radial reverse, it's a team game. It's not only the interventional pulmonologist, the 
person who is handling the scope also should be adequately trained enough regarding how to transport it, how to store it, how to disinfect it. Otherwise, damage can happen at this point of time also. Prior to performing an EBUS TDNA, check the needle. I was mentioning this particular point right through my presentation because there are n number of cases reported in the recent times, especially uh, from the, the newly developed polypus needle, that the needle <coughs> perforating through the sheath has happened in few of the centers. That's why most often you have to check the sheath and the needle prior to doing a TBNA procedure. And also make sure that the sheath should be well outside the EPA scope. You should be able to sheath the sheath prior to deploying the needle. So this is the EPA scope and this is the ultrasound part. So you should make sure that the sheath should be outside before pushing your needle outside. If the sheath is outside, then it is rarely going to cause any particular complications. Also make sure that when you cross the vocal cords, the scope should be held in neutral position. Once you start scanning process, after that, the next step is to introduce the DBNA needle. Now the scanning process has started. After this, when you introduce the TPN needle, make sure that you take off the thumb from the liver. Otherwise, if you flex the scope and introduce the TPN needle, again you will bound to damage the scope. So the scope should be held in neutral position. Take off the thumb from the liver and introduce the TPN needle to the uh, the liver scope. Check for the check whether the locking system is functioning uh, properly or not. Now, start the scanning process. Once you have scanned all the stations, come back to the carina, introduce your EBUS needle to the EBUS <coughs> Sorry, again, one more complication. My video is also getting stuck. Okay, so now moving on from the uh, linear reverse to radial reverse introduced complications. So again, the, the type of complications is almost the same as of linear reverse. Uh, uh, very few uh, studies have been published about uh, the complications of linear reverse. Uh, so this is one of the biggest uh, meta analysis which is published uh, by a couple of Australian authors. Uh, which included 16 studies with a sample size of 1,090 and the complication rate was 0 to 7.4 percentage and the most common complication in this particular study also was pneumothorax. They never mentioned about uh, damage to the radial probe uh, and uh, there's a couple of cases in which uh, uh, radial reverse was attempted. You carefully see there was a lesion over here which was sampled up under fluoroscopic guidance and after procedure Patient developed. What is what are you seeing over here? Human facts. Another case uh, uh, of the right uh, upper lobe uh, lesion, a cavitating lesion. Red papers is showing a nice concentric image. Uh, then uh, under fluoroscopic guidance with the help of a uh, uh, forceps, it was sampled and post procedure. Patient developed. What has happened over here? Now, uh, moving on from that Australian study to the Japanese literature. So, the Japanese people were like they had compared to the, the Australian study, 
they mentioned something relevant in this one. And I was so happy to see this. The difference is that there were four other people who damaged the radial probe, just like me. So apart from the pneumothorax and all those things, uh, there were four cases of uh, damage to the radial probe in this particular literature, which was published from JAP. So to conclude my talk, uh, uh, let it be uh, linear reverse, it is much more than hitting a lymph node. Complications, even though I mentioned a broad list of complications, it is extremely, extremely rare. And uh, if there is a cystic lesion, you should always remember that, try not to sample it. If you want to sample it, preferably give your patient a prophylactic course of antibiotics. Among the list of complications, the most significant and the most serious and the costliest complication is damage to your ebuscope. And in order to avoid this, apart from the interventional pulmonologists, your team should be very well trained, especially the technicians, regarding how to handle the scope, how to disinfect it, how to store it. It's not a single time session. Make sure that at least every six months, you have to continue this training process so that only then the information will be fit in their brain. So again, it's a teamwork and it's in order to improve the yield of after performing an EPA procedure, it's not only when you sample the node, the trained pathologist is very, very important. The nursing staff should be uh, adequately trained. And after performing, let it be linear EPA or radial EPA, make sure that the cases has to be discussed in your multidisciplinary board, which includes a pathologist, a radiologist, uh, as well as a rheumatologist if you're uh, dealing with the ILD. Or it's an oncologist and a radio, radiation oncologist should be involved. So, in the next, in the past 20 minutes, my overall motto was not to scare any one of you by uh, showing all these complications. Let it be linear reverse or radial reverse. It's a relatively safe procedure. That's one of the reasons why I'm standing over here after damaging the scope because I performed close to like 700, 700 cases after that damage happened. So. The reason is it's a relatively safer procedure. So keep calm and let it be linear EPUS or EUS or EUSP or radial EPUS. All of the four procedures are extremely, extremely safe ones. And I don't think none of these procedures can be categorized as a high end intervention because any person who is doing proposcopy, <coughs> if you can assist and then perform another 20 EPUS procedures, you can do it with 100% confidence level. So I would like to conclude my talk with this particular quote that every setback, let it be life, career, or a procedure, is a setup for a comeback. Thank you. Dr. Tinker Joseph, this is an amazing session. Any questions for Dr. Tinker? Thank you. I would like to humbly invite Dr. Sidhar Kumar to introduce the next speaker. Yeah, I think uh, it's in my privilege, privilege to welcome Dr. Ravita Mehta. He's a teacher and a mentor for me, who's an inspiration for me to come to this level, I think. And uh, in spite of his busy schedules, you're able to spare time actually to attend this particular next trip talk. Actually. Thank you, sir. Good to you, sir. Okay. 
they stood it up and everybody could see the speakers pause and then he's waiting for technology to kick in. And uh, you probably don't get you know ventricular tachycardia or the intervention suite as much as you get when you're waiting for a presentation to pop up. So anyway, thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Sunil and Dr. Shivas and the Astro team. And so many of them are so familiar to me. We've all grown up together in this city. And, uh, and apologies to all of you whose lunch has been delayed in this exercise of learning, and we hope to make it your time. Sunil has given me a talk which I both uh, uh, in my mind wondered why. Uh, I tend to curse because I have the liberty to do that. You worked with us and then got onto the task at hand. So the trainee sitting behind and said, I, I need to know what people are saying about how to do it. Why all this stuff? Who cares? What's what history and so on? So let's try and see if it's interesting for you all because I think that in the path to travel is the future uh, ca capture or capsulate. So with that phrase, we will go through the history of mediastinal lymph node sampling, KBUS, and don't worry, you guys are students of medicine, I'm not going to inundate you, don't forget, I have 20 minutes, and I'm used to respecting my time. At the time, we'll go to the need for EBUS, very important, because as you do your journey from bronchology, from pulmonology to bronchology and bronchology to procedural bronchology, and then take on a fancy word intervention so attractive to put on your card in Facebook, you have to basically pick up the responsibility gap. Yeah, we go to the transition of CT, FC, conventional TV, and it will give us, and then all this stuff we we'll cover very quickly. And the training, if you <coughs> sit in your shoes, and you get a peek into the crystal ball. <coughs> what happened? What are, where are we now? And if time, where are we headed also? But let's see if time permits that. So let's see the basics. Why do this TV and it all? Why even think about it? Ikeda came out with the flexible bronchoscope. That was ecstasy enough. Let's be happy there. Let's stop there. Why should we go ahead? Well, the media still lymph node basically was slowly crouching up, and that's how the whole thing came up. But this media still lymph node, as an epitome of pathology, is important to patient care. And that is why we can get into the lymph node. So now we are going into the minds of, of investigators such as Pope and Wang and the like. What was going on in their mind and what was there, which is important to us. So at that time, not much was there. And you know, the, everything was either surgical, there was no match, it was either thoracic to me. CT scan was also not there or not. And so that was the basis of a right mind envisaging taking a needle beyond the bronchial tree to sample this mediastinal lymph node, and they called it conventional TBA. Actually, I don't know how the word conventional is now, because TBA. Conventional came and there was plan B data. <coughs> So it was just TBNA. So in that, somebody had decided that this right paratracheal node or station 4R or this subcarinal node can be sampled. And so this was a landmark thing. And I've just tried to show you the landmark, sorry for the small print over here, where basically initially somebody tried to do the TBNA through a rigid scope. Uh, one of our colleagues tried it recently also. And then somewhere close to 78 Cope and Wang uh, envisage from Hopkins that this is possible. So very interesting to see what was going on in the mind and how fortunate we are to see the general, the, the next level, the color, the next level technology coming. So roadmap for TBNA, which made it both interesting at that time, at the same time, as history would tell you, every technology has a limit and it goes down and gives way to the next one. As you hold your Android phone, your iPhone, the next the high generations are planned. They're just releasing them one by one, but medicine was too slow. So you can see the gap was around 20 years. We'll come and go into all that. So when we did TBNA, they spent years, every meeting with Sunil Shivats, I or Tinku must have attended. We went to the meeting, trying to learn desperately to use the 1921, 19 within the 21 and so on. But it did not really pick up because it was an extrapolation required brilliance, smartness, putting two plus two together. And we all became pulmonologists because we did not want to do procedures if you go back uh, on the clock three years ago or five years ago. So this is why I did not pick up. I can't put all this together. The node size, the technique, how to take it, and Atul Mehta students only for them to flip the CT scan and imagine it and take all that knowledge and go to the bedside. They hold a bronchoscope with dexterity, cross a coughing patient, reach that area, use the right needle, find it there, take the smears out, hope to God there's something there, stay in it, get a pathologist and they'll give you an answer. You might as well put a rocket on the moon. It just did not take off, basically. And, you know, so that was a problem. And then needles made it a problem. Companies are blessings and also are problems for us as they try to give their technology and they expect us to figure out iPhone, Android and so on. 
and the pathologist, God forbid, the fall person sitting in a dark room, I don't see anything, finish. <laughs> Curse them, you know, sit in the evening on your party and say this is useless. Bottom line, in a funny way, this just did not take off. So it never, globally it was okay, reasonable, and my international colleagues are sitting as we speak. India, just forget about it. It hardly ever took off. See the publications this year, PGI Chandigarh, and they will publish, right? That's what they do, and they do it in one paper. And then Sunil, when he worked with us also, all of us worked really hard. We did our 600, it took us a year to get this paper accepted in the Journal of Broncology. Two papers of significance in a country of 1.2 billion. So this was the state of convention TVNA. And then comes the fact that there is a chump. The chump is actually not a chump, it's a crawl. 1980 to 2004, it takes to develop a prototype of something which can make you see the media still in So it's a long chump for those of you who still remember your, your sporting days. And it was a major challenge. And who are the people who pushed it? Open Wang, Yasufuku. Yasufuku was a surgeon, by the way. So those of you who think that we could not become surgeons, the surgeons became pulmonologists also. Atul Mehta, I think, is not unknown to everybody. Felix Sert and Heinrich Becker. Between them, you have the genesis of whatever was done. I may have forgotten the name or two, but these were the original guys who built the prototype with Olympus. So now with this background, what does Ebus add? Well, Ebus, I think this your your previous uh, guys have told you well. It basically takes technology to smaller areas. So you talk three, four, five, Shivan was talking in ten smaller nodes. This is the most interesting part. No need to be Helen Killer. No eyes closed feeling out there. You can see the link. So the main thing came down to in this room, if I did a convention TV and a talk, I would have 20, 25 people. The reason there's so many people as there is online lockdown is because it's possible, it's easier, it's for lack of better word, with respect to you all and disrespect to me, period proof. You just cannot make a mistake if you see the link node. And they've made many, many small things. The doctor will tell you where it is. The needle which locked everywhere. Dexterity, brain, skill, effort, overall the package was made much easier. 24 years it took quite basically. And so it became uh, uh, interesting. And then comes what happened. And this is well on this statement, ladies and gentlemen. Company gives you X. The, the original uh, inventor gives you X plus one. Doctors and all of you sitting in this room are proof of it. We take it to 5x. And that is the whole thing. How the science has exploded with what has happened. And so this particular aspect comes. Uh, the slides are not showing. It's showing. Okay. Uh, no problem. I can talk anyway. So the, it became, this, this editorial came in 2013. 2004 was the old one. And the editorial says, keep us the game changer. And it says, if I can read out, no other innovation since the introduction of flexible bronchoscopy has generated so much interest. Because that's the way it's been. As Tinku tried to point out, it's the realm of the regular <laughs> It's not that Ravi Mehta will have his ego spurt and because he loves to say it, with say only I can do it and teach you enough but not enough. It, that's not the way it should be. It doesn't work that way. So this was a very interesting thing. And then when did it come to India? 2004, we showed Hendrik Becker. Dr. Bhattaviram is a very good friend and he used to talk to him and say, why in God's name are you doing this? One crore he spent on the first three bus and he got it through all the difficulties. It was a little like Christopher Columbus coming to, you know, uh, the, the, the United States. So he got the first one. First the government installation happened in 2011. Karnataka, we got the first one. Maybe Sunil quoted us a lot over there. And uh, we finished actually recent numbers, 2,200 plus now. That is a, it's a 2,200 of a tiny center in Bangalore, a relatively second level city for healthcare in the country. That was the level of work which was pending. And if you believe me to correct work and, and do the right patients, that was the only thing. Tremendous increase, 250 episcopes have been sold by now. America, I think, is hitting 800, 900 or so. Approximately 15,000 episcopes. And I will confess here, this is based on needles sold. Now, Sunil and Tinku and I will grudgingly admit we reuse our needles. <laughs> that means if you do a factor of 2 or 2.5 is to 1, you're looking at 30,000 potential EBUSs. If you count punctures around 10, you can do the math. I lose my mathematics and that's why I'm not a good guy for your salary. But this is the number of punctures done in this country. So you can see the explosion which has happened over there. Simultaneously, unfortunately, the conventional guard was falling down. Flagged and pushed up my most famous, famous namesake, Atul Mehta and I would friend also try to prop it up. But we, it just cannot last beyond the time. The automatic car is there. The stick shift will ultimately get phased out as we speak. 
reason I told de-skilling, and you have to admit it. When you de-skill something, you will get a broad uptake and more acceptance. That was how life is all about. And so, and of course, in training and so on, which is increasing by leaps and bounds, and we have many entrepreneurs who have gone abroad. I can't, you know, if it doesn't happen in my country, I outsource myself to some other country, get the science back, and so on. Now, let's go to the next part of it. Uh, original education for EBUS and ramifications in India. This is not a talk on only how EBUS uh, came to India or what we've done. It's about learning aspects of that. And secondly, what was the application in India? If they gave us EBUS for an apple, did we use it for an apple or did we use it for something like chat fruit, which is on the way as I was driving over here, or, or a lovely fruit uh, such as coconut, which is there, which you will not get in America. So if they gave us that, what are we using it for? Well, it came for lung cancer. And I will pause over here. It came for lung cancer. But in Indian data, most of our lung cancers, and this is come our data, and I will show you other people's data also, 97% are more than 3 weeks. So there is no staging, which is of significance when you hire EBS code. It is sold for staging, but hardly any application. What did we learn? We learned the science, ladies and gentlemen. You guys who are giving ATT forever, single biggest contribution of EBS to the Indian landscape, less empirical therapy. Single most contribution. And that defines the science. It's not about the instrument. In fact, I use Lance Armstrong's word. It's about the application of the instrument for good patient care. So we stopped being empiric, brilliant doctors. We started being focused, target-oriented, practice-oriented, result-oriented, accurate pulmonologists. And that was a big game changer. So we learned what to do. Secondly, we converted a lot of those so-called tuberculosis to cancer, and at least tried to help them. Don't forget that cancer therapy is not that everyone dies on the first stage, which was the original thing. The original thing was, why do we even treat everything with tuber for tuberculosis? If it doesn't respond, it is cancer, but they're going to die anyway, so it doesn't matter. So let me write my TV description. In that one statement, I smile at the same time, part of it cries, because that is the way things were going on for a while. Then we learned how to define benign diagnosis, and quietly TV was creeping up and saying, I need more molecular diagnostics and so on. And then the smaller locations, things we never did, even though we published 600 plus cases, we never went for a tiny node, 11 hours superior, 11 hours inferior, this year, it was not possible to do it in conventional DBN. So he was sorted out a lot of those things. And this is a PGI paper our colleagues put out there and they showed that in their thousand plus patients who had EBUS, they showed that most of them are sarcoid or TB. Metastatic malignancy was 21% and 80, 73% was that. So let's face it. You give us a tool, but we will use it for the right reasons in our setup, which is so important. And we are not trivial, 1.2 billion, rising higher, highest GDP, now you know, scoring a lot on the economic scale, so why not on the medical scale? Then it grew in India. The story gets further. A blossoming media still lymph node landscape, I call it. What were those lymph nodes hiding in our patients? These guys have been our partners. Today morning, I had an oncology talk, and he was speaking to us. They are going rip roaring. The day you and I mastered EGFR, ALK, now they're talking only targeted. KROS, KERAS, ROS, so many of them are coming in now. Now the thing is now next generation sequencing, foundation one. Who's responsible to give tissue? Guys, those liquid biopsies do nothing. It's ultimately tissue, tissue, and tissue. Who does all that? Us. If we work with them, so they came, these guys came with the CT scan and the PET scan. They asked us, can you sample? They told us which ones are, are incriminatory with the pet. These guys wanted tissue. Patients wanted to live lung cancer on the rise. Metastatic cancer was on the rise. Largest money in the world goes into oncology. These guys have been our partners. To, from then to now, because of them, we have the patients who need service. A lovely partnership built up unknown to everybody. Else. This was quietly happening in the background. So the roadmap and the expanded indication, and you know these things, I think I'm sure there's enough and more talks to discuss all these things. So finally, we rode the wave of need for precise therapy and our grand entry to minimally invasive, accurate diagnosis as responsible practitioners. That, I think, is a game changer, which this has been. We punctured, we all punctured. So as you can imagine, some obnoxious number I gave you 30,000 times, right? So 300,000 punctures. And then the country published, Prashant, a good colleague, Originally, we were part of the prototype in Chiba. He came to India and started his work. Dheeraj Gupta from PGI, a really lovely paper in, in 
just in 2014, the Tasha Goodfriend from PGI, Karan from Ames, all everybody published and we started collaboration. So this is how we got the name on the international landscape. We did not stop there. Remember, I mentioned they made it for X. In, we took it to 5X as a, as a global community and in our country also because it's an established line. So we still, I'm sure, has taken a lovely talk. All this he must have covered in some measure or the other. And we published, we went into transpulmonary with all its worth. Yes, Sunil is a co author with us when we look at that data collaboratively. We put forceps into that, which is also a talk I'm sure over here. So all this data was coming out. This is EBUS generation two, level two, where you are using the instrument above and beyond was envisaged for what it was made for. And this is Hari, I think, you know, Hari was supposed to be here, I think, today. He's also done some work published in Cryo, which is also picking up a Cryo media still for biopsy for the non-successful original puncture. Then we said, why stop here? It went into the esophagus. So it around five to seven years when they said EUS, EUS, EUS. We said EUSB, EVASCOP is the esophagus, grudgingly accepted for a limited role, but invaluable in the right issue. And there's a, that's a whole talk by itself. But EUSB, which has been done, and this center does it as well as I'm sure we all do it. And multiple papers. This is again our AIMS colleagues, and this is us when we did it in a pediatric patient and the children <coughs> part of it. We worked with our colleagues, I think, of Shikanta's part of this ecosystem who worked with us. All of us did this work. Indeed, a, an experience because above and beyond the literature, patient need was there. It had to be met. How do we do it responsibly? And nothing is described out there or minimally described out there. So this was the lovely part. What was not so lovely was technology and patient factors. Technology is, guys, you're sitting for this close to hands off to you. You've got to basically go back to the books. Ultrasound, scope, console, buttons, knobology, all those fancy terms came in which have been discussed. Think very exhaustively from the core of his right ventricle described image and repair. Everyone goes to repair. The one thing you don't hear is there's a leak and then there's only one person potentially happy and that is the company as a repair of large magnitude comes in. So it's a definite issue as we try to deal with all of those things. That makes your task more complex. Each one of you, that's why as an innovator and entrepreneur, if you put a program, do it safely, and then try to do a teaching program also. Patience, it's not easy. Most bronchoscopy used to be in and out in five, 10 minutes. Tuck, tuck, lavage, finish, transplant, kill out. Sit, five, 10 minutes are gone. Do a staging us with four passes, with four lymph nodes, and three per station, then do a lavage, then do a transplant biopsy, deal with the desaturating fellow. They're not pleasant guys. He may have COPD. Slow down. They'll get into a learning curve by and large. Costs are higher. All technology comes with cost. We have to factor that into the algorithm of care. That if I do this, what is the cost? Don't forget, it's not only your cost and bye-bye. I finish disaster and back over there. Cost, diagnosis, malignancy cost coming back to you. The partners in their journey. So that has to be factored in very Indian models exist for all that. And then, of course, operator. By and large, if you take pride in what you do, you've got to give a positive result. That's it. So if you can't match that 90% number, case selection technique, you have to do about internal review or get Sunil or Tikku to be part of the auditors to try and tell you what to do. Economic issues, the same thing I touched on. It's an expensive scope, cost is coming down, repairs, blah, blah, blah. And I done this math that time, 500 procedures to break even. That was a churn in my mind and thrown to my hospital as no administrator saw it because you had to make a case that it would never hit our country. The 247 is a big number. And other things are much simpler, easier to just buy a therapeutic you know, bronchoscope and a thoracoscope, and even a regioscope is cheaper than compared to this technology. So great technology, highly priced, put on your head, but a game changer. Not a lovely combination, but this is the story of the last 14 years. To summarize the talk in the time, couple of minutes we have, the path traveled 18 years overall in 14 years in India. It is a prototype of the jump from empiric medicine to targeted medicine makes you feel like, for lack of better words, the, the actual provider and not an empiric, empirical uh, practitioner. To describe the journey of visualized technology development, high time that was the jump from blind or conventional to EBUS. As we said, CTV never picked up because these glitch phases that there was the eye cannot see, the mind will not accept or implement. EBUS became the prototype of what everybody should do, as my good colleague just said. It raised the bar for proof and, and evidence-based medicine. And next-gen EBUS has been both our, 
our, our uh, sweat and our pride as we transgress the boundaries in this country with what we showed you with this talk and the publications and the work done. So uh, to summarize the, the negative part, cost, time consumption, equipment, fragility, RSTC issues, difficult to justify reactive tests. One of the most difficult things what we were saying was an MDD and training. These are the negatives when you try to look at it. My prerogative, what I get to say because I'm taking a talk, a game changer. We made enough of a case for it and it's corroborated by most people. I see lovely nodding heads also. Initial resistance, this part the only we can describe. How it was so difficult. Who's going to spend money? Why do it? Why not give entity those stories? The naysayers, the ones who wear you down, part of our community. And they say they walk among us. It's a famous phrase. But you've crossed it. It is accepted as a place for grudging acceptance and ultimately when patients and oncology and all those things made a difference, it was admiration and then we've all been sailing smoothly and you'll benefit from the work done. It opened the world of the media still in a way never beyond. 2010 when Patabi was talking to me, I said, why Patabi? It's too much money. 2012 we started. 2014 I said, apologies. You're right. This needs to get into our spectrum. So the quadrangle of provider, patient, science, and equipment is important. Just to remember and put into a capsulated summary, learning curve, patient-centric, I told you about the journey, fragile equipment as discussed, maturity, don't go for every reactive lymph node. Think about it and get learn from either the mistakes or, or the experiences we have, because you can't stand in front of a patient if you have a negative report, unless you've done your entire duty, then you're fine. And on a very exciting front, push the science. We've done it. Now time to hand over to Jen next to the keep saying. And that's why it's so important. Give us March, to use a lovely phrase we grew up with when we were uh, learning English, is many very the Vesi. I came, I saw, I conquered. That's a Julius Caesar story. A boost in high-end diagnostics like never before. And you can see the staff is convention TBNA and Julius Caesar shifted to the EVA scope as a prototype of what can actually make a difference. Thank you very much for the close attention. And thank you for coming. Any questions? So this is permission to show an upcoming course, so little and she was have organized this lovely course. We're following a month later, putting Bangalore and Karnataka as on the Map. It's a course on persistent air leak and massive democracy. Two tough topics. And so it's coming up in a month. So those of you interested, we'll be very happy to host you and have you there. As usual, the workshops will have limited, but others will be more. And so uh, this is something we just like to put up. Thank you so much. That was an excellent talk. It's like a 20 minutes of pure experience. <laughs> Thanks and next to see. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Melda, for such an amazing session. Um, I request Dr. Sunil to present the moment to Dr. Dr. My heartiest gratitude to Dr. Bilal and Dr. Narathan for moderating the last few sessions. I request Dr. Sunil to present the to Dr. Bilal and Dr. Narathan as well. So that was some serious learning for me. I'm hoping you all enjoyed it as much as I did. Let us take a break and fill our bellies with some delicious food and return back sharp, say, in an hour. Bon appetit. Then the, uh, the, there are some, some of our staff who are just standing outside to guide you through the uh, lunch place. So finish your lunch fast and get back soon because we have the next part of EBUS, this radial EBUS that's coming up. And we have a lot of faculty that's still waiting.
to give you these exciting talks. So Arvind, Shizang and all are going to make you walk through the maze of airways. Okay, so it's going to be more exciting after lunch. So be back soon.
Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back. I hope you had a wonderful meal. First, um, I would like to invite Dr. Shivlinga Swami, consultant pulmonologist, Trustwell Hospitals, Bangalore, and Dr. Hirenapa, consultant pulmonologist, Manipal Hospital, Bangalore, to moderate the next two sessions. Thank you. <clears throat> next, I would like to invite Dr. Shizang to deliver his talk on the topic Navigating the maze, airway anatomy, and how to drive to the target, what they don't teach you in school. I also request Dr. Shivatsa to give a brief introduction on Dr. Shizang. So, uh, I think all of you already know Dr. Shizang sitting here in the front row. He needs no introduction. He's already a celebrity, right? And uh, so, we call him the maze runner. So, the topic is apt here because uh, there's no better person to deal with airway anatomy than Shizang. And so Dr. Shizang, he's a consultant pulmonologist with Sarawak General Hospital, Kuching, Malaysia. Uh, he was the recipient of the prestigious ERS Clinical Training Fellowship and underwent training at, uh, at Royal Brompton Hospital on interstitial lung disease. Uh, Dr. Koh's research interest lies in uh, interstitial lung disease, IP, plural diseases, and his uh, research works have been published in various peer-reviewed international as well as local. I invite Dr. Ko to give us an uh, idea about how to, uh, you know, uh, go through finding our way through the maze. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Dr. Vatsa, for the uh, kind introduction. Um, I'm uh, Ko. Ko is my last name, actually. My first name is Shang. So... Yeah, it's my first time in India. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation. Um, I love this country. Um, you know, the, the, the first day we have arrived. So, all right. So, um, I'll give a task to talk about manual bronchial branch treating technique. I think this is, uh, I would not say we are the best person to talk about it because we are not the one who pioneered this uh, uh, technique. But again, over the years, this is how we have dealing with our peripheral nodules. And uh, I'm just here to sharing, to share our experience with everyone here. So background, uh, we are located in Malaysia, um, more specifically on the island of Borneo, uh, East Malaysia, so General Hospital. So this is the area view of my hospital. It's a tertiary referral hospital around 1,000 bedded, um, located in the beautiful city of Kuching. Uh, I think some of you might have uh, visited us before. Uh, it's a very quiet and quaint town, uh, town. So do visit us you know, if you somehow happen to be in Malaysia. So I think if we talk about this talk, the first person to acknowledge is Prof Kurimoto. He's the one who pioneered this you know, uh, technique. And uh, the first book was uh, published in Japanese, uh, which we having some hard time to crack the code to try to understand what is actually you know, he's trying to say. And uh, fortunately, the book is now uh, translated to English version. But again, I think if you have the book with you, you will find it quite difficult to read because uh, you, you might go mad reading at all, all those things. All right, just briefly, my outline of the talk, I'll, I'll talk about the guided bronchoscopy for, for pulmonary lesion, uh, a brief introduction to the technique, and then I'll show you some case, uh, the case that we have done in real life with different bronchoscope. I think that's more practical. And then, of course, we'll share some of our experience. So to me, guided bronchoscopy for PPL, it's like delivering a parcel to someone. So first, you need to know who is the person that you want to deliver the, 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 you know, the parcel to. So how is the target line? How, how, is there any bronchus sign? Is, do, you, do you really need to biopsy it and things like that? I think first one, we really need to analyze that properly. Ask a lot of oncological questions uh, and then you know, do whatever you can uh, uh, you know, non-invasively before you proceed to biopsy. And next, you need to choose your steering device. Okay, you know you, you must know how to drive there. Either you, you have an ultra thin scope, you have a robotic, you only have a you know whatever scope you have, you have to understand your scope because I'll show you with different scope, you know, you can actually reach your target confidently. So after that, you need to have a roadmap. You need to you need a GPS to tell you how to go, especially if you you know first time to Bangalore, you ask me to deliver something to someone, it's impossible for me to go. So I need a roadmap. So you can have virtual brown, you have an ENB. Or, not, or manually, you use the your bunker, uh, your bunker man shooting technique. So once the roadmap brings your steering device there, you need to verify. Okay, you need to be sure you are there. So I think it's a very important verification technique. 
So you must make sure that, hey guys, show me your ID. Are you the guy? I'm going to de deliver the parcel and things like that. So we have a lot of verification technique. Radio eBus is one of it. Uh, convenience CT, lung vision, body vision, whatever is coming up. So I think radio eBus is a very good verification technique to verify your navigation. So what is bronchial branch reading technique? So if you read that the Japanese work here, it literally translates directly into how to translate CT images into bronchoscopic images. So by looking at CT, we'll draw a map out which will guide us to the lesion and you know how to navigate through the small airway like you know, like what a, a ninja would do, that's what we always say. So I think I'll just spend some time showing this CT scan, which I have labeled all the important segmental airway from RB1 to LB10. I think this forms the basis of whatever uh, navigation you are going to do after that. So uh, due to time constraint, I cannot tell you what is what, you know, you can just look at this video and then try to identify the, uh, the starting point, like, like you're going to the airport, you must go to the correct airport first. If not, if not you would just fly to a wrong country. All right. So the, the basic concept of bronchial branch reading technique, I think the first fundamental concept is that all the CT that we have, we are actually viewing the CT from inferior aspect. Okay. But when we are doing bronchoscopy, we are looking the airway from the superior aspect. So this is the a fundamental concept. So how to make the CT to look like our bronchoscopic image? So basically, we just do a vertical flip. So it will have a mirror image. So now you are looking the CT from the patient's head. OK, uh, please excuse me if I cannot explain in detail because of the time constraint. So this is how we flip the CT and, uh, and rotate the CT. So the first column here is the from the Korean motor, Prof. Korean motor book. Um, majority of, her, of his description is in Excel CT. So in right upper lock, we will turn counterclockwise, right middle lock, uh, flip vertical axis and things like that. And uh, over the years, we have found that, you know, certain uh, reconstruction, certain plan actually better. So I wish I will show you later. So uh, these are the, uh, you know, our methods of flipping rotation. Uh, I'll show you in, the, in, in, in a while. So if you are doing, I mean, you, you have the experience of doing bronchoscope, you know, when you are engaging a right upper lobe, you put your scope down. You do when you just start now. I'm actually we are we actually viewing. If you do a box and you flex the scope back here. You are actually viewing the again back from period which is the original right up a lot right up a lot we do not need to see of the airway we flip the city if Uh, you know, just for documentation purpose, I don't think it's very important during the actual procedure itself. So the priority was given to if there's a branch superior to inferior branch, that branch will be nymphous, followed by a posterior to anterior branch and followed by a lateral to medial branch. So you look at RB1, 2, 3. RB1 is a pica branching, so that you get one. Then posterior get two, anterior get three. So in this priority. And every subsequent generation, it will be named A, B, Y, one, two, alpha, beta, X, Y, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't matter. Okay. It's just a nomenclature. So I think in the actual examination, you know, we will not say, okay, you go to alpha, you go to beta. It's impossible. We will just use simple terms like you go up, down, left, right, you know, things like that, which I will show you. Okay. This is also uh, written in Prof. Green Auto books. I don't think they, they say, okay, you have to go to beta, go to alpha, go to gamma. I think it's ridiculous. All right. So we go to the cases. So the first one, I'll show you the case, how we do with a therapeutic bronchoscope, which most of you will have. Uh, it's a six millimeter scope, 2.8 channel. Um, usually we use it with guide shift and bidirectional guiding device. So this is a case of RB4 nodule, 70 years old gentleman, extronic smoker with knee histology, simple. All right. So you can see the axial and the coronal plan. So for right middle lobe, I do a flip because you know, it's viewing angle is going down. So when I, when I do a vertical flip, now you have the orientation, like how you do bronchoscope, up there superior, inferior, medial, lateral. Okay, just follow me. 
So I'll show you this CT scan. So this is a one millimeter coronal recon, flip horizontally. I just focus on the right middle lobe, all right? So this uh, is split to B5, B4. So we follow the B4, it's split to two, A, B, and then there's a lateral branch out and go into the tumor. If you follow 4B down there, it also goes in. So this is a very straightforward case. You know there's two airway going in this lesion. There's two bronchial signs. It's quite easy to do. So when you do a bronchoscope, you see this is the airway. And how, how does this airway compare to the, the map that we draw just now? So we did this case on under conscious sedation, transnational, transnational route with a therapeutic scope. You know, it's very easy to identify. This is the B4. And then the, 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 the segment level X is the, the, you know, the, ta the target that you need to go. But of course, with the big scope, you cannot go in further. But as you know, you know, inside in the, in the uh, you know, 4 air, there's only two bifurcation here. You just need to aim your tools you know, to the more lateral one then you will probably get in. So when you put it there, you get a concentric image, just biopsy, biopsy, biopsy a few times and you know, that's it and you come out. So this I did not see it. So in lesions that, you know, you know, like this kind of case, when your, your scope can only park here, but you know there's two airway up here, one going up and one going down. And then if you park your therapeutic scope here, you put any forcep in, it will just follow the green line because that's the natural direction of your, you know, your scope. So we can use bidirectional guiding device to actually bend the guide shift down to enter the lesion. Similarly, in this case, we want to get into the red line, but your faucet will keep going to the green line. So we can just put in the uh, bidirectional guiding device. We guide our guide shift in. So from nothing, you, you can actually enter the lesion. So for you to biopsy. So this is how we do with the uh, therapeutic bronchoscope. So we always, not always, I mean, sometimes we use the, the, uh, the uh, the guiding device to help us engage the guide shift in. So this is a, a case done with diagnostic bronchoscope. Uh, it's either P190 or H1, H190 with a two millimeter channel. So this is a 78 years old gentleman, ex-smoker. Uh, somehow, you know, the, the CT found an RV at SPN there. Uh, they decided to observe the lesion, but somehow it grows over three months. SUV is 1.86, it's not so high. So you look hard, it's always the mission, okay, it's there. So initially I was thought I quite ambitious to go in for this case, you know, but said, why, why not we try because it might be an airway. So this is low lobe vision, right lower lobe. So we're using an Excel scan. We do a horizontal flip. So this is the lower lobe. You can see it's split to RB7, RB10, 9. Then RB8, it, it come out a lot of horizontal branching, which we're not too sure what is going on. So we don't plan on this, this recon. So to understand the airway, I think, you know, your right, right low, low, in this case, it runs to nine, 10 and eight. So when you're doing an Excel CT scan on, on the RB9 and 10, you actually have a perpendicular cut to B9 and 10, which you can actually see the airway, you know, two holes like that, very easy for you to plan. But when you are at, at Excel CT scan, you, you, you get a lot of horizontal branching, which is almost impossible to plan for more amateur people like us. So, you know, you know that's a media to lateral branch. So in this case, we would do a sagittal CT so that, you know, when you do the CT cutting like that, you would get the RB at into two circles. So and you are viewing the, the airway from its ostium. So always try to reconstruct the CT to provide a perpendicular cut to the branching airways. So we go back to the initial planning. So my cursor is pointing at RB8. So now we follow RB8. It branched like this, so two. So the lower one, again, another two. And then the upper one, we follow, we follow, we follow. It branched two again. And then the higher one will go, will go into the lesion maybe. Yep, yep. So it didn't go into the lesion. So it's there at the side of the lesion. So you know that this, when you put your EBUS in, it will be an adjacent image. You will not be able to get into the node view. All right. So this is the actual scope view. So how does it compare to my drawing? Uh, so, you know, when you do the scope, you need to turn your drawing sometimes. Uh, you ask your assistant to turn it for you because you might get confused. So I label for you this 7 and 9, 10. You can see the, the branching carina, you know, you just try to match two together. And then, uh, so this anterior, medial, lateral, posterior, that's the orientation, I think quite important. So I have a habit when I go to lower lot, I, I tend to turn my scope further. So again, I label for you, I turn the image as well. So we are, we are trying to engage into RB8. So this RB8, when I flip the whole thing, uh, you know, 180 degree. So posterior is what I show on the arrow. 
And then this is my target, all right? So I know that's the lesion, that's the target that I need to engage in. And uh, I probably will get my, my, my target. So when I put in, as expected, we get an adjacent orientated radial EBUS lesion. We are using a small uh, radial EBUS probe. And then we will look at this CT image and this radial EBUS image, it really fit very nicely. You can see that vessels. Uh, so it's really, you know, we are quite confident that we are next to the lesion. So if you look at this uh, uh, scope, uh, this illustration is adjacent orientated lesion. So we usually will put in our cryobiopsy. So, you know, you know, for that, we're not, we're not catch it. So we put in a 1.7 cryoprobe with a balloon and then it's, it's granular matters inflammation and the bronchial epithelium only use a uh, uh, respiratory epithelium. So the teaching point is that cryobiopsy actually provide a 360 degree biopsy. So it potentially more superior than just oriented lesion. So I think it, it's quite nicely demonstrated in this case that, you know, with that method of planning, we can actually reach it with confidence and biopsy with confidence. So now we, we, we start to use ultra thin bronchoscope. Uh, it's very nice to use. It's three millimeter with 1.7 channel. So we can actually put our mini probe EBUS in. So this again, we're quite a nice case, 50 years old, male, ex-chronic smoker, cognitive symptoms, multiple lung nodules, no other sites to biopsy, dominant RB1. So it's a very upper lobe, medially located nodules. Um, CT guided will have difficulty. And uh, you know it's really quite difficult for other people to biopsy rather than other than us. So Again, Excel one millimeter CT scan right up a lot. We didn't do flip. We just do a counterclockwise 90 degree turn. So we just, just follow me. So this is RB3. So RB1 and two. So we follow RB1, which is here. It's split to two again. Yep, follow my cursor. And then the higher one split to two. And then uh, it's split like this. And then the beta one actually yeah. So this is in RB1 alpha. So we will try to see what we can do. So this patient, we I show you how how much we can reach with this scope. So uh, oh, okay. So. As I expected, we see bipartite. Uh, 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 put in a radio probe, you can see a nice eccentric image. And just look at fluoroscopy, how deep the uh, bronchoscope can go. All right. So we proceed with biopsy. And uh, so this case turned out to be adeno CA, and all the biopsy is adequate. Is it really possible to do or not, you know, when you have a case like that? So if you're using a therapeutic scope, you likely can only engage here. So it's impossible to make that turn up to the media aspect. If you're using a diagnostic scope, you know, a lot of time you can't really make that turn as well. So in this case, you know, it's really only reachable by very thin and steerable scope, thin scope robotic or things like that. And because you, you in this case, you know, you need to navigate a lot of turns the right man bronchus turn, the RC1 turn, the RB1 turn, that only you can engage your scope into the lesion. And the next thing is that, you know, if you see different foresight will deflect your scope differently. So the first, the FB56D1 1.4 millimeters foresight, you have no scope deflection as well. So you maintain your navigation. But if you use the most stiffer foresight, when you go in, you can see it's, it's very stressful for your scope. Your channel might tear. You know, so in this kind of turn, I'll tend to, I'll just give up, I'll just extend my scope to let the, you know, the, the forcep to go in. I don't want to sacrifice my scope. So, uh, yeah, so it's important to choose your, your tools properly. And uh, this will actually eventually optimize your diagnostic U. So when we started off, we don't have radio EBUS, but we have some knowledge on this uh, mapping knowledge, okay? So the only 
verification tool for me is a uh, fluoroscopy. So I'll show you this case is beautifully, beautifully done, I, I feel, because there's no really e bus involved. So I think a lot of you might have similar problem. So 58 years old gentleman, CML on Dacetinib, admitted for bilateral pleural effusion and the SPN or right upper lobe. So of course, uh, we go in with a pyroscope first because that's the most accessible site. But when we do a pyroscope, uh, surprisingly, you know, it's completely normal. So we come out, we came out and so decided, okay, let's do the nodule. Okay, so it's an axial CT scan, B23, B1, it's split to two, B and A, and then that one split to two again. And then this one, a lateral branch that go in the tumor. So this is quite clear, this is just a two millimeter scan, but you know, we can identify it quite confidently. So I go in with a 3.8 scope, only 1.2 channels. So there's no, not possible to print a radio EBUS for verification. So just follow me, this is RV1. So we go to the more posterior one. And you get two bifurcation. And then you go to the lower one, which you expect another two bifurcation. So, you know, the airway actually uh, occluded by some secretion. So that's actually the, this is actually the target. So we put our scope under fluoroscopy, we just take few biopsies and uh, it turned out to be a uh, small cell neuroendocrine carcinoma, quite an early stage. So this is quite, an uh, so always trust the anatomy and understand your verification technique, either you need a fluoroscopy or radio EBUS. So this patient, uh, somehow after pyroscope, you know, the effusion turned chylus three days later. And then we did a tapping, the other side is 1.78 triglyceride. So it's bilateral chylothorax actually. So uh, after we do a PET scan, midastinal staging, we concluded this is a dasatinib induced bilateral chylothorax. So the dasatinib was stopped and uh, the effusion resolved completely. And then patient go for treatment for the, uh, the rapalop nodule. So sorry, I overshoot a bit. So the last case is the, you know, how we paired it with lesion with no airway. So it's a 52 years old gentleman, uh, lady, sorry, breast CA. Surveillance not a uh, new right middle lobe nodule. You need, you need a tissue for biopsy, for diagnosis. So again, right middle lobe, we do a coronal recon. You can see RB4 and 5, it's split to 5A, 5B. And then if you could follow me, you can see that the, 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 the lesion, the airway didn't go into the lesion, okay? The target is somewhere lying there and there's two vessel next to the target, okay? There's no airway going in, all right? So when, when we do analysis on the CT, you feel, you, we noted that the, if you puncture your needle in around 35 degree angle, you, you probably can engage that lesion. So that's what we do. So this is the actual bronchoscopic image compared to our uh, uh, planning. You can see 5A, 5B and the target is somewhere there. So we put our radio EBUS into that normal airway, you can see the lesion. And as expected, it's adjacently orientated with two uh, vessels seen next to the, 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 the nodule. So if you put a forceps in a biopsy, you probably will not get anything, okay? So we do off rod puncture by 19 gauge TBN needle, uh, conventional TBN needle. So we roughly identify the puncture, puncture point. So we have roughly estimate where to puncture on radio EBUS. And after that, we put our radio probe directly into that 19 gauge track. And then you, we get a concentrically orientated radio EBUS. So we perform a faucet biopsy through the defect and uh, we get very good tissue out and it's proven to be a pulmonary paraganglioma. So for peripheral TBNA is quite useful as well when you couple with this case. So this is a, a nodule that we using EBUS is invisible. So when I put in the 19 gauge needle to actually 20 gauge needle to puncture the nodule and guide the guide shift in, we are able to get a concentric image and biopsy show a small cell carcinoma. So I'm coming to, coming to the end of the talk. Uh, we have published our, our experience on this technique. Um, I mean, I think in 2020. So initially almost hundred cases, we're using the big scope with uh, guide shift. Uh, the lesion size around 2.67 is quite peripheral around 2.2 cm next to the pure. Our success, navigation success is 98.9. Uh, however, clinically conclusive is only 88.8%. So there's a discrepancy of navigation success and diagnostic U. Um, we found that if the lesion is located within five airway generation, it's generally better diagnostic U. This is with um, 
therapeutic scope. So now we are start to collecting our data on ultra thin. Ultra thin uh, nano CU is uh, very good because you can literally park your scope in front of the tumor and start to sample. So with the pairing of the 1.1 cryoprobe, I think the U will be very good. So this is how we do it. We usually plan it before, you know, there's a lot of work to do a day before the scope. And then during the scope itself, we will put this drawing on our scope system. And then basically we just follow our planning and drive to the drive to the lesion. So there are a few challenges with this. High quality CT is very important. If you can see the CT, there's significant building artifact at the lower lobe. So when you do, if the lesion is in lower lobe, you, it's impossible to plan because you cannot see the airway at all. All right. And uh, you need to have a thin slice CT, okay, to look at the airway properly. So if you have a one CM cut, it's impossible. But if you have a one millimeter cut or two millimeter cut, at least I think it's quite okay to plan. So of course, the next thing is you don't have a CT workstation, but you know, just ask your radiologist to burn a CD for you. If you are using Mac, you can use Horos, you're using Windows, you just use Radiant.com. It's open source, free software. You know, it can do, we can do proper recon and things like that. So of course, uh, my Prof. Ramin Meta said just now we are predominant left branded doctors. So this might be a challenge, uh, special orientation and learning curve. It really needs time for you to actually, you know, uh, navigate yourself, you know, in a 3D, 3D way. This is a very nice mindful sculpture outside our hotel. Uh, you know, this is what we, we face, you know, sometimes when you do planning, you really need to cool yourself down. You know, but that's a lot of things going in your mind. You don't know where the airway go, you know. I think this is a really nice sculpture to, to, to illustrate when you do the planning process. Thank you from our team. It was excellent presentations, 95% success rate in a peripheral nodule. Sometimes we see everything visible in a bronchoscopy. We take biopsy under vision. After that also, we end up non-diagnostic and uh, getting the diagnosis of 95% is a really tough task. Thank you. <laughs> I think initially when we started, the diagnostic U is not too good. It's 60 to 70%. But uh, I think as the time time passed by, you, you select the target that is only you know, feasible to do. Then we try to understand how to analyze the images, then which biopsy tools to use, which one suitable for FOSAP, which one cryo is better. So I think eventually now we, overall, I think our plateau that don't stick you now is around 78%, uh, overall uh, around 600 cases, yeah. We need to get to 600 cases to reach 90%. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wonderful talk, sir. Uh, the very tool which we all of us have is the CT scan in our center. So maximal utilization of our CT scan uh, would help us to navigate all the way uh, to the lesion. So though we don't have a navigational bronchoscopy at our center, we may use our simple CT scan to navigate all the way. So thorough knowledge of imaging always helps. Thank yeah. You. Thank you. The type of CT scan makes the difference. You know, it's 64 slice or 124 slice. We have a different type of CT scans which yeah. are... Uh, so I think uh, the key is a volumetric CT, one, one mm at least, so you can do NPR recon. Yeah, so I think NPR reconstruction is very important for us to identify the airway. Yeah. Any questions, Any questions from the audience? All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shisang. Next, I would like to invite Dr. Aravindran to deliver his talk on the topic, understanding the basics of radial EVAS imaging, its application from tumors to infections. I would also like to request Dr. Srivatsa to kindly introduce Dr. So Dr. Aravindran is a very good friend of mine and uh, I'm going to
Thank you very much, Dr. Sri, for the kind introduction. So I think uh, as many speakers have asked you, I'm going to ask you the same question while you give me this topic. I think Dr. Tinko asked you and a few other speakers asked you as well. So I think, so let me just start this. So when Dr. Sri gave me this topic, I was asking him, so what exactly you want me to explain to them? So they said, okay, show me, based on your knowledge as well as your know, experience, try to, try to, huh? sorry. How is it? So I think, uh, so the same question I asked everyone, I mean, Dr. Stray as well. So I think he want me to talk about basic how to differentiate tumors from infection. So anyway, it's a pleasure and honor to be here. I used to study in Manipal last time. So it's, uh, it's nice to back to you know, Alma Mater again. So okay, with that, okay. So I think many of you who doesn't know West Kedah exactly, this is exactly my Northern Malaysian part. Okay, I just like to point it out. So I'm here and this is my hospital. This is my official Facebook and we have a lot of mountains. Pulau Langkawi is situated here and we've got some uh, landmarks like, you know, towers and everything. So please welcome to Kedah whenever you visit Malaysia. So my outline will be around background, some of the radar bus gadgets, imaging from tumor to infections and talk about beyond tumor and infections a bit and conclusion. So if you go through the background, it's actually EBUS has widened the horizons for an interventional palmologist, like how Dr. Ko clearly pointed out, we can assess the peripheral lesions clearly. And if you notice from previous speakers, linear EBUS enables sampling from media standard and hyla limb nodes, including cryobiopsy as well. But if you notice that radial EBUS helps in the biopsy of periphery located lesions, the first described by Herter and Hanrat in 1992, and it's systemically studied by Hurt as well as Kurimoto. And if you notice that uh, in Malaysia, I mean, in India, if please correct me if I'm wrong, use of radial probe endobronchial ultrasound for the diagnosis of peripheral pulmonary lesion was first documented in 2016, published in Lung India Journal, if not mistaken, when I searched through PubMed. So a bit on peripheral pulmonary lesions. Again, I think Dr. Kedar clearly uh, explained in previous talk. So peripheral pulmonary lesion is a lesion in the peripheral one third of lung, and detection of such lesions has increased significantly with the adop adoption of lung cancer screening programs. However, it's not directly visible by regular flexible bronchoscope, as they are usually distal to your lobar and segmental bronchi. So what are the gadgets available here? So Olympus, I think many of us use the Olympus, I mean, in Malaysian setting, but quite lot some use Fuji as well. So if you notice the other available gadgets, which is a various types. And if you notice all the display mode are B mode and 20 megahertz. And if you notice the insertion tubes have a differences. So again, as a mini probe available, so we like to go you know, with the smaller lumens and able to assess more periphery lesions actually. And Fujifilm came up with the ultrasonic processor for radial probe as well. This is a specification available, almost similar to our Olympus probe. And if not mistaken, Pentax in the midst of developing and going to launch the radar probe as well. As of now, I don't have the specification with me. So again, what is most important is steps. So once you receive the referral for peripheral pulmonary lesions, you have to plan the procedure. And again, I think me and Ko also train in the same center and also from the same part of the region. Analysis of CT, manual mapping plus minus navigations. So it's a preference whether you want to do under conscious sedation or GA or 
fluoroscopy guidance bit or without guide sheet. So this is a setting in the interventional suite where we have our bronchoscope tower, a fluoroscope, as well as the manual mapping would have been done. And on the right side, if you notice, this is what manual mapping I've sketched. Obviously, Dr. Ko's sketching is very nice. Mine is, you know, like a kindergarten students where, you know, I prefer to sketch manually. And if you notice all this, we have exactly X, where would have been, you know, our target point and what is the real segmental bronchi and everything. So this is actually what I practiced when I was in Nagoya. And this particular drawing shows that in current my settings, I have based on, you know, loner pro radial e bus as well especially i don't have my own radial e bus as of now because in government settings you know procurement takes some time but they do park radial e bus so but again in when we don't have a radial e bus what i can do is i can target the lesion by manually mapping the lesions and this unpublished data i'm still collecting it based on this available my yield rate is almost 70 to 75 percent using a 4.0 mm and also 6.0 mm and also with manual mapping in fact we have even in the recent case i was talking to dr cole so actually has been diagnosed as a consolidation has been treated as pneumonia has been various doctor shopping came to us we managed to map correctly rb9 and when you take biopsy skin up as a adenocarcinoma so that's the beauty of this particular manual mapping strategy so just for the highlight, how accurate it can be. So if you notice, this is where I sketch. And this is a, let me to show you the, how accurate we can go. First generation, second generation, then we go on to the third generation, fourth, fifth, sixth, and I think beyond six is the infinity I would call always. So it's exactly will match where we are marked here actually. So I won't dive into all this because you have enough doses from coal and I've got enough shades of gray to show you all later. So with that, what is imaging from tumor to infections? So I think if you want to talk about this, as, as I pointed out, Dr. Kurimoto have analyzed very clearly and he have divided the lesions into three types with six subtypes actually, type one, type two, and type three. This is a fundamental thing for us to have in this particular talk. So if you notice, what I like to highlight here is type 2 and type 3 predominantly belongs to malignancy. Type 1, more towards benign lesions. Anyway, I'll, I'll talk to you about it in a while. So if a type 1, we generally label as a homogeneous pattern. So again, you divide into type 1A and type 1B. 1A is big pattern vessels and also bronchioles. You can see the patterns, vessels, and bronchioles, and one B without vessels and bronchioles. So the in, one A in the internal echoes were homogeneous. Margins were often linear in some parts. Majority of cases were diagnosed as pneumonia. And one B, no blood vessels were seen. Mortal or linear hyperechoic areas were scanned. Again, the diagnosis organizing pneumonia and tuberculosis in this particular region. I mean, India and Malaysia, we have to always consider tuberculosis, okay? So now we move on to type two hyperechoic dots and linear arcs pattern. So if you notice 2A without vessels, if you notice a bit confusing for initial because we notice on our previous slides, 1A with pattern vessels and bronchioles, 1B without vessels and bron bronchioles. Here, the 2A is without vessels and bronchioles, 2B is with pattern vessels. So you have to remember this correctly. I mean, there's no other way you have to just remember it. So again, 2A ended up mostly malignancy, 2B also malignancy. So dots and linear arcs are placed irregularly. Again, this is about pattern recognition. Type three, heterogeneous pattern. Again, type three A, with hyperechoic dots and short lines. And type three B is without hyperechoic dots and short lines. So in three A, no blood vessel was seen within the lesion. And areas of modeling and linear hyperechoic areas were irregularly distributed within the lesions. So majority diagnosis were and you know CA or squamous cell CA. 3B, the internal echoes were heterogeneous, like squamous cell CA and poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma predominant. So again, what we like to say is type 1 belongs to benign, 2 and 3 belongs to malignancy. So a bit confusing with six subtypes. So these particular papers, actually, they analyzed 131 patients, came up with a four subtypes. So number one is a continuous hyperechoic margin outside the lesion. 
homogeneous or heterogeneous internal echoes, hyperechoic dots in the lesion and concentric circles. So again, they, the success rate is around 73.8%. And majority of these images with continuous hyperechoic margin were neoplasm. And lesion with homogeneous internal echoes and concentric circles likely to be non-neoplasm. So if you notice, these are the pattern where continuous hyperechoic margin, heterogeneous internal echoes, hyperechoic dots, and homogeneous internal echoes. So again, this is how we recognize the pattern. So again, this comparison, if you notice among the all these things, or uh, eBus images pattern with the four patterns. So these are the significant statistic value. So again, do we have a prediction model to identify malignant lesion? Because after we went through these two papers, do we have any prediction model? Yes, this is a study done by Zhang, consists of 303 patients from July 2018 to July 2019. So 214 patients ended up having a malignant lesions and 89 patients having benign lesions. So how are we going to create the prediction model here? So if you notice, these are the, first you have to know the size, which include a short axis and long axis, shape, round, irregular, lobulated, echogenicity, which is homogeneous or heterogeneous, margin, whether it's distinct margin, distinct but not sharp, not very clear, indistinct, whether blood vessels present or absent, linear discrete air bronchogram. So if you notice, these are the parameters we need to look into it. Then if you notice what they have done is, they have came up with a sum score model, which is one plus, two plus, three plus, or four, depend on which character is present. So a sum score value, model value of 79.54% of these combined factors indicated the best diagnostic accuracy for predicting malignant lesions. So if you notice, at least two plus equal to the malignancy. So then the number one, if you notice representative case of malignant lesion in radial endobronchial ultrasonography features, which is lobulated, distinct, but not sharp margin, absence of linear discrete air bronchogram. The sum score was around four, whereas in other thing is irregular, This is ended up become a benign lesion actually. So how about images for ground glass lesions? This is another, not all the time we're going to get a solid lesion in the, our CT scan. So again, this is our famous Dr. Izumo with a blizzard sign. So GGO can represent a variety of diseases, including interstitial pneumonia, pulmonary proliferative disease and organizing pneumonia. And blizzard sign is a subtle but noticeable increase in the intensity and radius of the whitish acoustic shadow. Later, I'll show you the picture of it. And mixed blizzard sign is the internal echo of these lesions demonstrated diffuse heterogeneity with several hyperechoic dots, linear arcs, and vessels that were distributed irregularly or combined with the blizzard sign. So if you notice, it's a normal lung. If you notice within the normal lung, is sometimes called as a snowstorm appearance a subtle but noticeable increase in the intensity and radius of the whitish acoustic shadow. So this is called a blizzard sign. And when you have a diffusely heterogeneous acoustic shadow with some dots, linear arcs, that's called as a mixed blizzard sign. So normal blizzard and mixed blizzard sign. So all blizzard lesions were on the spectrum of malignancy, adenocarcinoma, and mixed blizzard sign also in the spectrum of malignancy, more towards poorly differentiated carcinoma. So beyond tumor infection, again, so in the re when we, are, we have our knowledge growing towards the interstitial lung disease and diffuse parenchymal lung disease, so whether our radial EBUS have any value or not towards this. So this particular paper dissect on this particular matter, multi-center prospective study, 49 patients undergoing radial EBUS. They've demonstrated two signs actually, dense signs were observed in 18 patients and blizzard signs were observed in 29 patients. So one is the normal lung, another one's the dense sign with homogeneous signals, irregularly distributed, mottling and linear hyperacute areas and blizzard sign. 
if you notice, then signs more towards a consolidation and everything. Blizzard signs present in a reticulation and ground glass and also nodules. So by now, I think that everything looks gray for us, like 50 shades of gray. And Sri asking me to talk in a land of Rocky by actually about this talk. So if you notice that with that, I would like to go on with another few more slides. How do we going to increase the yield actually? So guide sheet versus non-guide sheet. I think these are done by my professor actually, Dr. Oki and Saka. So diagnostic yield was histological specimen from GS group was significantly higher than a non-guide sheet group. Again, I think previous speakers already spoke about it, how to use guide sheet and everything. Guide sheet creates a direct bronchial route to the target lesions, enabling repeat biopsy of the same location without imaging guidance. So when the guide sheet method is used, biopsy is effective even without fluoroscopy or navigation devices. Next, ultra thin versus thin bronchoscope. So if you notice, procedure duration was significantly shorter in ultra thin group and overall diagnostic yield was significantly higher in ultra thin group than in thin bronchoscope group. So multimodal bronchoscopy using of ultra thin bronchoscope afforded a higher diagnostic yield than using a thin bronchoscope in diagnosis of small peripheral pulmonary regions. Again, this was done in Nagoya as well. And ultra thin bronchoscopy with multimodal devices for peripheral pulmonary regions. Again, the diagnostic yield of ultra thin uh, bronchoscope method is higher than the thin bronchoscope combined with guide sheet method. So again, this involved around 305 patients. So with all that, what's my conclusion is, first we have a, we must or we need to have a meticulous planning prior to our radial EBUS. And radial EBUS images up to certain extent can help us to predict the nature of lesions. But again, my take home point is, whatever images is there, I mean, based on your predictive model or not, ultimate aim is for you to get the biopsy because biopsy is going to change the entire thing to benign or malignant. So with that, I would like to thank these two godfathers who have trained me. And with that, I would like to say thank you. Uh, this is my international team and this is my medical officers. And this is our team here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Arvind. And what was a wonderful talk. Um, any questions from the audience? Thank you, Dr. Arvindan. I would also like to thank our moderators, Dr. Shiva Langaswamy and Dr. Uh, Hirenappa. <laughs> requesting Dr. Shivatsa to hand over the moment totally. Thank you, doctors. Next, I would like to invite Dr. Jeffrey to moderate the next two sessions. Thank you. Up next, we have Dr. Male Sharma delivering the talk on topic, mapping the media senum an expert's guide on getting around the EBUS and EUS galaxy. I would also like to invite Dr. Sunil to give a brief introduction. Yeah, uh, I think this is going to be a, one of the challenging session, actually. I think we have uh, experts by himself, I see Dr. Malay Sharma, doesn't need any sort of an introduction when it comes to ES and EBUS. He's a master in this thing, actually. I was very much mesmerized by the concept which being, brings up, actually. We go with airways, we go with vasculars, actually. He, the meticulous and fairness in which he get, gets his job done is what I'm going to be showing in the next 20 minutes. Thank you, sir. Over to you, sir.
So we start the topic role of endoscopic ultrasound or endobronchial ultrasound, both in mapping of mediastinum. And these are the topics, subheadings I will be discussing this topic in. And what do we want to map in mediastinum? We want to see the wall, the chamber, the cardiac chamber, the trunks, the pulmonary aortic trunk, the vena cava, ajaigos, aorta, trachea, bronchus, as well as the pleura. These are the structures we want to see. And we want to take tissues, and those are the standard conventional tissues that you take by thoracentesis and EBUS, EUSF, and SE. These are everybody knows about this, how we can take tissues by this structure. The main thing is I want to discuss is we can take EBUS FNAC and we can take EUS guided FNAC and this EBUS FNAC, US guided FNAC, this is the difference. Why, where, when, and how should we do it? To understand mediastinum, it mediastinum is between the two parts of lung. This is the central blue part of the mediastinum, which is the central compartment and which contains the esophagus. And this is what we are going to do. We move the scope within the trachea or within the esophagus. We keep on going down. And since the scope is linear, we keep on rotating one way or the other. One step, two step. Three. So broadly, you must have something in mind when you are going from the esophagus or when you are going from the trachea, the things, basically the structures are same. All you're doing is rotation. The job is go down, rotate, look around, go down, rotate, look around, and keep on coming back. And these are the six stations which you can do. So what is the difference between EBUS and EUS? Because in EBUS, you are able to assess only the parabronchial and paratracheal area. And if there is a tumor close to paratracheal, parabronchial area, you can take an FNAC. When we go into the trachea, the concept remains the same. The only difference is that in trachea, you are entering from central compartment from a different route into the peripheral compartment of mediastinum. So central compartment into the peripheral compartment. And again, you can subdivide this into six stations we have described in our Journal of Bronchology article, how to do EBUS and from the six different stations. You keep on rotating. The first thing you must know what you are doing how you are progressing, where you are doing. And then you must decide what do you want to do. Is you are doing EUS, you are doing EBUS, you are doing EBUS first, EUS first, you are doing EBUS Cisco from esophagus, the front then from trachea, or you are using it from trachea first or the uh, esophagus first. To each his own, you have to be familiar with both. I would say the single operator should be familiar with both routes. I would still put my bat, my money on each each pulmonologist should go should be very very familiar with the esophagus and he must do put the learn to put the ebus scope into the esophagus because it is very so we'll see the differences these are the differences even quality of images same patient two different type of images this is the range narrow ebus scope wide EBUS scope and these are the differences and these differences are outlined because the EBUS scope has got a wide angle which is narrow angle, smaller scope, quality is better, less crystals. And in EUS scope, you have one thing called elevator. You can change the direction of the needle in EUS scope. And this is the brief comparison of EUS and EBUS scope, which I have mentioned in this slide. So a comparison of image quality again, on the one side is the EBUS image, on the other side is the US image, and look how much you can see the mass, the thymoma, the beyond the aorta, the left concurrent artery breakage of vein. And in this case, we did a trans aortic FNAC by going through the aorta, we will show later. So the applied anatomy of mediastinum, when we describe is we see trachea and esophagus. The main thing is that the left brachiocephalic vein crosses in front of trachea. Left precursor vein is a horizontal vein, and right precursor vein is a vertical vein, and they both lie in the superior mediastinum and they join to form the superior vena cava, which is then joined by a gigos vein, which comes from below posterior to the right bronchus and joins just at the upper border. So, how do we see this precursor vein? You can see this by EBUS scope also that this is the joining of internal jugular vein and the breakage to form the left subclavian vein to form the breakage vein in the mid in the neck part. And so we do this. This next place we do is this is how we see the ajaigos vein, as I said. It is seen as a curving part. You see the curve because it is curving on the over the right bronchus, and this is a mirror image you are seeing. The mirror image beyond you see same to the adjacent vein is the mirror image 
because Ajay Goswami is against the right lung and the plural reflection creates a mirror image of Ajay Goswami. Then you see this is how we see the Supriya Vina Keva from Isofagar. And this is the Supriya Vina Keva, right atrium in Supriya Vina Keva. And you must learn to trace Supriya Vina Keva if you learn how to do e -birth. Because in e on the right hand side, when you go to the right lower part of trachea, you will see Supriya Vina Keva. On the left side, you will see the arch of aorta. So that is where you go into the do e -birth. You go into the right border, trace Supriya Vina Keva, pull back. Go on to the left side, trace the arch of aorta, pull back, and that is what you must know. So when it comes to apply this, is the aorta, aorta which lies on the left side. You can see it from the left bronchus as well as you can see it from the right bronchus. Once we see this tree structure, the next structure is important is pulmonary artery, which lies in, in the subcarinal area. It lies below the below the bifurcation of trachea and this is the subcurrent pulmonary artery and you will see this the pulmonary artery forms the pulmonary trunk which you can see the pulmonary artery and this pulmonary trunks this forms the right pulmonary artery as you can see this vein which is then subdivided into two parts the truncus anterior that is the upper branch of the right pulmonary artery which you can see and in between the arch of aortas making the mickey mouse appearance in between, you see this 4L lymph node station. Then further down, so as I said, God has made arteries and veins in such a way that the veins are lower, arteries are a little bit higher because they have to supply. High pressure is created, the arteries have to supply. The veins from the lungs go lower down. So this is the left atrium, which forms the lower boundary of the subcarinal area. And in this case, you can see how this lower boundary is formed. And you see this left atrium, you rotate it to one side and to other C and follow it to individually to the left inferior pulmonary and superior pulmonary veins. This image is also possible from both the right and left bronchus also when you do endobronchial ultrasound. A little word about imaging of subcarinal area because you must know the anatomy, subcarinal area, right bronchus 2.5, intermediate bronchus 2.5, both at an angle of 25, 45 degree. And this is subcarinal area is an oblique line, which is this is in this manner it joins the lower bronchus with the uh, intermediate bronchus, uh, lower border. So this is how we see this is the subcarinal area. And in this subcarinal area, because you can see that the right pulmonary artery is dividing into two, and there is a lymph node present in the subcarinal area. And this is the right bronchus that you will be seeing, and Supia Vina Keva. So these structures are also imaging because I'm showing more videos of EUS to get you, but with time, if you start putting the scope into the bronchus, you will be able to see all these structures. But given the time, you must learn how to see the right pulmonary artery. Remember, the pulmonary artery divides after crossing the bronchus. So if you see a lymph node of between the division of two branches of pulmonary artery, it is station 10, whereas the pulmonary veins unite after crossing the bronchus. So if you see a lymph node between, just between the branching of two pulmonary veins, that is in subcarinal area. So this is the, it's a one of the important texts. So we uh, imagine from this station one, little bit we can see when you are doing imaging of mediastinum, you should not forget, must not forget imaging of the neck which is an important part. You can go into the hypopharynx and use the EBUS scope, especially the EBUS scope is thin. And the, sometimes you can see that the thyroid gland, which has got a peculiar, typical uh, ecotexture, very similar to a pancreas, as we see. And then you can see this is the lymph node. Sometimes the lymph nodes may not, the neck may not be accessible. And these lymph nodes can be assessed by EBUS scope or even by US scope in the hypopharynx going along the carotid arteries and puncturing into the, into this. So then these are the different real, I've seen that you can go into the hypopharynx, rotate the scope left and right, go from one side to other and see these structures as we have outlined in the, this imaging in there. This is, for example, the aorta, left common carotid artery. This is how you map the left precocephalic vein. And then we go into the station three. These stations are divided broadly. Broadly, they are divided by the arch of aorta. Above the arch, below the arch. And one is the diaphragm. This means diaphragm. Below diaphragm is station six. So this is the station. 
this is an important diagram, whether you see from trachea or from the esophagus, this is the area of arches on one hand, this is the arch of a digest vein, on the other hand, at around 22 to 24 centimeters, this is the area of arch of aorta. So area of arching, on one side, the aorta is arching over the left bronchus. On the other side, the gigos vein is arching over the right bronchus. So when you are seeing this is the area, suppose you are finding an arch of a gigos vein, you rotate in the same place, you will find the arch of aorta when you are seeing imaging from the. So this is important. This is Gray's anatomy diagram. This is just an animation to show. You must know in your mind, T3, T4, T5, T6, cross-sectional anatomy, what will you see when you are seeing it from inside that esophagus and from inside the trachea sequentially. So this is the, uh, an example when this is an arch of aorta and this is an arch of aorta. And in this case, there is a lymph node beyond the arch of aorta into the. Now, imaging from station four, and again, as I said, at this place, this is pulmonary arteries dividing into right and left. And you are seeing beyond the pulmonary artery, even with an EBUS scope, you will first see right pulmonary artery very close to you. And beyond the pulmonary artery, you will see the superior vena cava as well as the ascending aorta. Station 5, this is when you are going further down, is the level of left atrium you are imagining. And left atrium, you rotate to one side. I am saying these stations, and this is an example of how you will see, because you will see the aortic wall and the pulmonary trunk. And then imaging from station six is you must learn to take your EBUS scope if you have below the diaphragm so that you can see this classify this lymph node. You can see the lymph node, you can see the masses within the liver and do the staging. And this is just a diagram just to show how the end staging or this. This is part of my um, video which is available. If anyone wants, you can take these images and the videos from me, I don't mind. So this is how do you define the lymph node, different lymph node stations, because this is above lymph node station one, then you define the lower border. See what happened, you must learn, each of pulmonologists cannot survive without knowing the border. So what are the borders? How do you define them? And how do you see them? How do you identify them while you are using the E-bus scope? or US scope. Or number one, apex of lung. How will you identify? It is the highest point where the arch of a jagos vein is going. I, you cannot identify apex of lung easily. You identify the subclavian vein, arching, going up, going into the internal jugular vein. Okay, that is where it is, it is stationed. How do you identify the lower border of your brachiocephalic vein? You must learn to follow the lower border lower border of a brachiocephalic vein, which I will show, then upper border of arch of aorta, lower border of arch of aorta. For example, this is the station four lymph node below and station two lymph node above, which is the imaginary line of the upper border of arch of aorta. The upper border of aorta, arch and arch, lower border of arch of aorta are important. And these are so important that above this is a different station, below this is a different station. And mapping of these lymph node station is mandatory for more than. Interesting. The lower border of a jagos vein, you must be able to easily identify because it joins the superior vena cava and that lower border of a jagos vein, you should be able to identify because this is the superior vena cava it is joining, this is the jagos vein it is joining, and this is the lower border of the. And you can see the pulmonary artery, a jagos vein, all from the right bronchus, right lower. This is a case where there is a right paratracheal lymph node. And as I said, this is the pleura tumor. And as I said, you must learn to do FNAC of the right paratracheal lymph node from esophagus. Not necessarily you have to go into the bronchus because it can be done. The upper border of the left pulmonary artery, the left pulmonary artery goes over the, and this is the left pulmonary artery. And this outer pulmonary artery, the station four, this is the ligamentum arteriosum. This is station five and this is station six lymph node. And these are the images which are similar quality because uh, some of the scopes uh, I have used in this case, the Pentax EBUS scope. And I found this to have fantastic resolution even from the bronchus as well as from the. The important thing is I want to place particular lower border of carina people you must read because you are pollinologists, the subkernel area, the boundaries upper boundary, lower boundary, right boundary, left boundary, posterior boundary, anterior boundary, 
what lies posterior to subcarnal area is the esophagus and what lies anterior to these bones. And same with the boundaries of the, of the outer pulmonary window. I have published an article, EUS of spaces, media spaces of mediastinum. So you must know. So you must know how to identify. There are not only two spaces. There are many more spaces. And these spaces are in communication with each other. So these are the lower border of intermediate. These are the different borders. And these different borders help in defining the lymph node, as in this case, the station 6 lymph node or station 10 lymph node above and below the pulmonary artery. So what then there are vertical borders. I have explained there are horizontal borders, but there are two vertical borders. And what are these vertical borders? One is the left border of trachea, which is a vertical border. To make it, it is a very complicated topic. It is a very nerve-wracking topic. It takes a lot of time. It spoils, uh, spends, you spend a lot of energy cramming this up. I tried to simplify it because this is the left border. So I divide it into vertical border, horizontal border, what you can see. And you can see all these borders by endoscopic ultrasound as well as by endobronchial ultrasound. Ligamentum arteriosum is one. And then this is the left and the left, left border of trachea is one. So six stations in EUS, six stations in EBUS, 14 lymph node stations. You have to identify these lymph node stations by EUS. And in EBUS, you are aided because in EBUS, I am blind. I am not interested in seeing the endoscopic vision. But in EBUS, you have you can be there, upper trachea, lower trachea, right upper trachea, right lower trachea, rotate, and you know where you are. You are, however, can be added by these centimeter landmarks because these centimeter landmarks from your incisor define where you are, what you expect to see, what do you want to see, what do you expect at this particular place. And then you decide, you move the scope, push it down, rotate this inside. This is where you see, say, around about 20 centimeter landmark, 22L. Then go down, go rotate left rotate right and sequentially you keep on go down into the trachea and keep on going down to match the map and same way then you are in the trachea because these are the way the lymph nodes are mapped and you keep on going from 1r 1l 2r 2l see these figures couple of times your mind must know where these lymph nodes are there and then 2r 2l and then for example this is an interesting art lymph node arching of aorta this is the lymph node you see with an ebuscope 2l 2l lymph node and then and this, some, these lymph nodes can be biopsy. Then you go into 4R, again 4R, 4L, you go lower down, further lower down, this is 4R, 4L, and the example of this is by your scope. This is 4R, 4L lymph node you can do. And do, you can do this lymph node 4R. People used to think that 4R cannot be approved by your scope. They are wrong. We have done a study of 328 cases of mediastinal tuberculosis. And in only about three or four of these cases, we required EBUS scope to enter into the, into the trachea or bronchi. So this 3A and 3P, unfortunately, or whatever it is, for some reason, I have yet failed in identifying an isolated 3A or 3P lymph node in my practical experience. I do not have much of a, a PET scan backup, but in practical experience, I have not identified 3A or 3P lymph node. Almost, uh, 3A, yes, but 3P, almost never. But this is an example of 3F, yes. How, how do you identify the 3A node? How do you identify 6 node? How did this is 3A node? which is lies in the anterior tube. And this is the ligamentum arteriosum that we have shown with yellow border, the 4L lymph node medial to it, and the 5 lymph node lateral to it. So then you go again to the 10R, 10L into the, into the trachea and the right bronchus. You keep on rotating into the right bronchus and the left. And this is what you see when you go into the right bronchus, superior vena cava, right pulmonary artery, and ascending aorta. And this is the ascending aorta when you go into the right bronchus. And then you go into the left bronchus. Imagine the subcarnal area is a very interesting area. You can assess this from the right bronchus. You can assess this from the left bronchus. When you go into the right bronchus, rotate to left. When you go into the left bronchus, rotate to right. Both ways you can assess the subcarnal area. But it is a station 10, 11. However, in my practical experience, theory is a different thing. Practical is a different thing. I rarely, probably uh, once in a year out of 103 cases, I would say I'm doing isolated lymph node 10 or 11 lymph node FNAC. I'm yet to find in my practice an operable lung cancer 
though this is not part and i believe you people will be seeing isolated lymph node resting what is the difference for those pgs what is the difference why it is important to do fna of lymph node because till now the tumor if it is in 10 and 11 is in the peripheral compartment of lung you can resect it once it comes to the central compartment here it is probably a different stage and a different ball game so this is central versus peripheral compartment understanding of these two compartments is a different thing so learn to take your ebus scope into the esophagus and identify tissue 8 and 9 the people are confused how to identify how to differentiate between 8 and 9 this is espera esophageal or this is station uh, 8 because these are the lymph nodes parallel to the aorta or on the right side and this is station 9 so how do you identify station 9 9 lymph node. This is above is station 7 subkernel lymph node, below is station 9 lymph node. So practically speaking, it doesn't matter if it in the case of lung cancer, you have a station 9 or 8 lymph node, it doesn't matter. It is a bad thing. So for you people, but if it, for other reason, you want to be theoretically sure, you want to know, understand the pulmonary ligament. There are mainly two ligament, pulmonary ligament and the ligamentum arteriosum. How do you identify the pulmonary ligament? So this is, I will probably go. What you do is you see the root of lung. You see the inferior pulmonary vein, and then you push below it. And if you find in this case, because this is the inferior pulmonary vein, if you find a lymph node below the inferior pulmonary vein, that lymph node is within. It is like jackfruit sticking to the shaft. So these lymph nodes are within the pulmonary ligament and this is why this is the station 9 lymph node. People often confuse 9 and 8 with the. So this is a picture which shows the station 1, 2 and 3 nodes, station 2, 1, station 6, uh, six second number lymph node and station 10, this third number lymph node. And this is again a just an exercise when I give you an image. And I ask you, what is the lymph node? What is the lymph node one? What is two? What is three? Lymph node one is seven. Lymph node two is 11. And lymph node three is 10 L. So that is how. The NN staging in lung cancer can be done. And this is, I'm saying this is the mass because this is the mass lateral to the arch of aorta. And this is the left atrial because M staging is important. This is the mass of the left adrenal gland. You will be able to see it on even when you, you see, a word you can do transortic FNAC because you can do if, if there is a need, you can go through the aorta, take puncture through the transortic aorta. You need to move a little bit in light, right and left, and see the material is moving within the needle. You don't need to puncture, but this case, this picture I am showing is that this is ascending aorta tumor. The tumor is very well encased, invaded, invasion because for medicinal invasion, this is the most important thing. So, how do you do you see bronchus? You don't see bronchus when you do CE bus. You don't see trachea when you do E bus. But I see trachea, I see bronchus, I see the individual cartilages of the bronchus, I see the individual rings of the bronchus when I do EUS. And this is what we are interested in. So, medicinal invasion is the most important thing. And this medicinal invasion is there. You can assess medicinal invasion by endoscopic ultrasound or endoscopic ultrasound. And this is where the mass is invading into the supia vena cava. So EBUS is staging, EBUS is also important in three staging of the cancer, any staging left cancer. I want to give a brief overview. Plura, I wrote two articles, EUS of Plura. How do you see EUS Plura? You never forget the Plura because sometimes there may be a need. What do you see are lung rocket? Traditionally, interstitial lung disease, more than three rockets, interstitial lung disease, but you see at least 20, 30 rockets. Why? Because you are seeing at least 10 intercostal spaces. These are the lung rockets that you are seeing because the sound is going from here, going into the pleura, going into the interalveolar space and reverberating within the interalveolar space. And you see these lung rockets. So, but here these lung rockets are gone. You see aorta, you see a mass above the aorta and you can go through the pleural effusion and you can take an FNAC very easily from through this pleural effusion into the mass. Pleural effusion tap was negative and the mass FNAC was positive. Sometimes in pleural effusion, the mass will be in the mediastinal aspect of the pleura. It will not be in the intercostal aspect. So pleura has got three recesses. 
the intercostal mediastinal and the diaphragmatic pleura this is the mark on the diaphragmatic aspect of pleura much more easily accessible by endoscopic ultrasound this is again a picture of the adrenal gland that i am showing and this is again a picture of adrenal gland you must learn to see adrenal gland you must learn to go into the stomach see the kidney at least the left kidney and above the kidney you will find the adrenal gland and see if you can use the ibasisco go into the liver find the tumor in the liver use the highest frequency you can use tissue harmonic imaging so that the frequency is doubled and with doubled frequency of tissue harmonic imaging see the liver sometimes you will find those tumor which are missed by the pulmonologist or which are missed by even by ct scan and do. so multimodality imaging is the imaging in evolution ebus us can be done they are mandatory let us see they are not just diagnostic image and they should be done combined with so i it is a strange topic for me mapping of medicinum because i do us i do ebus i do both and i have written some articles on how to do us how to do ebus how to identify border how to do eos of pleura how to do uh, e so this so this is uh, uh, i have done and uh, i am in hopefully in the process of writing within this year publishing this year a uh, first book in which there will be physics of ultrasound will be one part and the second part will be eos of mediastinum that will be so till then uh, you friends if you have uh, any questions you can ask me uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Sharma, for your very uh, foundational, uh, basic, but uh, important, uh, going through all the anatomical features uh, of the mediastinum with such clear images and, uh, and, and very much into uh, the detail of the mediastinum. Uh, our gastroenterology colleagues uh, are often uh, decades uh, um, ahead of us. Uh, in, in interventions. Uh, it is not common to get a gastroenterologist to come into a respiratory uh, session. Hello, and everyone. Tell us that, I'm uh, you know, we should go to the esophagus and in get to know uh, the mediastinum through the esophagus. Uh, well, uh, are there any questions from the audience? If, if not, uh, actually, I have one question for uh, Dr. Sharma. Uh, it, could, could you share with us the method that you use to uh, learn this uh, anatomy because uh, yeah, you so can look at the textbooks, but uh, when you go into the procedures, follow one structure. There is follow one structure. Follow one uh, method. One structure. Of... In one case, follow one structure. Right, right. In in one case, uh, say if you are looking at the one structure. structure, one structure. Then look for it. This is the principle. So, for example, I will tell you, follow one structure. The principle is, you people, when you go into the trachea, you are lost, you find so many vessels and all this. Then you go down, take FNAC and come out. Okay. I can tell you, I've seen the best of the best in the world, whether it is, I won't name the European best of the best. I ask them, which is Trishan doing FNAC? I'm the right bronchus, I'm the left bronchus. Where am I? Number. Oh, they will rotate. Oh, lymph node, FNAC. No, simple. Follow one structure. Okay. Remember how deep you are. And if you have done EBUS, never come out without inserting the scope into esophagus for two minutes. So if you are going to esophagus, what you will do is follow the aorta. All the way to stomach. Oh. You must learn to, the steadiness of your hand must come while following one structure. You must show these are vertical structures. Inferior vena keva, vertical structure. Superior vena keva, vertical structure. Brachiocephalic vein, horizontal structure. So follow the vessel. Follow the vessel. Follow the left atrium will always be seen from esophagus. They start learning from left atrium. Most important 33 centimeter pulsatile chamber. So first exercise for the beginners. Put your scope into esophagus. Reach 33 centimeter. Identify left atrium. See interatrial septum. 
Rotate. See the left ventricle. Rotate this way. See the left atrium dividing into right inferior and right superior pulmonary vein. Then follow it left atrium to the left. See it dividing into left inferior and left superior pulmonary vein. Come back. See the left atrium. See interatrial septum. Again rotate. See left atrium going to the mitral wall and come out. Then go and read. See our videos. See some. And then next time, same thing. Same thing again. Learn because patient is not uncomfortable. It is scope is in esophagus. So use. This is the luxury you can. Two minute imaging. Secondary. I have no idea, but more newer machines will have real time recording video software. To learn to make videos, which you will review later on, not on your laptop, within the machine. Learn to make videos within the machine. So while you are doing record, real time archives, software recording facility, record within the machine. Rotate, left atrium, right pulmonary artery rotate, going into upper branch, truncus anterior lower branch, okay. I see nothing. There are blind area. Rotate, okay, this is the left one. Last thing is crouch. Just now while I was telling you what I did, I crouched. I call it the panther posture. Because you are casually standing, rotating like this. Huh. This is the panther posture. You are rotating very slowly. Have you seen a panther in geography movies? Running after life. The panther stands in a crouched position. And when the structure moves, panther moves. This panther posture. Crouch. Bend down, rotate. Do one movement at a time. Don't do both movements. And don't do this movement. Don't do, don't do Parkinsonian movement. This is either rotate this way or this way. This way or this way. I hope I gave you the trick. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I think they are very practical and very useful uh, things to, to do. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, any questions? All right, then uh, I will close this session. Thank you very much, Dr. Sharma. Thank you very much, Dr. Malin Sharma. Up next, we'll be playing a pre-recorded video by Dr. Zhu Li, who is consultant interventional pulmonologist, Shangdong Public Health Clinical Center, Department of Respiratory Endoscopy, China. His topic is burning the tumor. Is radiolibus the new therapeutic window in managing early tumors? A look at the future of RFA and EBUS. Hello, everyone. I'm work honored to participate in this meeting and thanks Dr. Sonia for the invitation. Our hospital uh, participates in a model center a study of radio frequency ablation in 2021, which is a pro-market clinical trial. Uh, the radio frequency ablation devices is especially for, used for lung tumor and has achieved a better result in animal experiments. Uh, here I will share the clinical application of radio bus and the frequency ablation. <clears throat> uh, radio bus, like this picture, it is used to, it is used to check and uh, collect collected a uh, proper lung lesion in order to diagnose and uh, state minimum uh, invasive operation of different uh, respiratory uh, disease, including lung cancer. Helping operator find and collect a proper lung lesion more simply and uh, reliably. 
When the lesion is located in the airway, uh, like typical within, we can easily diagnose it. Uh, when the lesion is closed to the airway, like typical adjacent to uh, uh, the diagnosis rate decreases, and sometimes uh, we use uh, coral biopsy to improve uh, the positive rate. In addition, we need to pay attention to whether there are blood vessels around the lesion and avoid bleeding as much as possible. Radio bus is very helpful uh, for the diagnosis of uh, peripheral lung lesions. But we know there are many bronchial uh, grades. Sometimes we do not know which bronchus to uh, use radio bus. At this, this time, we need to use virtual navigation to help us. Uh, in this study, it is found that to use uh, VBN to assist uh, uh, EBUS GS improves the diagnosis rates from 67% to 81%, reduce the operation time and reduce the pain of the patients. Uh, however, uh, virtual navigation needed to plan in advance and it takes about uh, uh, maybe 10 or 20 minutes before operation. According to the relationship between the lesion and seat and the airway, uh, we usually divide it into five types. Uh, type one, the nodule blocked bronx. Uh, type two, the nodule within bronx. And uh, type three, the nodule within bronx and tracheal bronchial trees opening uh, the nodule. Type four, the branch, the branch close to the edge of the nodule without uh, interfraction, uh, the lumen is normal. Type 5, the branch close to SPN and the tumor construct the lumen lead to uh, stenosis. In type 1, type 2, and type 3, we are easily to diagnosed by uh, navigation and the radio bus. In type 4 and type 5, uh, we are less able to make the uh, definitive diagnosis. In our hospital, the navigation system we used it, the Archimedes, uh, Archimedes system. Uh, when the region is in the airway, we can use AR navigation. When the region is not uh, in the airway, we can use the uh, BTPA. Uh, it can break bronchial wall. At this, at this picture, we, we need to establish a tunnel to biopsy. <clears throat> There were four male, 69 years old, pulmonary lesion uh, were found on physician examination for four months. There were multiple nodules in both lung, and the larger one is located at RB7, uh, about uh, nine millimeter in size. Through the planning uh, of the navigation, we found that uh, lesions in the right lower lobe uh, could be diagnosed by BTPNA. Uh, the POE at uh, uh, RB7, uh, the, the length of the tunnel of uh, 23 millimeter, it can be avoided the uh, blood vessels and reduce the bleeding of the operation. First, we use AR navigation to find the path. Uh, the left is the bronchoscopy image, the right is virtual navigation. The path and the POE uh, will marked on the bronchoscopy image. The point is located at uh, RB7, and uh, the navigation shows that the airway uh, diameter is 4.5. Uh, millimeter. So we use the bronchoscopy with an uh, external diameter of 
uh, four millimeter. <coughs> then uh, use the uh, uh, flex needle to puncture at the PoE. Uh, flex needle is a nineteen G needle. When the needle punctures the airway, we need to uh, we need to address uh, address the C arm from a multiple angle to make the puncture uh, direction accurate. Uh, then pull out the needle uh, um, and use the guided sheets to enter the tunnel. The system uh, will display the location of the region on the fluoroscopy image, uh, which is green circle displayed on the image. Uh, when the guided sheath is close to the green circle, we can use the radio bus to determine whether the lesion has been reached. And then several times, uh, biopsy. Uh, finally, uh, it diagnosed was adeno adenocarcinoma. When we gained some experience uh, in transbronchial diagnosis of a uh, peripheral pulmonary nodule. We start uh, uh, preparing for ablation. The following are the equipment we should prepare uh, before ablation. Of course, the first is bronchoscopy. Uh, mm, I think the better is outer uh, diameter of four uh, millimeter, and the biopsy channel uh, was two mil millimeter suitable for microwave and uh, uh, RF ablation. The second is C arm. If common CT is available, it can be better. The position of obl uh, ablation proper uh, and uh, can and check the ablation range. There is also a suitable navigation system uh, that can be used to calculate the best path and avoid uh, the vessels um, and the planning and the plan ablation uh, range. If you have no common city, radio really bus is necessary. Uh, the, post, uh, the position of the ablation problem needed to be positioned and with the CM for uh, accurate ablation. Next, uh, we introduce the RF. Uh, RF ablation is most uh, widely used ablation techno um, technique for treating uh, slate tumor. It is found that when the proper insert into tumor tissue and uh, heat it to more than uh, 60 temperature and uh, high frequency electro current, uh, coagulation of cells occurs. Uh, and uh, there are some advantage, uh, like minimum, minimally invasive quick recovery, uh, safe and less complications. However, RF ablation in the lung tumor has the, some problems, uh, such as the alveolar air contact is too high to transfer energy. Uh, effectively, and uh, the local temperature rise too fast to form tissue uh, carbonization. So uh, the IF proper were modified uh, apex perfusion hole design and real time temperature detection. <coughs> it can reduce the local temperature and prevent uh, carbonization. Because we uh, we are participating in a pro market uh, clinical trial, there are uh, street enrollment standard for patients. The first is lesion within uh, three centimeter in size and pathologically confirmed uh, as no small cell lung cancer. Uh, the need for re uh, ablation uh, was assisted by enhanced CT. Uh, three months after ablation, and a lot uh, and a total of one year follow up was required. Uh, this trial has now been enrolled and it is still under follow up observation. Uh, here is the uh, RF 
ablation uh, device we used. Uh, here is the RF probable with many micro hole design. Uh, this picture uh, shows an earlier experiment done on animal, and it can be seen that there is no uh, carbonization. The following is the internal uh, research result of this uh, trial, a PR from first uh, uh, affiliated hospital of Guangzhou uh, Medical University. This is um, uh, this is my hospital. Uh, it used to be a test uh, hospital, but now it has changed the name. Uh, in twenty twenty one, a total of uh, 96 patients were enrolled uh, with an average age of uh, 64 years, and 92% uh, of patients had uh, stage 1 uh, lung cancer. The lesions were all within 3 um, centimeter in size. And uh, the right upper lobe had um, had the highest uh, proportion of lesions. Uh, it has thirty one um, percent volume, uh, followed by the right middle lobe with twenty five percent. The average oper operating time was forty nine minutes, uh, and all cases uh, use. And navigation, other devices such as common CT, video bus, uh, C arm, and DSA. <clears throat> to evaluate the effect of ablation treatment after three months, uh, 46 patients, the follow up for three months after uh, the operation was. Uh, Completed, uh, completed operation uh, was achieved in thirty nine, uh, thirty eight patients, according for uh, ninety two percent. However, further treatment effect still require follow up. <clears throat> During the study period, there were no serious uh, adverse events related to the uh, devices. Judging from the middle terminal result of the uh, trial, the effect of RF ablation is still quite satisfactory. Uh, the following is a case of RF ablation completed uh, by our center. Uh, the first is a property uh, assessment. This uh, are the male patient who underwent uh, right middle and uh, uh, lower lobe resection uh, for squamous cell carcinoma uh, one year ago, and uh, a new lesion in the left uh, upper lobe was about uh, uh, 16 millimeter in size. Pathologically confirmed uh, squam squamous cell uh, carcinoma by bronchoscopy. Second, we need to assess how to ablation. Uh, we use the navigation system to evaluate uh, many around uh, three aspects. The first is the range of stim simulated ablation. Uh, the second is to determine uh, the number of ablation around the range of ablation. <clears throat> and uh, the third is to determine the bronchial navigation path according to the number of ablation. This patient required uh, two ablations. Uh, the first is located in the distal tumor, and uh, the second is located in the center of a tumor. Uh, this picture is, is, is the information displayed by the navigation system, uh, lesion distance, uh, bronchial diameter, um, here we can see the uh, region shape and the ablation direction. In addition, uh, virtual fluoroscopy and uh, virtual whistles 
uh, also important. It can help us avoid the bleeding. Here is the procedure performed after general anesthesia and uh, intubation. Uh, the first step is AR navigation. After approaching the lesion, uh, use, uh, use the radio bus to explore the two ablation point and mark them on the fluoroscopy. Uh, uh, the post uh, the, the position of um, the two ablation uh, point determined according to the radio bus are uh, displayed here, uh, here and uh, here. Uh, after the ablation point uh, is determined, uh, RF ablation is started. Uh, generally, an uh, ablation point is five minutes, and uh, information such as uh, uh, impedance, uh, impedance, ablation time, and the temperature um, mm, uh, are displayed on this device. <clears throat> After the ablation was completed, the ablation range was first checked by video bus, and uh, then uh, a CT scan was uh, performed uh, uh, 24 hours. Uh, after the operation, and uh, to we need to evaluate uh, the ablation or range of about uh, uh, 20, uh, 30, 32 millimeter, and uh, the patient had uh, no complications. The treatment effect of follow up shown here uh, the patient has no completed. Uh, uh, nine months follow up, it can be seen that uh, the lesion graduate uh, shrink and uh, the scar uh, like change has been formed. In the medial sternal uh, window of the patient, we can also see the gradual form formation of scar uh, after the uh, IF ablation, and there is no enhancement. This is an elderly female a patient who underwent resection of LB4 for adenocarcinoma four, four years ago. Uh, a nodule in the upper lobe of the right lung was found by physician examination, uh, which was confirmed to the adenocarcinoma by uh, bronchoscopy biopsy. At present, uh, uh, the following up has been carried out for uh, nine months, and uh, the lesion uh, gradually from uh, the, the scars like this. <clears throat> but sometimes uh, comp complications may also occur with RF ablation. Uh, this patient's uh, lesion was located in the upper lobe of the left lung, and uh, he had a history of COPD. After the RF ablation, a small amount of uh, hemoptysis uh, occurred, which improved after one week. Uh, then several uh, pulmonary infection occurred after one month, and it improved after three months. After a uh, one year follow up, the lesion has disappeared, uh, but probably due to the large ablation range, it is equivalent, equivalent to complete a uh, lung volume reduction at the same time. Now, the patient feels more uh, energetic than before. So, a summary of the content of my speech. Uh, first, I think uh, transbronchial RF ablation in the treatment of peripheral lung tumor has initially uh, shown a safety, uh, feasibility, and uh, efficacy. Dr. Sonia told me that uh, they will perform the ablation of pulmonary nodule uh, in common city. Uh, also so um, admire and after all 
a common city is too expensive. Uh, in any case, my recommendation is that it is best not to perform a basin uh, technique without uh, a working basis. First, we need to complete uh, the accumulation of some pulmonary nodule uh, diagnosis uh, case uh, through navigation and uh, radio bus. And uh, then gradually, and then gradually uh, translation to a medicine. Of course, without com CT, C arm, and uh, uh, radio bus for a medicine is necessary. Finally, what I have done is also some uh, explosion, um, explosion on RF ablation technology. Uh, please correct if there are something wrong. Uh, uh, thanks again, everyone, for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Zulu, for the amazing presentation. Can you hear us? Hello, hi. Uh, Dr. Shili, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes I can hear. Can you please? Un yes, can you, can you hear me? Dr. Shili, your mic. Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Um, hello? Hello, is that clear? Is that clear? Dr. Shili, we can't hear you. Uh, hang on for a while. Uh, hello? Um, yes, I can hear. <laughs> Dr. Shili, we can hear you now. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your talk. I'm uh, Jeffrey from Singapore. Uh, you, you, what you practice uh, really at the forefront of uh, management of uh, peripheral lung nodules. Uh, I got two questions for you. One is, uh, how, how do you select your patients for radiofrequency ablation versus surgical re resection of a peripheral lung uh, lesion, which is already diagnosed to be cancer, and I assume to be stage one. Uh, number two is, uh, after your procedures, uh, do, do your patients uh, need to uh, stay in the hospital, or can they be extubated and discharged? Uh, okay. Can, okay, can you hear me now? Sorry, Dr. Shi, we cannot hear you again. G g give us a while. Uh... I'm sorry, I, I invented a translator. Uh, I, wait a, mo oh, wait yeah. a moment. Dr. Shi, we cannot hear you. Give us a while uh, uh, to, to uh, fix uh, the audio uh, issue for. Uh, I, I, hi, I, 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 I invent a translator. Can you cancel the, the, the micro, microphone? Hello? Uh, Dr. Shili, could you have a look uh, at, at your site uh, to see if uh, there's any mute button or... So there's some problem in my, in my, in my connect. Oh, which are you Mm. Uh, hello, can, can, can you open my mic, microphone uh, in, for my inter for my translator? Uh, 
是不是？嗯，网络太卡，网络太卡，他能听见吗？ Kiss， 你要是能听见，你在那个，你在那个消息上发一下语语，发一下语音。Sure. Uh, Doctor Shili, uh, we really apologize, uh, for the current situation. Uh, we are unable to hear your answer. So what we'll do is, uh, we'll contact you by email or messaging, and uh, oh. then we'll uh get your reply and send it to the audience. Thank okay. you very much for your help. So sorry. I'm so sorry about that. Is he hearing me talk? Hearing me? Ah. I would like to thank Dr. Jeffrey for moderating both our previous sessions. I request Dr. Shivatsa to hand over a moment to Dr. Jeffrey. I'm speaking. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. So we just have two more exciting talks remaining. Both the um, doctors are based in USA. And the videos are pre-recorded, and we'll be playing them. The first topic would be by Dr. Abdul Hamid, and he'll be delivering a talk on what's new in navigation to peripheral pulmonary nodules, the role of radial ebus, an essential tool with other systems, and the due gap it fills. I would like. Could you please request Dr. Aravindran and Dr. Shazang to moderate the next two sessions? Thank you. Hi, everyone, and thank you for having me as part of this amazing uh, faculty for IP uh, Skill Club. Hopefully, I can share with you today more information uh, about radial EVOS with the uh, new modalities of navigation bronchoscopy. So our talk today would be what's new in, uh, in navigation to perform pulmonary nodules, the rule of radial EVOS, an essential tool with other systems and the gaps it fills. Starting talking about uh, radial EVOS, I would like first to start with, uh, I have no disclosures, apart being a board member on the AABIP and also member at Chest Education uh, Committee. Our objectives from the talk today, to talk about radial EVOS in general, implementation, especially in uh, lung nodules diagnosis, and the radial EVOS also uh, with different navigation modalities. I have the chance to work with two different uh, modalities, uh, um, electromagnetic navigation and robotic bronchoscopy recently. And I would be happy to share my experience with both of them, especially using the radial EPOS as an essential factor. And also, if there is any new uh, tricks or 
uh, maneuvers that can be used with the new modalities, I will be highlighting that too. We'll also highlight the use of cone beam with the radial EVOS and with the new era of having portable CAT scan in the cases and how much that can affect the radial EVOS use or how much the radial EVOS help uh, with the cone beam safety. And we'll end with uh, some pros and cons about radial EVOS. So we we'll start with the implementation of radial EVOS. And as everybody know, it's an endobronchial tool that fits inside the working channel of most of our bronchoscopes and navigation tools. It enables real-time evaluation of the lung nodule. And with other modalities, fluoroscopy, cone beam CT, it can give an approximate evaluation of the location of the lesion. The more major uh, limitation is the real time, time sampling because we don't have the tool yet that allow us having the radial evils at the same time while the needle is there. And everybody knows that it's uh, different sizes, but the idea of it is the spinning that happen when you push that radial EVOS through the airways. And you can see when it gives you that sign of uh, hypoechoic uh, contour there with hyperechoic borders. And that's how we define lung nodules uh, with radial EVOS. It fits also in a um, two millimeter working channel or any modalities from bronchoscope to uh, extending working channel from navigation bronchoscopy to recently catheters and scopes, depends on the type of uh, robotic bronchoscopy. But what, where the data is about radial EVOS, and we know from a meta-analysis done that the diagnostic yield using radial EVOS in general was around 70% from this meta-analysis. But that's also land on different aspects, especially the size of the lesion, uh, the air bronchosign also uh, that help know if the radial would be having an easy target there or not. Also from the uh, Navigate uh, study, we know that not all the cases use the radial EVOS. Um, almost half of them, radial EVOS was used with navigation uh, bronchoscopy in those cases. And the yield on those uh, studies also was around 73%. So there's multiple factors, but I, we still believe that the radial EVOS play a big role, if not only in the diagnosis that with those cases, but also might be with the reduction of the time of the procedure. So what is the radial EPOS um, uh, use with electromagnetic navigation? As I mentioned in my early training and career, I had the chance to use one of the electromagnetic navigation systems. And still we were looking on those modalities uh, about uh, bronchus uh, sign, air bronchus sign, which is, will help us know that our yield would be higher. And that's what we discussed with the patient prior to the case. At least give them an estimation of 60 to 70% that I will be able to get this lesion. And of course, based on the size of the lesion. However, that, uh, the, that modality depends on also uh, human factors, a number of cases done, also how much delegate and how much you are uh, uh, holding the scope in a way that avoiding any further uh, movements when you are close to those lesions. And we know also that the diagnostic yield in those uh, cases were higher in the upper lobes versus the lower lobes in general. 
So for example, this is a case also that done. And we had a virtual airway that we used to drive and get to the area. And the radial EPAS was main, main factor with the fluoroscopy to help us get to the lesions and sample them. However, we know that there's three movement that we have when we use the scope, the rotation, the flexion up and down, and the push in and out. And after doing two to three cases a day, at the end, you will have some human error happening, uh, meaning with the accuracy of reaching that nodule, especially with holding the specific angle with rotation, with specific depth, if the patient having an easy tube or a subconscious sedation, that factor in and out will be very, very uh, delicate to uh, stay in that exact depth, in that exact rotation, and at the same time with the same flexion. And with that also play a role, the fatigue with instability, the operator experience, and when we sometimes try to sample different areas from the lesion, it's very hard to go back to the area that you were finding the best shadow to sample again. Those all factors were handled better now when you have robotic bronchoscopy. And we know from the benefit study that those cases done with uh, uh, robotic bronchoscopy. And there was 50 uh, uh, cases, around 50 cases. With the radial signal from those cases were concentric in 31 of them, 60% and around 40% were eccentric. And this is study gave us a very important information that the yield went up to 80% when was done with the, uh, the, when the lesion was more concentric on radial EVOS versus 70%, which is the average time, what we had before from the other meta-analysis uh, when we have eccentric. The other study that also studied targets and nodules and is, they study that allow us to know where is the relationship of the tool, either it's radial EVOS, if it's needle, to the lesion. And the assessment of those, uh, of this study of those uh, lesions approach was either if it's central, peripheral, distal, or it missed, or in the secondary gain was, or the goal was to see how much adjacent to the lesion. Out of all uh, tools used, there was a, a ultra thin bronchoscope with radial EVOS compared with electromagnetic navigation and compared with re, uh, robotic bronchoscopy. As you see, the accuracy of being uh, central where 10% in the robotic, but peripherally were 65%. And there was 10%, around 10% that missed. But uh, on the other hand, if you look at the electromagnetic navigation, there was uh, a lot of, and, uh, and diagnosed 15% and with the radial EPOS about 35%. So this study isolate each system separately. However, highlighted that the stability and the precision of the robotic bronchoscopy helped locked on those targets. And with the, both goals, primary and secondary endpoint, there was 65% of radial EPOS uh, successful navigation only. And 85 with electromagnetic navigation and 100% with robotic. But that gives you the idea that combining more than one te uh, technique can help identifying and getting the answer.
So what the radial EVAS can help us with the availability of the robotic bronchoscopy, what it can add and what the uh, robotic bronchoscopy can also uh, make the radial EBUS shine more than what usually before and give it more value. Starting with using the radial EBUS, it's a very delicate uh, tool. So it should be always handled um, in a very uh, smooth and very gentle way. Very important to know that before starting using it, let us spin allowing the oil inside the catheter of the radial EVAS to have a better spin inside, important. To reduce the radiation use also, usually 90 centimeters, we know the length of the catheter. So we mark the length of 90 centimeters on the radial EVAS. And then we activate the fluoro at that time to see where we are related to that lesion. Those small things can reduce the radiation exposure, save the radial EVAS from being rotated while inside the catheter, which is very important to avoid any breaking. Also allow uh, us to know where exactly we are uh, from the uh, lesion uh, when we are pushing it in and out. So we know how many centimeters away, if that not enough by other tools to identify. And from the previous study, having knowing that concentric view give us better result than eccentric, some new uh, maneuvers that offered by the robotic bronchoscopy now can help us uh, get a better results. Uh, one of the maneuvers is the articulation of the catheter. So the stability of those catheters now or the scope depends on the bronchoscope uh, or the catheter you're using with different uh, robotic modalities allow you to have a very precise lock on the target or seeing the target before you upload or you, or you deploy your radial EVOS. And that uh, gives you some idea where you are related to that, uh, the radial where it's exactly to, to that lesion you're going after. For example, this is a case for a patient with the right upper lobe a good uh, 1.5 cent, uh, centimeter lesion. As you see from the video that the, the first impression we got is more eccentric view. The function that the robot allow you now uh, do is using a maneuver that tell you exactly which part of the uh, uh, circle that you see here that help your articul articulation moving. Although this is not related to a, a superior, inferior, or lateral or medial, but at least will allow you cloud movement of your catheter and then deploy your radial in different angles to see if you can get the best eccentric versus concentric view. So for example, here we were moving towards around five o'clock and that's what tells you you are trying to move your catheter before you changing your projection of your radial EVOS after deploying when you are locked on that angle. With that move, you can see here the articulation, the same move we're trying to move. We pull back the radial EVOS and articulate toward the four o'clock and then deploy in that angle. When we see per registration, you are inside the lesion, and now you can change the uh, projection or the, the, the picture from being eccentric to be concentric. It's very easy to be explained in this scenario might be there's two airways that we went through one versus another one, 
but just an idea that even small, tiny airways that perform the lung can be easily adjusted and you can also uh, get a better uh, central uh, view of the lesions with that maneuver. And the second step that also now available for uh, a lot of centers is the use of cone beam, uh, portable cone beam, for example, for some cases that allow us to move really from our previous targets when we feel comfortable to sample from 20 millimeter, 15 millimeter down to less than 10 millimeter. When you are combining the three uh, uh, technologies together from cone beam to radial EPAS and robotic bronchoscopy together. This is a case of a person that has a growth of a lung nodule from three millimeter to eight millimeter on the right lower lobe, as you see on those two pictures. And the measurement that done by the uh, robot gave around seven millimeter. This is a good um, uh, 3D map for the airways that extracted by the planning computer from the robot to show exactly the route of the lesion, which is going toward the superior segment of the right lower lobe. So when we um, try to deploy the first after driving there and reaching that and locking on the lesion, the first uh, view you see here that you can see make some shadow in some areas, but the lesion is adjacent to the uh, radio EVOS. However, it's not that much um, val uh, like clear cut to be sampled at this point. The second thing that you can notice that it is uh, having some variation with the breathing, which expected in the lower lobes, more than upper lobes. So we decided to lock on that target at that level where we see the radio uh, signal, and then to do a, a 3D cone beam uh, CT scan spin. And with the spin, it takes 30 seconds. So usually we apply also a breath hold uh, to help staying in that spot. The target was used uh, uh, to be sam uh, after spin as a needle. And after we spin, we have this 3D uh, uh, picture that we go over each dimension from sagittal to axial and uh, to the uh, third one here. You can see the uh, catheter ending and the top one uh, here uh, that the nodule is there. However, the needle is more inferior to the nodule. That confirmed also in the axial uh, in this uh, cut. It's very important to move your target to where you want to see that the needle and the nodule at the same level. And that will tell you where is your needle to the, uh, to the lesion. It's very clear that the lesion is more superior. However, we are very central. So that match what we saw in the radial EVOS. And if we can make some adjustment here in the sagittal too, you can see that the needle is inferior to the nodule, but we have a good distance between the two uh, needle uh, and, and uh, the nodule. So it's not having another dimension. With that information, we decided to adjust the catheter to be more uh, superior to the uh, target that already built by the uh, uh, planning, which is suggestive of diversion of around 
three millimeter, which is the width of the catheter. So we moved superiorly three millimeter, which is one width of the, uh, the catheter. And after that, we did the same thing, deploy the radial EBUS. And now you can see, although we are still somehow more uh, 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 concentric, but it is more uh, toward having better echogenic shadow with clear cut edges. So at that area, we decided to do the biopsies and rows in the case shows uh, a type of malignant cell suggestive of non-small cell that end with the final diagnosis as adenocarcinoma. So with that, I would like to uh, say what is going, what is the pros and cons about using radial EVOS in general. And that this uh, data from MD Anderson helped a lot understanding where we used to have 40% of having good signal of radial EVOS, but we are getting non-diagnostic uh, uh, results. And with that, also that uh, this study confirmed that the atelectasis uh, that give us a fake um, rounded shape at the axis is uh, similar to the what we the pro proceduralists think it's a nodule uh, turn to be more that it is at the lactases. and it is uh, very clear from this that the upper lobes are usually having less chance of atelectasis compared with the lower lobes that can reach up to 80% in sub, some segments or lobes. And that explains also why our yield in general higher when we do uh, approach any lung nodule in the upper lobe versus lower lobe. This is an example of a echogenic um, uh, uh, pictures of radial EBUS for atelectasis. So it's very important to remember talking about radial EVOS now that implementation of anesthesia strategy before the case is very important. And discussing that with the anesthesia colleagues, very valuable. So from this study, you can see that the atelectasis formed after 30 to 40 minutes from starting the case, especially in the posterior and lower lobes of the lungs. And that match what MD Anderson study also shows. So implementation of multiple maneuvers, especially I'll be short with that, having higher P around eight, 10 to 12, having recruiting maneuvers after intubation, avoiding rapid sequence intubation with hyper oxygenation, lower the FiO2 to 40% and maintaining that and choose high tidal volume for the patient eight to 10 cc per kg. That help maintaining good inflation of the lungs, avoiding atelectasis and uh, the quickest that we can go after the lesion on those situations will be the ideal scenario not to wait till atelectasis is formed. So in summary, uh, pros, about, pros about the um, radial EBUS. It's available and the price is still um, reasonable compared with other technologies for real-time evaluation of the lesion. It's easy to use still and compatible with most and with all the navigation modalities, including uh, robotic bronchoscopy. It helped reducing the patients and the staff radiation exposure. The, the, with the right hand and right use of radial EBUS, even if you have cone beam, this can help reduce the exposure if you can find the lesion 
with the radial evils. You can save patients from spin of um, 100 milligrays, 200 milligrays of radiation, or even if you can reduce the number of spins that needed to go central on the lesion that help uh, with the radial EVOS. It's also give a real-time evaluation of the lung nodule. Um, it's very important to remember to get better results, avoid atelectasis, and that generate better communication and education to the staff in general. And it's safe with minimal side effects. On the other hand, we should keep in mind it's very delicate and very easy to break. So always should be handled with very gentle moves. Having the uh, systems that uh, we use in a previous uh, explanation earlier, have the measurement, avoid of rotation while you are in the catheter, avoid pushing against resistance, uh, try to oil the best uh, for the uh, uh, quartz uh, at the end of the, uh, the, the uh, radial EVOS prior to use, because when it's stored, it's usually not distributed well around the quartz uh, at the end of the uh, radial EVOS. So that little swing prior to uh, insertion, very important. Atelectasis can be misleading and can be uh, really deceiving to think that you got the answer when you do it. The price still lower than other modalities, but if we have the chance that we can avoid breaking it frequently, that will save also the money. And up to this point, we don't have the real-time sampling while using it in the peripheries of the lung. And that will be the point that will make this tool more valuable in the future. I really appreciate uh, uh, your time and the invitation. Um, this work also done with amazing team that I work with. And uh, for any questions, I'll try to be there at uh, the session uh, online uh, and if not, I will be answering them after, even by email. Feel free. Thank you, Dr. Abdul Hamid. Um, so doctor has joined um, us via the Zoom link and you can ask your questions, questions to him. Good evening, Good evening, Dr. 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 Could you please Could you unmute please yourself? yourself? Hi, everyone. Hi, Hi Dr. Blumi. Can you hear us? I hear Are you. you. Do you hear me? Do you hear me now? Uh, we are unable to hear you. I hear you. Hi, everybody.
Hi, everybody. Yes. Hello. Can you hear us from here? I, I hear you. Do you hear me? We are Unfortunately, we can't hear you. One minute. So we are sorting out the technical glitch. Do you hear me now? Do you hear me now? Good morning or good afternoon. This meeting is being recorded. Maybe can you hear us? I hear you. Do you hear me? He can hear us. I think we cannot. Yeah. I think we are unable to hear you. While we sorting out there, 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 while we sorting out there. Hello. I think, uh, maybe thank you for the wonderful talk. I think we learn a lot of information from your talk. I think uh, if you can hear us, I think issues from your side, I think maybe you either if that you can't talk convey the can, can can you ask i mean can you hear us i hear you very well very well okay great uh, finally, oh, we, are yeah, finally okay. we are connected finally we are connected okay uh, if, i think any questions from the floor so i think if no question uh, question i think uh, maybe i have a question for you so you mentioned about the, the pro of the modality regarding a minimal side effects do you have any percentage or data on it from uh, the point about the probe side effect as uh, uh, damage to the patient uh, it's uh, and i i didn't have any uh, study showing that there is any uh, side effect like uh, either bleeding or type of uh, uh, more uh, side effect led to a complication like pneumothorax or even uh, the uh, bleeding those are two things uh, especially that uh, some of those lesions can be next to the pleura and even with those i think the uh, i didn't nobody reported that if it happened uh, that's a uh, very very rare and uh, i think because of the probe itself as you know is a blonde end is not a sharp end that's one thing um, per the uh, the probe itself to be breaking inside the patient also i didn't see any of that that's great okay i passed the mic to my co-chair hi dr abby um call from malaysia hi nice talk yeah I understand that you are using the ION intuitive system, am I right? Correct. So my question is, in the benefit trial, uh, when they're using the Monarch system, the navigation success is almost 90 plus percent, but the diagnostic U, again, is, is only around 74 percent. And uh, in the Monarch system, uh, if I understand correctly, it's a real-time biopsy, and which can visualize your first step going in. And um, usually the radio EBAS or VBN or using fluoroscopy as a, as a verification technique, the discre discrepancy can be around 10 to 
So initially we thought that with Mona, it, we can actually reduce this discrepancy, but in the data, it does not show uh, as such. So what, what is your opinion on that? I, it's hard to, uh, the advantage of both system, to be honest, is that you are eliminating the human error uh, from happening, meaning the fatigue of the operator holding the scope and with minimal rotation. Uh, to your point, uh, the 70% also in those cases, uh, there is a lot of centers back then, they did not combine that with other modalities like cone beam. So what happened in those cases, you are almost using navigation system that uh, you are facing a lot of uh, nodules that you're going now smaller size, uh, you, you are not compared with the same what navigation, electromagnetic, other uh, modalities in the past used, uh, having real time, uh, that seeing the lesion, as you said, and smaller lesion going after. Also, uh, when we were doing those uh, uh, evaluations, uh, there was no much information about the uh, cone beam uh, data that we got about atelectasis forming after a specific time. So that 30% drop on the uh, yield of any modality was masked and confined by those two factors. There was a telectasis forming and there was uh, the operator think that it is the lesion and become more than a lesion, it is a, a, a telectasis. Second thing was the uh, going after smaller size lesions that we did not have the uh, the cuts to go after before because that uh, that give a different dimension to go after different size of lesions with a smaller uh, uh, distal and smaller targets i think that's why uh, the the numbers in the early studies of the robot came up with that uh, number 70 percent if you uh, wait like a year or two i think with the widespread now of the robotic bronchoscopy systems throughout the nation you will get a new information new data showing uh, the advantage of doing robotic bronchoscopy that will give you the higher yield uh, personally when i started doing it till now my yield did not never drop less than 90 and uh, with, with, uh, with doing those cases with 90%, I have to also confess that I use with them, some of them, as you see in the, in the uh, talk, cone beam combined, but majority of them was only the robot with the radial EVOS, uh, only the target that less than 10 millimeter, that the time I had to do a spin of one of the cone beam to get to that lesion. So the data will be different, I'm sure, coming up soon from different centers uh, about uh, the uh, robotic in general and uh, the yield of lung nodules. Right, and thank you. Um, I have one more question, hope, hope you don't mind. It's about radio in bus in general. Um, if you're reading the uh, European or the Japanese um, uh, literature, like the latest one published in chess, um, when you combine with cryobiopsy, they report a U up to 89, 91%. And um, we understand that when the publication come out from the States, it's usually lower, um, 60, 70%. So what, what is your, what's your take on this? So I think uh, there is a, a huge difference in the practice between the two uh, uh, like different countries. And uh, I believe there is a very good uh, uh, reading and understanding, interpreting of the radial signal by the different operators. And I know that from you, what you mentioned, um, for example, Japan, I, I'm sure that the interpretation of any radial EBUS can be very valuable uh, compared when we are using it here. So uh, for per se, for the cryobiopsy with, uh, with the radial EBUS, it's mainly we avoid any blood vessel vision when we are doing that 
to help to prevent bleeding more than identifying interstitial or changes in the lung that are hard to be identified in the periphery of the lungs when you're doing those biopsies, especially if you're getting some atelectasis there. So that's where I think it's, it's more used for us as a safety than interpretation, where should we do the biopsy compared with if there is a different readings for different areas to understand the uh, echogenic changes or the scenographic changes on the ultrasound that support where to do the biopsy. If otherwise, uh, thanks to Davy so much for, for, for joining us. Yeah, hope to catch you up physically soon. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For our last talk this evening, we'll be playing a pre recorded video by Dr. Kairi Hakkar who's a professor of medicine, director bronchoscopy, co-director lung cancer screening program, medical director pulmonology pulmonary rehabilitation program, University of Chicago, USA, on the topic, choosing your needles right for the case and how to optimize the sampling, walking through real life cases, the wins and the misses. Thank you. This is my current. So let's be very brief as to why EVIS matters. We know you know this. My other esteemed uh, colleagues have given discussions on EVIS, obviously. But the So as we know, let me switch a little bit here so the lighting is better. Accuracy of CT and PET is not good enough. They're this is my current conflict of interest as of a few days ago. Um, as you can see, um, probably the ones that are relevant to needles uh, are the consulting with Boston Scientific um, other than that, the rest of these are just for thoroughness. So let's be very brief as to why EVIS matters. We know, know this, my other esteemed uh, colleagues have given discussions on EVIS, obviously. But the questions always come up to say, aren't CT and PET good enough? Well, we'll see, no. Can I get enough tissue to answer the relevant question? That answer is yes. Where am I sampling and how do I sample? And that's sort of the purpose. So as we know, when we look at EVIS tDNA from molecular markers, we also see that quite frequently there is plenty of tissue for the standard mutation evaluations of EGFR and ALK. Again, highlighting that adequacy of tissue is easily obtained with appropriate and, and proper EVIS technique um, with the various instruments that we use. And I think the question always is, is how are we defining the diagnostic tDNA? Because obviously in the setting of a lung cancer staging, there's some level of pessimism of wondering if did you get enough sample to say there wasn't a tumor present in the node. This is my current conflict of interest as of a few days ago. 
Um, as you can see, um, probably the ones that are relevant to needles uh, are the consulting with Boston Scientific. Um, other than that, the rest of these are just for thoroughness. So let's be very brief as to why EVIS matters. We know you know this, my other esteemed uh, colleagues have given discussions on EVIS, obviously. But the questions always come up to say, aren't CT and PET good enough? As we'll see, no. Can I get enough tissue to answer the relevant question? That answer is yes. Where am I sampling and how do I sample? And that's sort of the purpose of today's talk. So as we know, I'm gonna switch a little bit here so the lighting's better. Accuracy of CT and PET is not good enough. The sensitivity and specificity of both are limited, which is why obviously we need to sample. And EVAS in the staging of lung cancer, there's over 1600 publications that show a large body of data that says we can do this and do this effectively. When we look at EVAS TBNA for molecular markers, we also see that quite frequently there is plenty of tissue for the standard mutation evaluations of EGFR and ALK. Again, highlighting that adequacy of tissue is easily obtained with appropriate and, and proper EBIS technique um, with the various instruments that we use. And I think the first question always is, is how are we defining a diagnostic TBNA? Because obviously in the setting of a lung cancer staging, there's some level of pessimism of wondering if, did you get enough sample to say there wasn't a tumor present in the node? So obviously, if there's a benign explanation for an adenopathy that was present on imaging, such as granulomas, a granulomatoid inflammation, anthracosis and histiocytes full of it, or of course, normal lymphoid tissue, then of course, you've obtained benign lymph nodes and you can be assured. Obviously, if malignancy is there, then that is without a doubt a diagnostic tDNA. This I'm not going to labor on. I know others have, but this, I, I put this up just so if people want the reference of obviously the lymph node station, and obviously uh, the lungs are not part of the mediastinum, the mediastinal uh, structures and the lymph node stations, a, a majority of which can. This is my preferred picture. Okay. As we know, when we're gonna be doing appropriate staging, start with the N3 nodes of whatever side your malignancy is on, and then progress more medially until you obviously find an answer of malignancy or obviously keep going if you're finding benign disease. So how do you go about sampling? So we're gonna talk about needle selection and appropriate technique. And now a, uh, a, a technique that Dr. Murdu has published on and uh, uh, made it easy to remember the faster technique. So the frequency of fast one to two downstroke movements of the needle, amplitude from capsule to capsule, Suction, where you don't need suction, but you can if you're not getting good sample back from the first few passes, and we'll come back to that. Time, you want to spend a little time actually inside the node, back and forth. A lot of this comes from the experience doing ethanase from thyroid or breast. Edge, keep the needle inside the node at all times, obviously during your aspiration. And then route, changing the direction, so fanning the needle, flexing and extending the scope so that your needle is going through the node in multiple different planes. These faster techniques, helps to optimize specimen adequacy. But fully sample the node, in particular because, this is a video that I borrowed from Boston Scientific, so it's, forgive the uh, sort of motion.
Abel Matari. Give me one second. I can't start my video just yet. I'm just in a scenario where I can't. I've had to run to the hospital. So I'm moving. Okay. <laughs> 
ఇది కూడా ఇన్ Okay. This will work. <laughs> I found a semi quiet place. Hey everybody. Sorry, the morning here I've had to run into deal with something at the hospital. So um timing's never perfect. This is even more reason I've got to come live next time so that I can't get called into the hospital. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, first of all, I just want to ask a question uh, from my side. Do you have any way for differentiating sarcoidosis and malignancy? Is there any difference between the number of classes or what are the minimum classes that are going to be required for the sarcoidosis? With the host monitor. Okay. So there there was a there was a little bit of an echo so I'm 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 I thought I heard you ask if there's a a difference in the diagnostics with sarcoidosis is that what you were asking? So the, so the problem is as you're asking your question I'm hearing a lot of the uh, tech and the IT people in the background so I'm my audio is uh there go ahead ask again I think the, the background noise just went away. Yeah, so lymphoma is always the challenge um, and has been historically <laughs> the limitation when we've been trying to do aspirates with smaller needles. So if lymphoma is on our differential or if on rows um, there is an implication that it looks like it might be a lymphoma, we will immediately switch to a larger gauge needle we will also are Which now what we end up doing is adding um uh the forceps through the puncture hole after we use the larger needle and then i have a partner he hasn't published on this yet and i i'm not sure if others have and if they have i've missed it but he's also using the small it, it disposable cryoprobe and taking cryobiopsies of lymph nodes through those holes he freezes for only 2 seconds and immediately pulls and then comes out um so far it um it's had no safety concerns uh granted it's been a limited experience um and i suppose it's been a relatively limited experience even with the forceps and larger needles for lymphoma but in the end there's always still going to be a scenario that unless you get large cores and that's you know goes back to the ability to make sure you're cutting across multiple portions of that lymph node so that you can actually get surgical path quality tissue so that hemopathologists can talk about cellular architecture um etc so i think our tools have evolved where lymphoma is no longer going to require a mediastinoscopy um it's easier to prove the recurrence um if it occurs only because if, if nothing else your pathologists know what they're looking for their suspicion is up they don't need to you know unload all the the intricacies that make something a lymphoma they already knew this guy had lymphoma uh, thanks probably i think one question um you said you're seeing um uh, some senses on stage so as as special five six lymphoma through the robotic endoscopy so do the tbna from within you know not from the usual tbna uh, industry do you have any experience at what's up there No it's a good question so the so like the robotic scopes um you know much like any of the other navigation platforms um you could always mark something like a lymph node but the argument always is at least for things that are mediastinal 
obviously why, why wouldn't we just use Evis? It's just, it's a better instrument designed for this. Now, things that are um, uh, traditionally harder lymph nodes to get or would require the next generation smaller Evis scope. So if you're out in a, uh, in a lobe itself and the, you, you know, what you think is a lung nodule is actually an intrapulmonary lymph node, but you need to sample it for you know, whatever reason, then the, the navigation-based platforms obviously have the ability. You can, you can put a marker on anything. In fact, one of the tricks that we do for any navigation platform is we mark the lesion we want to biopsy, but if it's near some key vascular structures, we actually put a target on the vascular structures. We call the target, you know, don't, don't biopsy. That's what we'll name it. So that when we are lined up with the target, we can turn on the other target and see that my needles and everything are going nowhere near, you know, key vascular structures. Now, one of the ways we also get around that is some of the tomosynthesis tools that we utilize like lung vision. And if we get access to cone beam, that obviously helps guide us further. But for the mediastinum and the medium hilum, um, the robotic platforms or even any of the other navigation platforms really are just, you know, it, it's kind of the equivalent of, of taking the blind TBNA. It's not that blind TBNA wasn't a safe and effective technique. It's just that um, the the tissue quality is better because of the nature of the needle being housed, in, um, attached to the EBIS scope. And then obviously that direct visualization so that you can truly ensure you're going capsule to capsule. You know, it's, uh, you know, I used to do a lot of blind TBNA, but I will freely admit I, uh, never even got close to the level of a tool meta. Um, and so thank God they invented Ebus so that I could pretend I was Dr. Meta. Um, so. I hope my answers are coming through. <laughs> so I'm gonna take the Eddie will push up a little. That's it. I think we should conclude the session. Uh, thanks. Thanks for all of it. Uh, hope to see you soon. This way. Okay. Oh, thank you so much. And I will, if any of you are coming to the World Congress in France in October, I will be there. So uh, if you're there, let me know. Um, and um, if you're ever in the Chicago area, please give me a ring. We'd love to have you. Okay. Okay. See you. Thanks, everybody. everybody. See you live, I hope, soon. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. So, yeah, so thank you everyone for patiently waiting for the dynamics to finish. I see there's hardly a handful that's left at the end of the long day. But thank you for patiently waiting and learning. See, every speaker here had a very important yeah, fact that, that they had to tell you. Now, there is another important part of the evening uh, that's primarily about networking, relaxing, and trying to get to know each other, right? So, we are hosting you all to a gala dinner, which is hardly 10 minutes away from this place. We hope that all of you can make it by around 7 or 7.30. To the venue, it's called Atai Hotel. So, we will have our fellows, certain selected fellows, who will be presenting in EBUS cases, about four or five of them. And depending on what the judges say, there will be winning prizes. Okay. And then, of course, there's a dinner, and then we'll wrap up dinner early, too. Don't worry. So that we can be in early tomorrow by around 7, 7, 30, because so you can see the live cases, right? So we I have about three OT cases lined up for tomorrow, followed by the workshop, which will have a pre test post test. Audio right? in so in so in thank you in for being here. Yeah. Mute line. Enjoy enjoy your day but it's it's around in the the in in audio. Second one, I'm going to say, 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 I'm going to say,
session no, no, that too much so very simple people okay. i'm gifted i'm doing all the setup over there with uh, other uh, technician people are there can i end the live live end, end. end.